universe is one in ten. Five million years ago. The wizard Bibbity cackles that he's done it, and this unstoppable creature is perfection personified. With it, he's going to rule the universe, rule life and death itself, and even rule the very gods. But with a timely appearance, there are some who object to that last statement. Wes Kyle couldn't believe it when she was first told, but it does indeed appear that the rumors of an insidious monster being created are true. Looking towards the egg, she can feel the energy emitting from it. She's extremely grateful that they arrived when they did. When the wizard tries to use his magic on the Kais. But South Kaio effortlessly blocks the assault. He scoffs that his sorcery won't work on gods. Grabbing the wizard by the throat, the Kaio barks that Bibbidi has killed hundreds for the sake of his evil doings, and has even conspired against the gods themselves. For this, he must die. Gasping out. A attack! West is rushed by two other monsters. But she easily eviscerates them. She points out that these Glaviots were altered and brainwashed. Her ally loosens his grip. But only to shout. Annihilation! While Bibbidi is literally being vaporized, he does manage to pipe out. But it doesn't seem to have worked in time, leading to his destruction. Commending South on a job well done, the pair gaze at Boo's cocoon, shuddering to think what could have happened had he been released. Back in their world, Grand Supreme believes this event proves that they need to check on the moral realm any time they think there could be danger, and continue to intervene in situations like this. And they would do so. 1.6 million years ago, they shut down the demon realm. 7,000 years ago, the group would easily stop an evil army. In negative 425, they would vanquish a sinister cult on the planet Kanats, essentially becoming the greatest heroes of their universe. The Supreme Kai's even defeated the original legendary Super Saiyan. Later on, Bojack and his gang, even the Frost Demons in age 712, several years before Goku and Vegeta would be born. Soon after, the second coming of the legendary Super Saiyan would too have to fall, though to the extreme grief of West Kaioshin. Because of their intervention, universes 1 and 10 would not fall into vast danger. But at some point, these two realms did begin to deviate. Before eventually in universe 1, they'd be faced with a Varga. A Varga who had a particular request. In universe 1, year 793, around 9 years after Goku leaves to train Oob in our own timeline, we're brought to the site of Egg City Institute of Technology on planet Quack. In many ways, it appears similar to our own world. Though with much more futuristic structure and technology. Everything from the common family enjoying the sunshine, to others simply going out to get some exercise. Simultaneously, a couple of Arga shout in excitement. Yuri Quack! Getting a look at them and their surroundings. The one on the left has a giant beard and lone monocle. He appears to lose his grip on a tool of some kind as he throws his hands into the air. Various sci-fi devices around him. The other more or less looks the same, but younger with glasses, a binocular compound microscope to his right hand side. The pair both race off somewhere while arguing about who's going to see the Dean, both of them demanding to be the first. A couple of other Vargas glare at them in the distance, likely inferring this isn't the first time they've made a scene. The elder of the pair, which now actually doesn't necessarily look to be the elder of them, so the bearded one announces he's made the discovery of the century. As his counterpart quips, he couldn't discover the dust on his laptop. He himself is the one who has made something amazing. Though Beardo highly doubts Specs has discovered anything of value, jesting he must have just found out that eggs are round. Who argues he doesn't discover. Discoveries fall on the heads of the lazy. He is an engineer. He creates. Their argument continues as they bump each other while stomping down the hall, each taking shots at the other's vocation. Specs insisting he has invented the most incredible machine the civilization has ever seen. When who I believe is the female Varga prominently featured in the main story, and who I don't believe has been given a name, opens a door to see what the fuss is about, unknowingly walking right into the line of fire. As they angrily continue their rampage, it appears the aforementioned Varga emerged from the Dean's office. He calls out to ask if it's Professor Screwloose Mad Duck and Dr. Jerome Gloose again. Tell them he's not here. Which I think are ducktail references that just kind of go over my head. Either way, the pair make their way in to explain their breakthroughs. Specs even urges he fired the disgrace to his right. With a frustrated scowl, the Dean resolves to hear him out if it'll make him go away faster. Hey, universe, a power level detector. Better than any ever 
Not not understanding a single word as they try their hardest to talk over each other. The Dean yells for the love of the great quack to say that all again, but this time in their own separate balloons. Beardo explains how he created a power level detector better than any ever designed. It can instantly find the strongest beings in the whole universe, and even detects the ones who don't diffuse energy. While Spec states their universe isn't alone. As the Dean knows, each quantum state exists in a parallel reality, and he created a way to travel between these universes. Infinity is now within their reach, and he's welcome! Clearly not expecting him to declare such consequential things, the Dean is completely awestricken by the claims he's just heard. It's impossible. Both statements contradict physics and logic itself. And the fact that these two, who both spend all their time bickering with each other, finds these things at the same time. That's way too improbable itself. It's like some god found it convenient that these two inventions exist and made it happen simultaneously. But a god controlling their destinies? Please, they're scientists! Though the Dean assures he was merely joking, of course. Anyway, he wants to see proof of these inventions. And the next day, he would get just that. The three of them stand outside to showcase Specs, or rather Mad Duck's findings. Ten glooses from ten other universes, all looking just as grumpy as this universe's original. Mad Duck, of course, has to take a jab that none of them invented the stupid detector, which proves Gloos made it by pure chance, causing all the glooses to point and proclaim the Mad Duck from their universes didn't find his stupid travel invention either. Regardless, this still proves Mad Duck indeed traveled to other universes. His other argues he could have just made a cloning machine. Growing tired of their rivalry, the Dean requests Dr. Gloos to present evidence for his own discovery. Happily, he tells how with his device, he found the location of the Kaioshins, who are the strongest beings in the universe. Shocking the Dean's assistant, who questions if he's serious. No one knows where they are. He claims this is indeed the case. In fact, he sent a spy drone there to take photos. Right on cue, a couple familiar faces arrive. Though not pleased faces, mind you. The Grand Supreme Kai scowls, they don't like what they've done. South Kaio can be seen holding the aforementioned drone. The Dean pleads with them to allow him to explain. They have just recently found incredible technologies. If they can just turn back to page 1915, they can see for themselves. And after some explanations, the Kaios have made a decision. Grant thinks these two inventions are much too dangerous and resolves to ban them. But he admits they are astonished by the huge coincidence of them being created at the same time and in only one universe. So they have decided to use them both for a purpose, but only this one time. The Dean excitedly questions if they plan to meet the greatest minds and powers of other universes, learn from each other, avoid mistakes of the past and the alternatives, gather infinite knowledge and work for the greater good of the whole multiverse. But nah, they are more thinking of getting people to beat each other up. Yay, tournament! Year 737. Raditz finds himself surrounded by other children, mocking him on his lack of strength and calling him weak, shouting for them to shut up and he's not weak. One jeers he's so weak, there's no way he can even be a Saiyan, claiming his mother must be from another planet whose lowlife population was eradicated. But the youngster argues his mother was an elite warrior, a Saiyan elite. But the kids only continuing, sneer, his father probably isn't even Bardock and Raditz himself was found on some alien planet somewhere, and his parents were, in fact, just a couple of insects. Shouting he's not a bug! Getting himself pinned in retaliation, Raditz spots an out, gnawing on his bully's tail. He chomps down as hard as he can, sending an immense pain shooting through his adversary, growling for him to let go. Goku's brother has no intentions of doing so, wanting to make this kid pay. Nearby, a disinterested chaperone hears the kids scuffle and shouts of intent to murder, but can only bring himself to lazily remind the children there is no killing at recess. Away, we get a glimpse of the Saiyan world, sprawling with technological advancements, Bardock gearing up to possibly go on a mission. As happy as ever, his oldest son comes running in, giggling, Hey Dad! I beat Braska! I beat him to a pulp! And humorously, the battle may have been won, but even without seeing it firsthand, it's pretty obvious it was hard fought. Showing little interest, his father only utters, That's good. I have to go. Explaining his brother was recently born, and he's going to go check on him. The elated young child bouncing, he'll come along. In space, Frieza broods to himself that these Saiyan monkeys have gone too far, and it's time to put an end to them. While their strength and potential are impressive, they don't know how to obey. Zarbon pointing out, In 10 days, nearly the entire race should be on their home planet. 
and it may serve as the perfect opportunity. Finding great interest in this revelation, the Space Lord begins to develop a plan. Demanding his underlings provide him with a list of who's scheduled to not be on planet during that time. Having that information on hand like the good henchman he is, Zarbon knows Bardock's unit will be on Kanasa. Prince Vegeta and his mentor Nappa will be on Frieza Planet 68 for training purposes. And lastly, Harik and his group will be on Planet Stake. Though Dodoria adds, the best of the bunch are probably King Vegeta and his two men. Plus, Bardock, Nappa, and Hanazia. Frieza commands they have Harik's unit return home as soon as possible. And to tell him they were just too slow or something, but would like a Frieza Force squad to go finish the job, before questioning if this Bardock character has any women in his unit. Zarbon responds he does possess a lone female warrior. Wanting to terminate the entire species, Frieza doesn't like this. Turning and gazing into literal space, his right-hand man asks if he should cancel their upcoming mission. But the Galactic Tyrant believes it would look too suspicious, having a strong feeling that particular group will die in the line of duty. Dodoria mentioning this merely leaves Nappa and little Vegeta. Proving ever insightful, Zarbon continues, bringing up the younglings. As without other Saiyans, they can most likely make of them as they wish. Hanazia and Bardock have two sons. It's promising they could be molded like the prince. With all the pieces in place, Frieza and his men are officially headed to Frieza Planet 16, though will secretly venture to Planet Vegeta, which will have a very unfortunate collision with a meteor. Looking down at his newborn child, a still elated Raditz introduces himself to his brother. But after reading his power, Bardock turns tail, scoffing, another weakling, just another failure. When someone approaches, questioning, oh, you think so? Reminding, scouters weren't a thing when the two of them were born. It's possible his power was abysmal at first too. The Saiyan only glares at the woman, who continues, she believes that numbers mean nothing. Scanning around the room, she reads off powers of 3, 5, 7, one even as high as 15, wondering if that last one will become an elite someday, before reading a very particular power, slightly higher than all the others, at 10,000. As Bardock walks away, mocking, very funny. When the soldiers are approached by someone else, it's now when we discover this woman is the Hanazia Zarbon spoke of. The stranger explains, there are new orders from Lord Frieza regarding their children. Although their powers are rather low, he'd like to give them a chance to be sent on a mission. Raditz seemingly finding great enjoyment in being a big brother, but does seem to have a big brother outlook. The stranger then tells, Raditz will go on training, and Kakarot will attack a weak planet, a small world with many full moons per year, merely one-tenth of Vegeta's gravity, the average power level only 3.23. Clearly, he'll have a chance to. Interrupting, Hanazia cheers not to worry about the baby. He'll transform that planet into a deserted rock, requesting to know the highest power observed on it. While there have been readings of units ranging from 150 to 200, it's only about three or four people. Their average elite warrior ranges from merely 30 to 40. The female warrior thinking this will be an easy mission, believing it's not likely he'll encounter the strongest fighters on day one. Bardock could care less about everything being said. Turning to him, she questions what the odds of that is. And, few meta sound effect. The first human Goku would encounter was almost the strongest man on the planet. The stranger resolving, Raditz will leave the day after tomorrow and Kakarot in 10 days. When it's revealed, Hanazia is Kakarot's mother, who vows to train her baby to kill by that time. Bardock unceremoniously goes to leave for his mission. It's also worth noting, this chapter was written well before Dragon Ball Minus, so Gine wasn't even officially named Goku's mother at this time. Blasting off, communicating to his unit, the group will reach their destination tomorrow and to expect high power levels. But there is predicted to be a full moon in two days, so they should be able to wipe out the ten major cities in a relatively short time. If they can finish their mission in four days, they'll make Frieza's elite look like fools, counting on his men to make that happen. Selipa laughing that Bardock must have had a bad day to request such a challenge. Toma believing it has something to do with his kid that was recently born. Torepo saying he should have brought Raditz along. This would have been a great mission to help him improve. But only gritting his teeth, Bardock really does have a deep inner hatred of how weak his sons are. The next couple days would go by in a flash. Bardock and his crew managed to demolish not 10, but 11 cities in only one night. Then getting a blip on his radar, their leader picks up on a new power. A big one, in fact, a few miles away. Wanting to take it on alone, he commands his lessers to stay here. But Toma wonders, why didn't they detect this guy before? Not liking the feel of this, 
even if Bardock is far stronger. But believing their chief can handle it, he comes face to face with the native. The creature utters, he cannot fight the alien invader, bringer of death and destruction, and he can kill him if he so chooses. The Saiyan urging, that is his intent. Though the Kanasan quips, before he does so, he may want to listen first, as the survival of Bardock's people depends on it. Piffing this off, he merely barks for the man to die. Some lives and destinies can change with a single seemingly insignificant event. In one iteration, Bardock killed this warrior without a second thought. A few days later, Dodoria would have attacked his unit, leaving the Saiyan, the lone survivor, only to arrive on planet Vegeta, just in time for Frieza to destroy it. This iteration decides to hear him out, out of curiosity. The Kanasan elaborates he saw his future, and it's just as dark as his own. Bardock will die, his home planet destroyed, eradicated by a small, flat-horned demon, also witnessing the murder of his king, a man with a beard and spiked hair. Bardock instantly knows there's no way anyone here could be aware of Frieza or Vegeta, demanding he explain how he came across this information. The stranger simply states, he may not be a great fighter, but he possesses other special abilities, foresight being one of them. Apparently, this man's power to see the future is unique only to himself, as no one believed him when he tried to warn of an alien invasion. But if Bardock acts fast, he and his people can rise up and prevent the genocide of his own people, something this man failed to do. Asking a fair question, the squad leader inquires why he'd help him, given what he and his men have done. Showing to be wise, the Kanasan knows Bardock is merely the messenger of their death, and he wants revenge on the man who ordered their destruction. And he also knows the two of them desire the same thing, in that tyrant being destroyed. Though the Saiyan barks, he has no reason to believe a word of this. The native isn't asking him to, as he's aware words alone won't be enough to convince him, making the final request of Bardock finishing him with a fist through the heart. Happy to comply. Commenting how gross these flabby alien bodies are, the stranger gently grabs the warrior, muttering he receive his power and strength. The crew make a game plan for conquering the rest of the planet. Since the full moon is gone, Toma suggests it would be a good idea to split into groups of two. Selipa scoffs, that's a pretty silly excuse just to get her alone. Stuck in a daze, one of the men call out to their leader, asking what's wrong. Coming too, he can only wonder what just happened. Regardless, he returns minutes later. Upon inquiring how things went, Toma explains they were just deciding how to go about taking care of the rest of the smaller cities, going on how since the full moon is gone, they should split into groups of two. Sounding familiar, Selipa then puts the icing on the cake, laughing that's a pretty silly excuse just to get her alone, when Toma calls out to their leader, asking what's wrong. Knowing beyond any doubt he's seen all this before, he even states this belief out loud, his comrade questioning what he means. But lost in thought at the ramifications this could have, he realizes the native was right, then frantically asks Toma when the next visit from Frieza is planned. But with nothing scheduled, one should assume within a year or two. Getting a vision, Bardock sees King Vegeta, receiving a message alerting of Frieza's arrival. The ruler confused why he would just stroll in unannounced. The pompous king resolved to let him know what they think of this disrespect, as the Saiyan people are neither his slaves or servants. The space tyrant hasn't even given him news on his son. Letting themselves aboard Frieza's ship, Vegeta demands to know the meaning of this armada lined up near the planet. The Emperor only focused on the king's rudeness. Snapping, the Saiyan scoffs, us rude, reminding he's the one who greeted them by turning his back as if they were but servants, barking the Saiyan's pride. <laughs> Frieza has had enough of this disrespect, only believing it to confirm his qualm of these monkeys being undisciplined. And with their ruler fallen, Zarbon and Dodoria make quick work of his company, Bardock realizing the full impact of the future to come, calling for his crew to head home immediately, Toma arguing they haven't finished their mission, their leader isn't having it, claiming it to be an emergency. On Frieza's ship, Dodoria takes note, Harik's unit has been called back and should arrive a few days before them, Raditz leaving tomorrow for Frieza Planet 68, and his father, stopping short. He realizes Bardock's unit has reported their pillage of Kanasa as complete, thinking it has to be some kind of joke. But surveillance does read, 80% of the population has been decimated. Deciding, he can just have the group sent immediately to Planet Meat, and that's where he'll slaughter them. This remaining 20% being the perfect reason to intercept him. But with events playing out slightly different than what we're used to, how will Bardock escape alive? King Vegeta convenes an audience 
who addressed their concerns with a newborn by the name of Broly. Worried the infant is none other than the legendary Super Saiyan himself and a threat to the entire planet. At the very least, having such a high power at birth is not natural. Not wasting any time thinking on the issue, Vegeta orders the child's death. When Paragus comes rushing into the chambers, though he's warned, now is no time for interruptions. But not willing to be denied, he urges, his son will serve Prince Vegeta well and go on to become a great warrior. But that's precisely the issue. Hearing the commotion from down the hall, it seems Paragus may have been executed. Tarepo sighs, sounds like someone opened their mouth. Bardock responding, that's exactly what they're going to do as well. Barging in with his crew, he calls out for the king, claiming terrible things are going to happen. Turning and annoyed, Vegeta is bewildered by Bardock's intrusion. Quick and blunt, he explains, Frieza's coming to their planet to eradicate them all, and they have to do something to prepare. Initially met with a stunned silence, even his crew believe he must have lost his mind, as the surrounding Saiyans burst out in laughter. Keeping his goal focused, Bardock can't blame the others for not believing him. Truth be told, even he himself wouldn't believe it if you were not in his own shoes. But shouting for silence, he states Vegeta is the only one he needs to convince, as Saiyans must follow their king. As another, untimely vision overwhelms the warrior, seeing exactly how their home will be annihilated. Not waiting for his approval, Bardock decides the time for action is now. Per Saiyan tradition, he challenges the king to battle to claim the throne for his own which comes to even more of a shock to everyone than Frieza's alleged invasion. Continuing, the rebel goes on to chide. Their people accept Vegeta's status as king for his part in liberating them from the Tuffles. But this will decide who the strongest among them truly is, causing one of the higher-ups to butt in, urging a stop to this insolence. And if he'd like to challenge their leader, first he must go through him. But Bardock declines. Finding out this man's name is Gherkin, the warrior reiterates he is challenging the king, not his henchmen. As the others begin to utter in the background, the mutineer isn't even as powerful as Gherkin, so should he be victorious, he won't remain king for long. One scoffing if he knew he could challenge Vegeta, he'd have done it himself ages ago. Accepting the duel, Vegeta piffs at the idea that someone in the lower class could ever defeat him. Admitting, he now sees why Bardock is considered an elite. The warrior growls at the foolishness of the king, snarling while he was sitting on his throne. He himself was off fighting, laying waste to dozens of worlds, claiming his superior strength. Escaping a close call, Vegeta begins to summon what may be the Bless Wave attack used to transform. Bardock knows, now is the time to end this. Removing the pendant from his neck, Bardock emerges the winner. One of Vegeta's former men even shouts this out in declaration. Though, the new king is immediately challenged by Gherkin, which is accepted. But in accordance to Saiyan tradition, Bardock will have one week to rest, resolving they'll fight then. But for now, he commands their attention. This order will seem strange, but they must follow. If he is wrong, they can dethrone and kill him. But for the moment, unruly behavior will not be tolerated. First, no one is to alert Frieza of the change in leadership, as none of their plans over the next few days can be revealed, informing of his idea to slaughter Frieza's forces. And shortly after, the plans were followed promptly into a T. The Saiyans began their secret rebellion against their overlord. However, officially, nothing seemed to have changed, using the tyrant's own soldiers against him to feed misinformation. Lovingly caressing her beloved child, Anazia gets wind of what Bardock has been up to, only after the new king invited all Saiyan representatives to put his plan on display. At a podium before his people, he calls for an end to Frieza, explaining he's gathered all to the capital for the arrival of the tyrant. Surviving their battle, even the former King Vegeta knew Frieza would never forgive such an act, so he too worked alongside of Bardock to give them the best chance possible. With his aid, even the most reluctant of Saiyans were on board. A few days later, on Frieza's ship, it's announced to their lord, Dodoria has arrived. Catching them mid-conversation, the henchman elaborates how there were no Saiyans on planet Meat, even though their logs and scouts confirmed that's where they should be. Ordering he contacts said scouts, Frieza plans to push forward to planet Vegeta. Connecting with one of their teams, there seems to be a delay. 
But then we see, the Saiyans are essentially holding Frieza's intelligence officers hostage, continuing to give them bad information, and falsely confirming Bardock and his crew indeed have left for Planet Me. Upon questioning if they've arrived on said planet, one of the Saiyans coerces the officer, having to make up a story on how there was a technical incident and they had to make an emergency stop during their journey. But repairs have finished, so they should be arriving soon. With no reason not to believe this, Dodoria is only frustrated he made the trip for nothing. Inevitably, the Day of the Visions would come to face the Saiyan people, who all gathered in a desert outside the city. Glancing over to the father of her children, Hanazia warns if Frieza doesn't show, she will defy and kill the king herself, who calmly remarks she'll have to take her turn after Gherkin. Making his way through the crowd, Paragus shouts out to Bardock, thanking him for saving his son, who could see what the legendary child would one day become, knowing they'll need that strength. Running over, a Saiyan shouts out that Frieza has arrived. As the cadences of the massive warriors grows louder, Bardock wasn't crazy after all. Hanazia had not yet convinced. So what? All that's confirmed for certain is that it's an unscheduled visit. It doesn't automatically mean he's come to commit genocide. Arguing it doesn't matter, their leader states they plan to strike first. Knowing they can't allow him to retreat and regroup, he tasks Hanazia with infiltrating and stopping his ship, questioning if she's up for the challenge. But claiming to be the most powerful Saiyan of them all, she believes she's more than adept causing Gherkin to squabble. Didn't he beat her last time they sparred? Though, turns out she was pregnant. While she beelines upward, Bardock beckons, Vegeta, Gherkin, Hadanek, Zucchini, and Paprika know what to do. Further instructing three others to hide in the shadows to launch more fake moons should any be destroyed. This plan is met with criticism, citing the cowardice behind it. But the king has spoken, continuing as they've prepared. The Saiyans transform, increasing their strength tenfold. A rough estimate should put their individual powers between 15 and 120,000. While alone, they would likely be squashed, together, with the entire race ranging from hundreds if not thousands united. It may just be enough. A henchman at a monitor quickly alerts of the attack, stating a horde of Uzaru are heading directly towards them. Dodoria in disbelief, as there isn't even a full moon. While Hanazia makes her approach, she knows Frieza's ships are said to have the best shields available, putting that rumor to the test. Another soldier becoming aware of the attack, he's also met with skepticism, as the Azarus aren't even in range. Changing up her plan, the lone warrior heads straight to the ship itself, breaking through the shields and penetrating the hull. Inside the spacecraft, she can finally take in a breath of air. Only seconds pass before the attack is confirmed. Frieza orders every one of his men to be dispatched, committed to slaughter these fools here and now. Though one underling argues, Battle against Azarus? That's madness! This insubordination quickly motivates the others. Calling out the intruder on board, Hanazi immediately puts a boot to the man's back, demanding to know where the engine room is, while the grunt humorously pleads, I always loved the same people, you know! Though she is soon stopped by Dodoria, able to positively identify her, she inquires if he's a fan. The brute merely raises a hand, muttering, Not really. Die! What did you expect? Your power is only 12,000, and I'm at least 22. You don't stand up. In his chamber, an officer reports to his master. Their troops have made their way to the Azaru army, and 94% of the Frieza force has already been wiped out. As the giant monkeys call for the emperor to show himself, one asks what they're waiting for. The other explaining, either for Hanazia to lower the shields or for Frieza to show himself. But time will prove problematic, as they don't have much air up here. Zarbon informing what's going on just outside. Frieza decides he'll just end this himself, using his true power. That last blast catching him in a daze, we spot his adversary staring out a window in full view of her planet and the many artificial moons. As the ship begins to malfunction and decompress due to the immense damage, Nausea makes her escape, just as Bardock calls for all the Saiyans to attack at once. As the tyrannical dictator is over-encumbered by the blast, chants ring out through the Azarus, praising their new king. In the coming days, Hanazia approaches Bardock, Bragging their little one went from a power level of 1 all the way up to 12 with just a bit of training. If he were still to be sent to that planet called Earth, he'd easily slaughter everyone there in just a few years. 
asking if he thinks they should still send him, but the king declines to, stating the ridiculous methods of Frieza are a thing of the past. They will take the Earth and many other worlds one day, especially those in Frieza's empire, but together, not merely sending their young, declaring the Saiyans don't take orders anymore, they give them, ushering in the long reign of the dreadful Saiyan people on the galaxy. But upon the destruction of Frieza's ship, unknown to the rebels, someone happened to be peering in. As it's reported to Cooler, his brother has fallen, scoffing at his siblings' ineptitude to be done in by a bunch of monkeys. Salza points out, had he not been in his reserve state, he would have easily survived, questioning if Cooler would like to embark on the planet himself or simply destroy it in one attack. Confused by his choices, the Space Lord quips he's not doing anything. After all, he's not even allowed to be in this part of the universe believing Frieza dying was his own fault. However, he will put an end to these pesky Saiyans, just as soon as King Cold grants him this territory. After Bardock's visions correctly predicted Frieza's betrayal, leading to the renegade soldier assembling the entire Saiyan race and killing the Emperor, the new king's oldest son stands victorious over a group of other children on Frieza Planet 68. Smugly thinking he's going to like it on this world, between the weaker life forms and lower gravity, here he'll be an elite. His thoughts are interrupted as someone calls for him, informing he's been reassigned. Explaining the situation while walking, the boy is alerted to everything that has recently happened, from the death of Frieza, to Bardock challenging King Vegeta and rising to the throne, to the most recent orders to have Raditz sent home. Snickering, the Empire is theirs now, the soldier remarks. Not exactly. Word of Frieza's death has spread through the universe, and many planets have taken the opportunity to reclaim their independence as well. For instance, Frieza Planet 44. An alien shouts to the young Vegeta to surrender without resistance, and this is going to hurt a lot less. Only wanting to negotiate with the Saiyan's new king. Not interested. He puts the man down after a single kick. Looking at him, he questions Nappa if he managed to find a way off this world. Who, while carrying someone, notes to his prince. He spotted a couple pods behind a nearby building. Vegeta snips not to be referred to as prince anymore, given his pathetic father is now nothing. Asking what the plan is when they get back, the boy smirks. If he isn't prince anymore, then maybe it's time to become king. Gherkin, the former king's right-hand man, also finds himself on a foreign planet, as the native people bow before him, pledging their allegiance to the Saiyans. This leaves Gherkin confused why they'd surrender without a fight. One explains they are no warriors and never obeyed Frieza of their own free will, offering an old adage of their race. Tyrants come and go, but people remain the same. Still puzzled, he merely explains the new king wants a new kind of armor from them. Laying his head down, he agrees to do as they wish. Over the next two years, Frieza's entire empire would be annexed into the new Saiyan Empire, with the exception of only a few worlds, claiming the Ektaris constellation, but struggling to capture Cooler Planet 24. The king scoffs, Saiyans are too independent to make great militaristic leaders. The senior Vegeta believes it's only a matter of teaching. But Bardock grumbles with Cooler arriving to Ektaris. In only three days, there's no time for learning. A soldier asking if he got this information from one of their spies. It was in fact one of the king's visions. Nothing further, he dismisses his men for the evening, leaving Hanazia, mother of Goku and Raditz, as the final soldier in the room. But being how he is, the king mutters he doesn't want to see anybody right now. But walking up to him, she smiles, frost demons aside. Things are looking pretty good at the moment, aren't they? Not shifting focus, hmm? Oh, yeah, when she, matter-of-factly, reveals she thinks the state of grace is over. Snapping around, he questions what she means, telling tomorrow she will defy him and take the throne for her own. And given the dynamic of their relationship, this is more immensely annoying than emotionally devastating. Hanazia even jokes she thought he'd have a vision about it. Though Bardock's plan wasn't finished, he didn't need to be the king, just for his people to listen to him. So instead of risking a duel he likely wouldn't have survived, he calls out to the citizens of his world, announcing, today will birth a new leader for the Saiyans. As tradition, the king is to be the strongest warrior among them. Since he himself is not participating, their leader will be whoever comes outstanding. 
Though the victor takes the throne, himself and Vegeta Sr. will remain as consultants to the Empire, as they must combine their strength and strategy to maximize the power of the Saiyans as a whole. The audience members clearly retain their loyalty to the both of them. One by one, the tournament moved along, most matches only lasting a few seconds. In fact, the majority of soldiers refused to go against any of the elites. But as morning turned to afternoon, only four Saiyans remained. As Hanazia grapples Gherkin from behind, she bellows for him to just give up. But as a stubborn warrior, Never! I will be king of sins! Choking him out, she is declared the winner, leaving one more bout before the final match, Paprika and Vegeta Jr. But the latter and Nappa object, declaring that won't be necessary. Dropping Paprika to the ground, Vegeta informs the last fight was taking too long, so they decided to have at it in the meantime, insisting there are witnesses to confirm no cheating was involved. Two of which piping up, admitting it was a close battle, but the kid is tough. Not caring either way, Nazia tells him to get in the ring, wanting to be crowned before nightfall. Calling her over, Bardock warns her not to kill Vegeta. Disputing it's a duel and she can do whatever she wants, the current king sighs, he knows her intent. But one day, that child will grow up, and when that day comes, he'll be even stronger than her, and he's going to be a very important person, and the future and fate of all the Saiyans depends on him, asking if she understands. Cutting to Paragus in the crowd, he points out the Vegeta family to his son, assuring they're no longer a threat after previously wanting to kill Broly. Even as little as he is, the prodigy is too powerful now, and when he gets older, he will be the one ruling the planet. Vegeta Sr. is surprised at his son's strength. In his absence, he's improved leaps and bounds. But Bardock knows this is only the beginning of his glory. However, it is not yet his time to lead. His will holding out better than his body, Vegeta tries to push himself off the ground. Grunting through stutters, he will be king. As Hanazia coldly quips, Maybe in your next life. Horrified of the boy's fate, Bardock grinds his teeth shunning Hanazia, who grins he not get his pants in a bunch, assuring she respected the final wish of the king and the kid will be fine. Eventually. Raising her hand, her victory is made official and she is declared the new leader of the planet, Hanazia, queen of the Saiyans, the crowd hollering in approval. As very, very far away, we find the bodies of Duri, Goldo, and Jace. While Knees and Birder fight, the armored squadron member taunts, where is his famous speed? As Salza puts his boot to Ginyu's chest, hissing it's annoying the captain has retained his loyalty to Frieza. Change! What is this? As Ginyu finishes off his former body, Rakum approaches to congratulate his leader, laughing how Salza didn't know he could change bodies. But actually, he did. Wearing a device on his head, he was prepared for this exact scenario. Calling someone on a scouter, he alerts the mission is complete, and he is close to Saiyan territory, inquiring if he should reclaim a few planets. But Cooler instructs he is instead needed here, as there are rebellions popping up throughout the Empire. Piffing since his brother was killed, some fools believe he can be too. And just as soon as his forces are stable again, he will take Frieza's territory as his own, one world at a time. A few more years pass. The Saiyans continued their conquest and expanded their reach. The oppression they instilled became more gruesome than even Frieza's. And while life was flourishing for them, taking all the riches and food they could ever need, the Frost Demons would again become a danger. Kakarot strolls into the room, greeting his older brother and asking how his mission went. Who chorts it was a pretty terrible planet, nothing but a lot of water and three suns. Great times. The other warrior comments how the fighters were kinda strong at least, one actually really strong, even managing to kill Gine in D's. Soliciting how they put down the warrior, Kakarot assumes Raditz just ran away, but it's really because Vegeta was with him and he took him on pretty much single-handedly. 
Raditz explains how strong he's gotten, aiming to surpass Broly. Cracking, he should have been there to see him beat this one Namek to a pulp. With a mouthful of food, Kakarot garbles a barely decipherable question about the Namekian's magic powers. But his brother snorts that was just a nonsense rumor. But he did find a really cool orb in one of the villages, but it randomly turned into a mere rock. Putting his focus back on Broly, stating he freaks him out, but can't help but wonder where he is now. Turns out, he was sent to Cooler Planet 72, and that world was completely destroyed. Questioning how he got home, Raditz mumbles he didn't and hopes he's floating dead in space somewhere, bearing great animosity for the prodigy. But it was the child himself who destroyed the planet, and surrounded by a force field, he zips through the galaxy. While seemingly impossible, there exist versions of Broly in other universes that can manage such a feat even as a baby. Sensing the energy blistering from the nearest celestial body, he has his eyes set on his destination. There, no one will scold him. No one will tell him to calm down. He can kill whoever he wants. There, he will be free. Even as a child, Broly is nothing more than a violent maniac. An alarm rings out as a soldier bellows their planets are being destroyed one after another on the southern frontier. Turning out to be Cooler's headquarters, the tyrant is irate to discover his territory is falling due to a single Saiyan. Terrified this could actually be the legendary Super Saiyan his brother feared. After spilling endless blood and causing unprecedented destruction, Broly finds a short semblance of peace. Even the strongest warriors have been mere insects in the wake of his power. The boy only hoping he'll get more of a challenge soon, when a ship begins to touch down on the world. Stepping out, not only Cooler, but his father King Cold. The child grinning with excitement at the pair. The Frost Demons speak amongst each other, the Elder asking if that little Saiyan is at fault for what they see before him. Cooler confirms that's the case. Sending Broly soaring through the air with ease. At last, he can finally use his true power. Smirking, Cooler laughs this kid is clearly above an elite, but alas, still nothing to the likes of a Frost Demon. And on this day, the entire universe looks on in awe as the battle is broadcast from the cameras on King Cold's ship. The announcer on the television comments how their aggressor appears to be only a single Saiyan child who has turned into an abomination of pure power, never imagining they would witness the invincible demons actually beaten and killed by one being. The boy soon disappeared, but reports are confirmed of both Cold and Cooler's death. Vegeta looks on furiously. This aura. This power, refusing to accept is for the legendary Super Saiyan alone. Simultaneously, his father has a conversation with Bardock, most likely following his visions. The former, albeit looking a bit nervous, assures, see, it worked perfectly. Though the senior Vegeta worries, when Broly comes back, he'll kill them all in a blind rage. But Bardock is convinced that as long as he is entertained by endless battles, they will be okay. At least for a few years. Apparently, despite the changes in this universe, it was yet again destiny for the Saiyans to rid themselves of the legendary Super Saiyan, one way or another. Ever since, the galaxies fell into utter chaos. The Saiyans continued with their deadly conquest. Broly ventured from planet to planet, left alone and unmanaged to do as he pleases, both responsible for the end of countless lives. Age 754, about 17 years have passed. Vegeta gears up believing today's the day, as he plans to challenge Queen Hanazia for the throne. At last, he will be king. Stepping out of his room, a group zips past him, shouting Broly is back! The legendary Super Saiyan has returned! Piquing the one-time prince's interest. Hanazia being one of the first to greet the prodigy, expressing how happy everyone is he's finally found his way back home, complimenting how powerful he's become. Without adding to the conversation, he bluntly states, he defies her for the throne. While put off by this brutish approach, this was well expected all along. Taking her stance, she beckons he show everyone the power of the legendary Super Saiyan, warning she won't go down easy. <laughs> Elsewhere, Bardock is happy to see the progress his people are making and taking over yet another planet. Getting a call on a scouter, he questions if this is an important matter. Celepa informs, Broly has come back to planet Vegeta, and the first thing he's done is kill Hanazia. 
Naturally, this makes him the new king of the Saiyans. She wanted Bardock to be the first to know, since Hanazio was his mate for many years. But just like Bardock, he scoffs he foresaw this ages ago, and it's no surprise to him. Informing, he will civilly greet their new leader once he heads back home, ending the transmission. Though inside, he wishes Hanazio rest in peace. Her time was simply up. King Broly was a, as predicted, short-tempered and excessively violent ruler. But what's more acceptable in a Saiyan society? From time to time, he would even use a Super Saiyan form, but never faced a genuine challenge, so his legendary state remained dormant, leaving the king, mostly, sane. Vegeta studied Broly with extreme jealousy. His obsession grew from fear, to anger, to hate, and finally, suffering. Unlocking Super Saiyan for himself on a distant world, absorbing the ramifications of the transformation, realizing he's been put through the most ruthless training. Yet, he came nowhere close to the king's power. But now, due to his own self-loathing, his potential has awakened. And it's now confirmed, the Super Saiyan is not limited to only Broly. <laughs> You're almost right. Spotting Bardock lurking nearby, he demands to know what he's doing here. Who grins? He's been waiting for this day for 20 years. Informing the warrior, he is now the lone fighter who can stand up against Broly. Grabbing him by the throat, the tormented Saiyan bellows. He knew this entire time and didn't say anything. Still taking satisfaction in seeing his premonition come full circle. Bardock reminds, he only makes the future known when it's something he wants to avoid. More importantly, Vegeta is going to challenge the king for the throne. But even with this most recent transformation, he is still nothing when compared to the legendary Super Saiyan. Having seen him crushed by the king in several visions, Bardock has long been searching for a way for Vegeta to defeat him. Apprehensive, but why would you help me? The soothsayer has a pretty simple answer for this. Broly will eventually go on a rampage, destroying both galaxies and the Saiyan race. Vegeta won't. Each time Bardock devised a plan, a vision would inform if it'd work. After many failures, he believes he has at last discovered the perfect strategy. Admitting to the warrior, he won't like it, but it's undoubtedly the best option. Indeed, Vegeta despised the idea, but would come to accept it after seeing how outclassed he was by Broly. Back on planet Vegeta, the king joyfully accepts the challenge, happy to kill him this afternoon. But upon revealing he has also achieved the Super Saiyan state, Broly excitedly moves the fight to right now, but shouting for them to wait. Vegeta Sr. quarrels the strength of two Super Saiyans is unheard of. With that kind of power, their duel will kill them all, urging they instead find an isolated planet where they can both fight without any exterior concerns. Another Saiyan backs up this idea, but the king refuses to wait. Trying to appeal to Broly's ego, he urges. His king is wise, and he knows the fight will be much better this way, who in turn, offers exactly one minute to find such a world. And doing so, plus a bit of extra time for preparations, the pair head to their respective pods. While it'll take a few weeks for them to arrive, luckily, they'll slip into hibernation and the trip should seem instantaneous. Time quickly passes, and an alien soldier alerts his superiors. It appears two Saiyan ships are approaching. Baffled to find Saiyans all the way out here, he orders his men to fire. Touching down on the ship, an armed platoon rushes to greet him. One warning they turn around immediately, as this place is very dangerous, causing Vegeta to mock. Of course it is! We're here! Making quick work of him, Broly is now ready for the real battle to begin. Getting a slight edge, Vegeta realizes Broly is no expert fighter at all, only immensely powerful. At this rate, he'll be able to kill him by himself. Elsewhere, a ship soars through space. Catching wind of the two Saiyans and receiving orders to take care of him, he finds his command laughable. The soldier, Genro, acknowledges he could wipe out a dozen Saiyans with ease, but the Mad King and some other yellow-lit monster, that's ridiculous. Maybe he can do something if he has the support of some other Ultras, signifying the man is part of the Hellolite race. But before finishing his sentence, something outside catches his attention. Opening the hatch, he shouts to the man he shouldn't be here as something very dangerous is going on nearby. 
before, possibly absorbing this man is flying through the cosmos on only a crystal ball, questioning what he is. Without fully turning, Raichi utters he is revenge personified, the ultimate enemy of the Saiyans. Optimistic at the luck of running into a friend all the way out here, the doctor affirms their mutual interest does not make them friends, only allies at best. What's the point of so many blasts if you can't even aim? As cocky as ever, Vegeta promises to show the king how it's done, who growls this pest is beginning to get on his nerves. Powering up, his challenger scoffs he stay put right there, and this will be over soon. <laughs> I am Broly, King of Saiyans! Finished already? The Hell Light stares on at the battle before him, as two more Ultras, Wigner and Walls, accompany him, informing the Unknown Saiyan appears to be out of commission, but they must stop the Mad King. Indeed, Vegeta has likely lost this battle, as Broly senses the other men in the sky. Now completely insane, he salivates at having the thought of more fighters to kill, firing the Ultra Waver. It's no use. One of their most powerful attacks does nothing against the legendary Super Saiyan. Dashing towards them, they resolve to rely on hand-to-hand -hand combat. Wall's convinced he'll run out of energy eventually, but Genro knows they must not rely on that. Commanding, they use the laser. It can cut through anything. Yes, sir! Nothing! Taking down their comrade with next to zero effort, his fellow Ultras can only stand by helplessly. Hey, Broly! You're not done with me yet! Arguing since the station they were previously battling on has been reduced to rubble, they finish this on a nearby world. Following his challenger to a dark planet, the Hell Lights are aghast at what these fools are doing. Ready to put an end to this once and for all, Vegeta couldn't agree more, though disappointed he had to rely on Bardock's plan. What? The sludge beneath the king quickly crawling up his body, unable to escape the deadly powers of the carbonite. The substance methodically encumbers the king of Saiyans, consuming him entirely. Though Vegeta hasn't a clue what this gunk is, it's apparently something that can even take down the likes of the legendary Super Saiyan. And now since he's dead, Vegeta stands as the most powerful warrior in the universe, before being confronted by the Ultras, who declare he's under arrest. Dropping from his transformation, Oxygen sounds good to the new king, so he gives himself up without a fight. Warning, these restraints are made from Kashin Aliage. He tells the Saiyan not to try anything stupid, cautiously ushering him to the ship. One chides a single powerful blow to the planet beneath him could eliminate the entire universe. Scolding that was very dangerous what he did. Rushing back to Helior with the Mad King dead and a powerful Saiyan hostage in their hands. Genro thinks aloud, maybe Wall's death wasn't in vain after all. However, a few weeks later, Vegeta would go on to destroy the Hell Light's planet, venturing home to claim his place as King of the Saiyans. And as before, their empire only continued to grow. But back on the Carbonite world, Download of a new show complete. they were unaware of a new menace brewing in the darkness, who mumbles he has obtained another Saiyan ghost, unsure if he likes using them to his advantage or not. But with so much power in this one, Raichi is ready to end the entire Saiyan race for good. On planet Zyoga 3, year 780, we're greeted with a monstrous castle. Making our way through its corridors, Hoi, the villain in Wrath of the Dragon, is seen looking rather nervous about something. But upon seeing what he sees, he does find himself in an intimidating place. Pressing on, he begins to walk forward when a voice beckons. What are you doing here? Anxiously trying to explain himself, Hoy stutters that the door was open, or rather, there was no door. The man tells that since no life thrives on this planet, he has no need for doors. The wizard then drops to his knees, muttering how he is his only hope. If you haven't guessed by now, Dr. Raichi. Explaining his situation, Hoy questions if the Tuffle is familiar with the great hero Tapion, as he's fallen victim to an evil music box, sealed within by horrible magic. 
But Raichi merely scoffs. He cares not about this hero. But pleading, he is the only one with the power to open it. He's tried everything he could. But reiterating his disinterest, the scientist tells his visitor to leave. Now. But not doing so, Hoi reaches into his coat to retrieve the box, proclaiming the doctor is a true hero for having eradicated the Saiyan people who oppressed the entire universe. Arguing, Tapion is a hero too and deserves to be free. As a moment of silence engulfs the room, it seems Hoi may have appealed to Raichi's emotional side. He would go on to work for several days, attempting to open the box. In fact, this challenge was actually refreshing, figuring out different methods and ideas to crack the code. It would soon let out a click. Followed by music. To the shock and elation of the pair, it opens. A powerful energy is trying to escape. Tapion is free, though glares at Hoi, demanding to know why he's freed him. Inquiring if he's happy to be rid of his prison, the Kanajan barks he shouldn't have done this. Alertedly, Raichi questions what the problem is, while the wizard emits a vile grin. Attempting to flee the area, Raichi blocks his path with a hidden door, having misled him before. The doctor growls, the wizard isn't going anywhere, and for him to explain himself. Turning around, he cracks there's no reason to be so hasty. As the pair gaze on, he continues by stating he'll understand in time all by himself while radiating a strange energy. The Kanaja knowing exactly what this is, as the wizard cackles, he offers his thanks for the Tuffle's help, bidding farewell. As the bottom half of Harutagarn appears, Tapion scowls. So, Minosha, you killed him! As Tapion goes on to play his ocarina, Raichi's tech begins to ring out, detecting a massive power here in the lab. Finally, having had enough of his lab being destroyed, the doctor summons his ghost warriors. In a surprise twist, all of which are Saiyans, vastly confusing Hoi, believing them all to be dead. Raichi reveals their ghosts are now his slaves. And soon, the wizard will take his place alongside of them. Giving the order, Kakarot, or Goku, dashes after him, stating it's over. But his foe seems to have something up his sleeve, mocking, look who's talking. While the Saiyan hesitates to make heads or tails of what this means, Hrutigarn comes to the rescue of his master. Hanazia, Goku and Raditz's mother in the multiverse canon, scoffs to get rid of the monster first. While the warrior believes this to be the end of the creature, Raichi isn't convinced. Shouting for her comrade to dodge, they're caught off guard. The other fighter is accepting the severity of what's going on. Jumping away, Hoi lasts for them to merely play with his creation, while he… before Raditz cuts him off, stating he's not going anywhere. Oh, wait! As one of his teammates careens towards him, it causes a Saiyan to roar with laughter, cackling, Ha <laughs> ha! Who's the weakling now? His mother urging he keep his guard up, as the giant is very strong, and there have already been three casualties. Her son horror-struck by this discovery. Inside the compound, Tapion reaches out for his ocarina, but can't quite reach it. When someone appears in front of him, Raichi, who calmly asks how this monster is linked to him, but the musical warrior only shouts for him to give him his instrument, though the doctor once answers first. So he reveals, the other half of this monster is inside of him. Gazing at the creature, Raichi takes a moment to think finding this very interesting. Going back in time to year negative 425, in every universe of the multiverse tournament, Hoi unravels his side of the story. All of this began on planet Kanats about a thousand years ago, 
His people were a powerful group of sorcerers. Using a local idol, they managed to breathe life into their invincible monster, Harutagarn. Their plan was working to perfection. His people were about to conquer the entire universe. But the native Kanajians still had artifacts of their own linked to this idol and fought back. Eventually, they were able to cut the creature in two, sealing each part within musicians, Tapion and Minosha. The two martyrs would then banish themselves into magic boxes, which were hurled outwards through space. So the sorcerer sung out for ages, hoping to one day retrieve their lost power. While it took hundreds of years, new generations moved from galaxy to galaxy, eventually finding the both of them in year 214, residing in a territory under Prince Cold's control. Luckily, they were able to use their own powers to open one of the boxes, freeing Minosha and the lower half of Harutagarn, who would quickly dispatch the Guardian after going on a rampage, destroying much of the planet. They were forced to seal him once more, though this time, in Hoi himself. When they attempted to open the other box, Cold's army moved in, attacking the group, as he didn't take kindly to his planets being damaged, slaughtering everyone but Hoi himself only because they feared doing so would release the monster within him. Instead, they placed him in cryogenic sleep forever. But eons later, someone broke in and freed him from his prison. Awakened and confused, he made his escape to continue his quest for the other music box. And only a few years later, he'd find it. Though alone, he didn't have enough power to open it. So in most universes, he never succeeded in his task and died alone and forgotten by time. In Universe 16 and 18, where Vegito is in our own realm, he caught wind of the Dragon Balls and traveled to Earth to utilize them, but would fall in battle. And exclusive to this Universe 3, he was told of a great scientist called Dr. Raichi, but again would die. Resuming where we left off, the Tuffle now understands everything, Tapion explaining what we just saw. Gaining control over the situation, the scientist knows the first thing that must be done is to seal this half once more, picking up the ocarina. Again, Tapion pleads for him to hand it over, vowing to seal this half within him as well, clearly seeing he can barely hold back the half he already contains, not knowing what else they can do. But being the brilliant mind he is, having heard his song only once, he has already begun programming it into his ghost warriors, throwing it to Hanazia instead who assures the melody is in good hands. While the Saiyans aren't faring too well, she bellows out to those still alive, demanding they keep the creature busy a little longer. Their attacks only managing to slightly slow it down. And suddenly, Tapion falls to a knee, struggling to speak. Perutagarn is calling his other half. Raichi questions if he'll be able to hold it in much longer, but unable to answer things aren't looking good. Just as the tail is about to take out Raditz, the song begins to echo through the air, stopping it in its tracks. Just as things are looking up, Hanazia is struck down. Still not panicking, the Tuffle is merely frustrated at the uselessness of these Saiyans. Trembling, Tapion apologizes, as he's not able to hold the monster back any longer. Looking on, Raditz knew there had to be another half. Gherkin rushing in to grab the flute, even mocking the creature that he'll never touch. Him. Raditz again laughing aloud, as given how these elite fighters treated him his entire life. It's only fitting he still carries a grudge. Looking around for the musical thing himself, the upper half makes its approach. Growing concerned with the situation, Raichi knows he needs to summon more warriors as Raditz quickly finds what he's looking for. And realizing this thing can't fly, or at least its legs can't, the Saiyan takes to the air, chuckling for this lowly insect to stay down there. Playing the melody as instilled in him by the doctor, the creature becomes sealed once more. The upper half returning to Tapion. Though, in a humorous moment, Raditz feels like he just indirectly kissed his own mother after playing the flute. Rejoining the others, Tapion warns Rudigarn will escape again, and with more power each occurrence. Raichi believes they'll at least have a few hours, so that's plenty of time to come up with something. And so he did, as he was able to modify the music box into a portable device instead, 
A simple wristband Tapion could attach to himself and would become able to walk free without being a constant danger. A few days later, Ghost Raditz would disappear, and Tapion was able to contain all of Harutagarn within himself. And not long after that, Raichi asks Tapion what he plans to do now, but he's really not too sure. Still absorbing the fact his younger brother was killed, maybe centuries ago, and even if he were to return to his own planet, it's not like anything will be the same. The Tuffle himself knows this feeling all too well, stating whatever he does, the dead won't come back, to which he seems to accept, and his life would continue, years passing one at a time. And time does heal the wounds of the good willed. Tapion traveled far and wide, making many friends, growing especially close to Raichi, and would visit him often. And though he grew happier as each day passed, some never opened their heart, and the doctor would never find peace because revenge doesn't stop hatred. One day, new visitors arrived to these two heroes. The Vargas explained the tournament. Most importantly, the prize for the winner in the Dragon Balls. With hope to resurrect his brother, Tapion eagerly bids to enter. Upon the alien asking Raichi, he declines, shocking the Kanajan, knowing he's much stronger than himself, not to mention the Ghost Warriors. But the scientist merely states he has achieved his goals and has no wish to dream of now. While disappointing, no one pushes to try to convince him otherwise. Tapion questions who else will be participating, and though he's one of the first entries, it can be assumed that others would consist of Kaioshins, Frost Demons, Saiyans. Naturally, the last one catching the attention of the Tuffle. Confused of the fact the Saiyans are still in existence, the Vargas nonchalantly details of course they are. Given their strength and love of battle, it's almost a guarantee they'll find some willing to enter. He then announces he's changed his mind, and instead will also fight, explaining it seems his wish hasn't been achieved after all, as there are still Saiyans to exterminate. Though he doesn't state his desire aloud, and being in the dark on this side of the doctor, Tapion utters he doesn't know what his wish is, but believing Raichi is a good person, he hopes it comes true, causing his friend to quietly scoff. Good person, huh? Not really. But upon being asked what he's muttering, he moves on from the subject. Tapion cheering they do their best to fulfill their wishes, stoically replying, I will. The pair gaze towards the ship, ready to begin a new adventure. The Vargas inside, deciding they've gathered enough fighters from this realm and will head back to the arena universe. But not before they get a new blip on their radar, discovering yet another warrior with great power, finding who we know as King Piccolo on a small world called Earth which is strange, because it's the first time they found a notable warrior on that planet, believing it's most likely a fluke. When they alert someone, standing in the shadows to explain the situation, they'll be making one last stop before heading to the arena, but the psychic combatant assures it's no problem, as he already knew of the delay. In Universe 3, year 752, around 18 years after Goku would be born, the entire universe has fallen prey to the Saiyans, a warrior race that pillages and kills for fun. Inside of the attack ball searing through space, we're introduced to a trio of Saiyans we've never seen before. First, there's Kali, a young girl who yawns out that it looks like they've finally reached their destination. Then a boy, Kumpin, also with groggy eyes, shouts, finally, I've been dreaming of meatloaf for months. I'm hungry. And finally, what appears to be another girl, Chirito who questions the others what this planet was called again. Of course, it's Earth, on which the average power level is only 3.35. Looks like that farmer with a shotgun. Rifle! It's clearly a rifle! Farmer with a rifle was a little more beefy than we've been giving him credit for all these years. Zooming out on the five pods, a new voice protests that he can't really understand why they need a babysitter for such a weak planet. Introducing a Saiyan named Reap. The cocky child continues, especially if it's going to be this loser. Referring to Raditz, though unfazed, he simply utters that he heard that. Looks like no matter the universe, the brother of Goku is fated to cross paths with the Earth. Below, we're greeted with a planet that up until now has been identical with its iteration from Universe 9, the universe where Krillin took over the Turtle School and Yamcha became a cyborg. From within Capsule Corp, a familiar voice beckons. Master, we've been training for hours. I'm hungry. Though the sparring rages on despite protest, 
Roshi implores that endurance is vital to becoming a competent martial artist. While the height-challenged warrior argues that eating is vital too, a certain wolf marks his prey. And has a tertiary comment on how concentration is as well vital. Dropping Curl into the ground, their teacher congratulates Yamcha on a job well done. As Bulma comes speeding out of her home, pleading with the gang to look at the news, something horrible has happened. On the TV, a newsman trembles to report how a massacre without precedent has taken place. Every inhabitant of several cities have been killed, even children. The assassins have a human appearance, but bullets don't seem to have any effect on them. They are fast, powerful, and ruthless. These demons look to be en route to their next destination, East City, urging citizens to run quickly and take shelter. Our heroes look on at the awful situation before their master instructs them to pack their bags. They need to go. But if this takes place roughly around a year before the 22nd World Tournament, surely they're walking into a slaughter. As the city of their current location lies in ruins, the children clearly get a kick out of their one-sided extermination. Meanwhile, Raditz chastises one of them, lecturing how she needs to focus more on teamwork. She must pay more attention to her comrades, while the others find a laugh in seeing their counterpart get told off. In the air, Chorito informs that was the last of them. All of the runners are dead now. When someone evades her detection, Mercenary Tao! He confidently sneers that these individuals must be the assassins everyone is talking about. The young girl is a bit bewildered. Who is this guy? She didn't even hear him arrive. Striking her in the back of the neck, Raditz Scouter is able to momentarily pick up on his power, which he describes as a mildly strong presence. Heading back over to the mercenary, he seems to have killed her or at least knocked her out cold. He chuckles to himself, that's one down. This government contract is going to be easier than expected. But before he knows it, he's surrounded by her allies. Now there are a bit too many of them. It would be most wise to flee for now and... Though, he's no match for a full-grown Saiyan. Raditz delivers the same hit Tao himself did just a few moments ago. Killing the assassin. The children gaze upon their fallen comrade. He killed Chorito! But their mentor scoffs that there is always someone stronger. That'll teach her to be more careful. Causing her to push herself from the ground to exclaim that she's not dead. But that did really hurt. Humpin' chortles that he knew it. A guy that easily killed by Raditz couldn't be too strong. And so, in the following weeks, the Saiyans proved too much for Earth's defenses. And the genocide continued. Relentlessly. Looking down upon his planet, Kami thinks out loud to Mr. Popo that he himself has to act. It's his duty as guardian. is able to effortlessly slap away the blast of one of the youngsters. She furiously calls out to know who this is. Divine punishment! With that immense attack bearing down on the Saiyan child, her closest ally trembles that can't be possible. Guardian busies himself with another one of the runs. Raditz and Kumpin head over to Chorito. The latter whimpering her name. His mentor awaits his response. But this time, she really is dead. Sending Raditz into a rage. But not for any sentimental reason. Only because he's going to get told off by the others again. 
the invading Saiyan heads his way, Kami holds his current opponent by the neck. He snarls that they may look like children, but they are in fact demons, and he will have no mercy. Although Raditz is able to get in a shot on the Namekian, he's able to compose himself. However, he can tell that this adult is very strong. The duo glare down at Earth's last defender. Raditz apologizes, but he is responsible for the security of their younglings. They're his army's future after all. But army? The situation just got much worse than Kami feared. That's when the former recognizes his new foe. He's a Namekian, isn't he? Something at this point Kami himself doesn't even know. Regardless. Raditz believes this must be destiny. He's killed a bunch of his kind, and he'll just be the latest to join them. But before the blast is able to connect, Mr. Popo thinks quickly and gets the God of Earth out of the battlefield. Something that could have been useful many times in the official series. But this information isn't lost on the sands. Baffled how he could just disappear like that. Back on the lookout. Kami thanks him. Having the chance to feel up close the strength of this adult alien, he now knows how terrifying his power truly is. He can't even wound him. Again with a big brain. Popo suggests they can surely trap him with magic, which is very possible. But if he's to be believed, there's an army of warriors just like him, and it's much worse than they imagined. They need to prepare for more invasions, and they need enough strength to push them all back. An entrapment spell would likely only work for so long, maybe even only once. And strong enough, what could that entail? Summoning Shenron. Whether they're already in possession of the Dragon Balls or not, the Serpent beckons what his user's wish shall be. Simple enough. Kami wants to have his full capabilities of Yonder returned to him. Surely this means youth. What could he also mean? Without hesitation, Shenron states it shall be done. As predicted, Kami is no longer the distinguished guardian we've always known, but a proud young warrior. Although, he senses he is not complete causing the dragon to inform that the rest depends upon himself. As Shenron flies away, King Piccolo gathers himself and reveals to Kami that his pet dragon showed him everything. What a terrible guardian of Earth he's made! But if this is true, Piccolo must then know their plan. He wishes for the pair to once more become one. At least Piccolo can be free through Kami himself. <laughs> Dream on! No, running away won't work. This time, the god has taken precautions to assure the evildoer won't be able to leave this lookout on his own accord. But if that's the case, the demon figures he'll simply stand by and enjoy the show, taking his place on the edge of the floating sanctuary. He chortles that he likes these demons, Although, they do lack style. Commenting. Oh, eight and one. That little one's good. Unfortunately, there's no time to spare. Kame relents at his evil half wins. Piccolo will be the base and in control of the fusion. He instructs him to place his hand upon him. Who leers at between two demons? Better the one you know, right? The merger completes. The now singular Namekian screeches out that Piccolo Daimao is back, leaving Popo to only wonder what Kami has done. Blasting the genie in sanctuary itself, Piccolo relishes in the full power of their youth, now on the side of evil. That's all Kami has managed to do. Though, he thinks he will put an end to these little invaders. After all, it's his job to make the humans suffer. While he heads off in the direction of the Saiyans, one who finds himself on a sparsely inhabited island. The villagers cower in fear as one pleads for him to at least spare the children. But what do they take him for? Not a complete monster worthy of drop kicking a giant wood chipper. No, no, no! That lacks cruelty! What a waste!
better to attack them one at a time. After showcasing his superior speed, the fused Namekian grabs the kid, growling that the right way to do this is to make your prey suffer slowly and see the fear spread across their face as he hoists his foe into the air before finally killing them in front of their close ones! I'm getting tired of this Namekian! Severely injuring the Saiyan, the invader can only wonder how he's gotten so much stronger. As the kids begin to shake and ironically shout, he's a monster and they should run for it. The Namek sinisterly smiles for the little ones not to leave. Ah! Raditz dashes towards him and questions what exactly the Simple Soul is hoping for. His scouter is transmitting everything happening here. He can kill the five of them, but others will come. Thousands even. But Piccolo is looking forward to it. What a beautiful carnage it'll be. So do tell his little friends. Send their army. His own will be waiting. With a Saiyan dropping lifeless, the villagers all run out cheering and shouting for their savior, thanking him for saving their lives. But this only prompts the Namekian to laugh. Savior, no. He raises his hand to extinguish them as well. When he gets an idea, it would be pretty cruel to allow these Cretans to rebuild, only for the Saiyans to come back and destroy them later. The evildoer bellows out to all the wretched creatures of Earth. They can tell everyone that the world's torment has only just started. Piccolo Daimao is back, and a thousand times stronger than ever before. Piccolo Daimao. Some of the villagers already know that name, resulting in a wave of fear to encompass them. Alas, the end of humanity by the Saiyans has been avoided. But at what cost in the exchange? Will the demons fend off the coming invasions? Or are we all damned to eternal suffering? Universe 4 Age 774 The Realm of Super Boo A small voice seems to be emanating from the Majin's head. Boo's voice itself, actually, explaining to someone, they are now smaller than a flea. Another voice replies, they're gonna need to find an exit after taking care of Boo. Goku and Vegeta, of course. But the villain taunts, they will never find their way out of here, and they're going to die. But scoffing, not necessarily. The prince grabs hold of Fat Boo's cocoon. <laughs> Spotting the villain up to something, Goku calls out for his rival. But it's too late and he's consumed by his surroundings. Steam firing from his pores. The Kais look on with a sense of horror in their stomachs. Our hero demanding to know what happened as Goku now appears in a new area. Who announces he's taking advantage of his new transformation to move the warrior to a part of his body where he does not house his absorbed beings. As we see Vegeta has been ensnared, mocking he's done being given trouble. Vegeta stands before us. With this most recent absorption, not only does the Majin's power skyrocket, but his intelligence also greatly improves. Feeling the changes, he can feel the prince is a very motivated individual, mostly of wanting to face Goku. Chuckling, he owes it to himself to give Vegeta that satisfaction. Before taunting our hero, he won't be able to escape this place, and this will be his final battle. Not sensing anything from the outside of Boo, Goku notes he won't be able to simply teleport his way out of here, and the walls are too strong for him to merely blast through. So, he decides to defeat the villain here, once and for all. In the world of the Kais, the Elder growls Goku is about to get himself killed, going on how Boo has not reabsorbed the others that were detached by the Saiyans, so Boo can still get even stronger. Kabuto Kai resolving to go himself. Maybe he can at least pose as a distraction from the outside to give our hero a fighting chance. Running away is useless! Tired already? Tommy! Ah! 
smoke screen. That'll never. Can we not be left alone? All right, enough. He's gone. Looking on, Dende recognizes Kabito Kai in the distance. While Goku knows he must take advantage of this opportunity, believing from in here the Earth shouldn't be at risk. And the Kaio is either unconscious or dead. Who figures with that settled, he still has a battle waiting for him, even if his opponent stands no chance. Sorry for making you. Having depleted all of his strength, Goku falls back to his base form. And to his horror, Boo simply regenerates. Chuckling, he's impressed. If the Saiyan had used that attack on the outside, he may have actually been completely obliterated, along with the planet and entire solar system, calling it quite the beautiful finale. Without hesitating, he welcomes our hero to his new home, reaching out to absorb him. The god of Earth, laying witness to the last of their defenses, succumbing to the monster. Boo even reabsorbs Gohan and the others, becoming more powerful than one could imagine. With this, he resolves to destroy the Earth as previously planned. But hesitating, he realizes he doesn't want to anymore. After Goku and the others became a part of him, their will to save the world is too much, giving the Majin an affinity for the planet as well. In fact, he wants to fix it now, shouting for Dende to gather the Dragon Balls to undo everything that's been done. Well, mostly everything. Who, shaking, notes it'll take four months for the balls to be usable again, but he'll do his best, not sensing any evil intent or deception within him. Satan asks if this means everything will go back to normal, leaving the pair to wonder, has he become good? Strolling up to Kabito Kai, he's happy to discover he's still alive, but very close to death. He turns him into a cookie, eating him. So probably not good per se. Walking off, he states he feels like doing some training now. And working fast, Dende is able to reactivate the Dragon Balls in only a few days, reviving everyone killed since the World Tournament and undoing the destruction the Majin has done. Amazed to see they're still alive, Krillin can't sense Goku or the others. But a voice assures them it's okay, as they are all still alive inside of him before explaining they won't be seeing their friends anymore, and that's just how it has to be, but he will leave this planet in peace. Then questions Bulma, You there, you're pretty smart, aren't you? Absorbing her into his collection, to the terror of the surviving Z Fighters. Noting the lack of change in his physical form, his body must have recently stabilized, but he can feel a great difference in his intelligence. Happily bidding the rest farewell, very similar to how Goku would have, but promises to visit from time to time as he takes off into the sky. And that's how the long, long story of Super Buu would begin, going on to absorb anyone with interesting skills. He'd travel the universe committing both good and evil, depending on his mood. Four years later, the Majin excelled in just about everything, and given his special abilities, he was able to be many places at once, one of which is available to the public 24-7 in a giant palace. A message at the gate reading, Boo! Omnipotence God! I'll grant your wish, or kill you. Stay in line. Inside the castle walls, a giant line of people patiently wait their turn. Even the evil wizard Hoi has ventured to this place, not able to see where the crowd ends. He thinks to himself, it's quite odd that it's taking hours to slowly move towards the Majin. But then again, in the presence of Boo, disorderly conduct would most likely immediately be dealt with. Gorgor the Great doesn't wait in line! Uh -huh. Stupid! Dad, I'm hungry! As Gorkor the Great smolders, someone asks another if he'll hold his place while he runs to the bathroom, who refuses to, but strangely enough, offers him a glass jar to do his business in, who's grossed out to find it's not empty. Which, to be fair, the frog guy did bring it for himself. As the hours droned on, Hoi got close enough to hear the wishes of the others. I want to be immortal! Denied. 
I want the power to save the people I love. So cliche. And your heart isn't even close to being pure. Denied. Uh, I want a thousand wishes. Denied. I want to be able to read people's true hearts. Granted. Now with the ability to see right through everyone in line, the man is overwhelmed at his new powers. Before realizing they're all just terrible people. As the Majin lays eyes upon a familiar face, Videl, who wants Gohan and his friends back, but instead of killing her, he simply mutters for her to stop coming here, snapping his fingers and teleporting her back to Earth. Before she vanishes, she shouts that he was nice once, pleading for him to remember her father. Next is a uh, Ratman, who begs to know the meaning of life, the universe, everything. Cookies. Isn't it 40? Cookies. Go. Now. Eventually, Hoi would finally get his turn, beckoning the almighty Buu to please unseal this magical music box. Upon asking what's inside, the wizard reveals a great hero has been imprisoned there. Finding this white light humorous, Buu figures it will spice things up for a second. Arising from the box, Tapion demands to know why he's been freed. Hoi, once again, asking if he's happy to be out of his entrapment. The hero turns to Boo, shouting he shouldn't have done this. Asking why, he merely screams to be sent back in the box, as a random person calls for him to get in line like everyone else. Beautiful! Bravo! Even though the spectator's situation appears dire, they are all under Boo's protection and have nothing to worry about. But Tapion growls, Hoi killed his brother, and he's going to make sure this monster of his stays sealed away forever, causing the wizard to command Harutagarn to attack. Trying to free up only mere seconds to begin his song, knowing once he starts playing, the beast won't be able to move as it bends down to pick up Hoi, who continues to shout commands. Finding interest in a magical creature like himself, his endless travels, absorptions, and powers allow him to see this giant was created by tiny, wrinkly sorcerers. Muttering he can hear his thoughts, his laments, hating his life as a servant after previously living as an idol. Admitting he didn't get in line, but nonetheless deserves his wish of peace. turning Harutagarn into stone. No! My creature! What have they done? Your time has come to an end. Don't you dare! I'm still a powerful sorcerer, you know! And with the demise of the wizard, Tapion notices the palace putting itself back together all on its own. A few more hours would pass. The now truly freed hero, taking his turn in line after discovering Boo can grant near any wish. Can, can you bring my brother back? Sure. Really? Just like that? Just like that. A new life began for Tapion and Minosia. In a new era, a new civilization, they still had each other, which was more than enough for them. Who would go on to grant another million or so wishes before getting bored, as we wonder what other escapades could he get into? In Universe 6, on May 26, age 767, Son Goku sacrificed himself to save the world, taking King Kai's planet with him and causing the dreaded Bojack gang, who were previously imprisoned by the Kaios, to be set free. Feeling the fight between Gohan and Cell, the space pirates decided to head towards these strange powers. Sometime later, they arrived to Earth and attacked our heroes who tried to stop them, but the Bojack gang arose as the superior warriors. Though Trunks proved to be quite the match, quickly dispatching Kogu. Even the greatest fighters of the planet would fall, Gohan on the brink of death only being watched by his father from Otherworld. Goku would wait too long to intervene, and his child would fall at the hands of Bojack. Piccolo being the first to sense what has happened, it's obvious to him, even from a distance, the young warrior won't be getting back up. Away. Spotting the Namekian fighting solo, Trunks glances around for Gohan, also discovering what has happened. 
and snared once more. He falls out of the Super Saiyan form, while Piccolo lets himself get distracted. His foe jeering, he just give up. Who knows? Maybe he'll become Bojack's favorite slave. But the Namek isn't ready to throw in the towel. Who's next? But looking around, it seems the Space Pirates know something we don't. Bojack quipping, his current fight isn't over. Having enough fun and playing around, their leader orders his crew to finish off the surviving warriors. How dare you make a fool of the Prince of All Saiyans! Bojack realizes this isn't merely another weak blast. Deciding to use one of his cronies to hold off the attack for him. The villain wisely sneaks up on Vegeta from behind to end him for good, while Trunks looks over calling out for his father. It finally dawns on Bojack the pair's relationship. Laughing aloud at this revelation, he assures him not to worry, as he will soon be joining him. In acceptance of what just happened, Goku senses all of his friends perish. But on the bright side, appearing at the check-in station, at least now he'll have some more company in Otherworld. The boy apologizing to his father for not being able to release his anger. But our hero tells his son it's okay, as they're going to strike back, questioning Yemma if the dead can really return to the world of the living for one day. He admits they can, but refuses to grant it to Goku and his friends. In mass confusion, he goes on to explain the dead can't interfere with the affairs of the living, and their motivations are selfish. He'd consider an exception, say if the universe was in danger, but Bojack isn't that type, like Cell for instance, to want to destroy it. And for one of the very few times, Goku's left helpless to assist the Earth. Over the ensuing weeks, Bojack reduced the people of Earth to a planet of slaves, commanding they build a palace luxurious enough for his liking. Taking it easy for a few months, he eventually grew bored with the tranquility and would venture to new planets to conquer them with his gang. The Empire of the Frost Demons was quickly replaced by the Empire of Bojack. In most universes, not disclosed which, we peer in on planet Jaina at the Jackal's secret base. A scientist expresses his approval in some recent test results, and their subjects will be able to give a demonstration within a week. Looking behind him, it appears to be some sort of prison. Zooming in on an elderly man with an eye patch, whatever these people's situation is, it sounds rather dire, as he talks about how the project will have to be perfect, as they've invested all the city's resources on it. If they fail, the demons Polar and Cold will destroy them all with ease, and we can assume the smaller of these two warriors shown is King Cold, but Polar is a completely unfamiliar name up to this point, possibly a brother or unknown son of the tyrant. But his colleague urges he not worry, believing the subjects will prove superior, boasting their new technology is perfect, and they won't have merely two or three invincible demons, but an entire army. Pulling up files on their subjects, his personal favorite to defeat Cold is Commander Sugui, who has a power of 780,000. Next is Lieutenant Baido, whose strength is much less, but still formidable at 160,000. Both volunteers for this project. Another volunteer being a former firefighter by the name of Wooljack, who nearly rivals Bido in combat, before stumbling upon some familiar criminals who are all prisoner subjects and not willing participants, all much weaker than those previously mentioned. Bojack, habitual criminal, power 110,000. Zhenya, professional swindler, 65,000. Newcomer Gowana, mercenary, 48,000. Gakua, or Kogu, unspecified offender, 45,000. And finally, the orphan Bujin, who unlike the previous four mentioned, is speculated to be a volunteer rather than a prisoner, though it isn't confirmed. The scientist is a bit reluctant to trust the captives, questioning how they know they'll obey, but his underling assures they are very much under control, and he will see during the demonstration, everything is going to be okay. But if only they could have seen the Curb Your Enthusiasm meme coming as the entire compound has fallen into complete chaos and destruction. Sugui, Baido, and other soldiers confront Bojack, demanding to know if he's the one responsible for the slaughter. The pair familiar with each other, 
The pirate confesses. He's dreamt of beating down the commander for a long time now. Maybe even more so than the scientists who have been experimenting on him during his entrapment here. But Segui finds his demeanor foolish, as it's well known. He alone is more powerful than Bojack and all his cronies combined. Though that is a trend the villain intends to put an end to, as these countless experiments have proved to have a latent effect on him. What the? Is he changing colors? Show you! Holy sword! I incredible! Bojack's power is on par with Commander Sagui! No, he's become even stronger. <laughs> The face-off coming to its end. Bojack admits he's impressed the commander managed to survive, but now that he's exhausted all of his strength. I, I will never be defeated by you. Never! With the most powerful of his opposition dead, Bojack looks up at the bystanders, asking if they have something to say. Zangia piping up. She's always admired his work, wanting to join forces as his follower. He too knows of her skills, claiming there is no one more deceptive or opportunistic in this world, welcoming her to the crew. Lieutenant Bido, ripping off his sash in renouncement of his current alliance, also vows himself to his new leader, so long as his journey involves violence. One by one, the others also declare their loyalty to Bojack, though Koju seems a bit uncertain. When a man begins pleading with everyone to be reasonable, Bojack is a murderer and criminal, reminding their goal is to take down Cold, Polar, and Snower, who have pillaged their planet, their civilization. <laughs> the apparently not-so-shy kid then severs the top of his head, telling him to shut up, while maintaining that defeated look on his face. Nothing further, Bojack barks for everyone who approves of his leadership to follow. Hiding away, the orphan Bujin, who seems very scared and unsure of himself. Peeking out to find the rebellions flying away, he decides to follow. While Bojack's story would differ greatly through the many universes, for now, we're left to wonder his relationship with Kat and the other benevolent fighters of Universe 6. Shortly after the second round of the Multiverse Tournament, the Fargas careen a ship to escort a handful of contestants back home, some of them more bitter than others. On board, one of the operators questions won't they regret not watching the rest of the event. After all, this isn't just a once-in-a-lifetime type of thing, it's… actually, rather hard to quantify now that I think about it. But the pirate merely scoffs this off uttering, who cares, let's get this over with, I miss my palace. Zangia takes the opportunity to snarkily ask which palace he means, though now that she mentions it, all of them actually. At the same time, Ujin appears to possibly be whispering something to one of the Vargas. And way in the back stand the Magic Girls. Furthering his pompous hollering, Bojack squabbles on how he doesn't want to hear about the other universes ever again. After this little tournament, all voyages will be banned. And glancing back at the aforementioned Magic Warriors, the villain thinks that fortunately for him, there will be something to distract him and his gang once they return back home. Moments later, the ship phases into their dimension without incident. Upon inquiring which group should be dropped off first, Bojack insists to the pilot that honor should go to the young ladies, of course. All of which sport a face that can be best described as confident skepticism. Jess simply and sarcastically replies how sweet a jester that is. Landing below on planet Zitral 4, the magic girls step onto the exit platform. But something has the Vargas confused. Does Bojack's crew intend on leaving with him? The brute comments on how he needs some air. As they make their descent, the same Birdman doesn't remember this landscape at all. Did they really find him here before the tournament? However, she doesn't vocalize this concern. Bojack pompously quips, What is this dumb? Prompting Mai to swing her head around asking if the tough guy has something to say. But of course he doesn't. At any rate, 
The reluctant time has finally come to bid their new feather-headed friends farewell, thanking them for everything. They can go home now. That's when Xenia realizes. Did that girl just try to provoke Bojack? The Varga interjects that she thought they just wanted some quick fresh air. Doesn't he want to be dropped off on his own world? Jed assures that if Bojack and his crew want to visit their planet, they're more than welcome here. Which seals it for Xenia. This is a trap! The birds don't waste any time and quickly move to move back to the tournament grounds. As Xenia urges her boss not to play their game, they… But the pirate tells her to hang on and wait for the Vargas to leave. That's what is most important right now. Inside the ship, the pilot found the mood down there very… strange. Her comrade rolls his eyes and says that isn't their problem. It's time to go. On the ground, Jed informs her allies it's time. They're all alone now. Bojack feels the same. They're finally alone and masters of their own universe. He tells his grunts that they're going to start by shredding these little wenches and take care of their planet. Looks like they missed it during all their years of pillaging. Interestingly enough, Ujin doesn't appear as amped up as his counterparts. Replying to his statement, the blonde heroine utters that Bojack didn't miss their home planet. Her and her friends have simply chosen a quiet place to finish this. As they're here to kill him! Year 778. Around 16 years ago, we get a look at the sacred temple where the magic powers of the Chosen Ones were developed. Someone who appears to be a priestess inquires to another about a new gift of some kind. Though it's not that cut and dry, her comrade replies that they're still studying the case. Asking her to elaborate, she explains that this new gift either means she's going to have the power to turn people into cats, or Lynn has the power to transform herself into a cat. The priestess, finding this interesting, questions what Lynn thinks about all this. But unfortunately, they're also studying ways to transform her back into a person. Just as someone else comes running in from out of nowhere shouting, DEATH! DEATH! Trying to figure out exactly what she's talking about, the woman continues to go on saying thousands of people will die, before she can even fully explain. What she refers to makes itself known. A trio of familiar pirates. Even in their earlier days, Xenia chastises her boss for what a pain he is. This city was the pinnacle of civilization. Art, fashion, goldsmithing, everything was here. She wanted to make herself a palace, and he just goes in and destroys everything without warning. However, the brute has a dissenting view of things. He himself can't stand pretentious people all dressed up like they're a walking carnival or something. His comrade argues that's called refinement, something he obviously doesn't know about. As the two continue to butt heads, Fusion figures here comes a hissy fit. Lowering herself to his emotional maturity, Zangya offers her apologies to Chief Bojack. She was only having a stupid little tantrum. Will he ever forgive her? And with exchanging a few more words of the situation, Bojack ushers him to the next town. He doesn't like the smell of smoke here. In present time, Jess screams, 356,000 dead. That includes all of their families. Bojack chuckles, so they hate him. There are people everywhere who hate him. This is nothing new. Which Bujin takes as the perfect opportunity to contradict his boss. Actually, this time there is something new. Baffled, he questions his underling what he's doing. Who responds in an annoyed tone, I'm betraying you, moron, before telling Xenia she still has a chance to surrender if she'd like to take it. Furious, the pirate's voice scrapes that Bujin disappoints him. He's going to die with him. That's all he will get. Turning to Cat, Jet tells her that's her cue. What's up? That's when it dawns on Zanya she's unable to fly. She can feel the gravity. They made him weak. Cap mocks Bojack asking if he can't keep up, wanting to know how it feels finding himself in the same position as his countless victims. Recording with his usual vulgarity, the villain screams that when he gets his strength back, there will be nowhere in the universe where she will be able to hide. The statement causes Cat to smile. Little Bojack really thought he would be imprisoned? Judge? He really thought his life wasn't over? Cat questions if it's because she's a girl. Does that make her not look like an executioner? 
springing into action, saying it won't let them have their way. Kat is the only real warrior among them. The rest of the girls are normal. Possibly remembering Sid's fight with Emperor Vegeta, where she couldn't even move under the gravity of the ring. Defending his new comrades, Ujin asks if Zhenya really forgot him already. Gaining his footing, he comments that she was the one who always sided with this brute. Now she can watch him die. With some words of her own, she argues that they had no choice but to side with Bojack. That includes him, too. It was support him or die. She reminds Bujin that he himself was nothing before him, a ridiculous introvert. Bujin actually agrees with this statement, but unlike her and Bojack, he evolved. Bojack is still dim, and Zhenya is still a liar. Continuing her monologue, Kat tells him to think again. At the same time, Bojack falls to his knees knowing full well he can't transform. Kat sentences him to death by hundreds of justices, including those of his own people. Zhang unleashes a sadistic smile at Bujin's words. Liar. He forgot murderer. Slicing Bujin's neck. Turns out the others are a little less normal than Zhenya gave him credit for. At least under the current conditions, they are easily able to overwhelm her. They shout out that she is also sentenced to death. As someone else moves in that previously didn't catch much attention before. That girl. It's her. Flashing back again, the magic warriors prepare a dangerous plan. Congregating, Jet makes her case to the Elder that Mai's powers are their only chance. Though the Elder argues that she must realize they must remain near Bojack for more than 30 hours, right? Mai herself makes a proposal. She'll get hired on as a servant in his palace. Over several weeks, she'll have enough time to synchronize with him. As soon as she's ready, she'll block his powers and any assassin can take care of him. But the problem there is Bojack has no servants, only slaves, and he often kills them. Mai doubles down that this is a risk worth taking. As a psychic from before informs it won't be necessary, beings from elsewhere will arrive in four months. They will give them an opportunity to stand alongside Bojack. For now, their goal is they must manage to generate energy that will attract them. With a blade at her neck, Zhenya makes one final plea to Bujin to kill that girl. The one called Mai. She's the one who controls their strength. Stop her and the three of them are saved. Still holding the wound at his throat that she caused, Bujin gargles out that he has always known that. With Bojack finally dealt with, Kat turns her sights onto Zhenya, who pathetically begs for her to wait. She didn't get a chance to make her choice. She sides with them now. But making a wise decision, the Bojack gang finally falls for good. With everything coming to a settle, Sid mentions that since Bujin helped him in the end, that the rest of them think it's only fair for his death sentence to be reconsidered. Though what's worrisome about him is that his powers will come back eventually and he could be dangerous. However, they're never given a chance to decide what his fate will be. The matter has already resolved itself. Finally, the galactic rampage of the Bojack Gang was ended. Peace would finally return to the heroes of Universe 6, and the long process of rebuilding and healing would begin. Meanwhile, the other world of this realm, Goku runs up to Vegeta to excitedly exclaim Bojack's dead. Just as thrilled, Vegeta can't wait to go to hell to kick his butt for some revenge. Unfortunately, he's not going to have a butt to kick. Since he's going through the purification machine, he won't get to keep his body much to the frustration of the battle-hungry warrior. At last, the story of Universe 6 comes to an end. All our Z fighters wouldn't be the main players in it. At least their killers were finally given the fates they so deserved. Namek, December 18th, 762. Our heroes travel from Earth to find the Dragon Balls to revive their deceased friends. This story happened in Universe 7. Landing on the Green Planet, Bulma scolds her fellow astronauts as they immediately rushed out of the spacecraft before they could even perform an atmospheric test to see if the air was breathable. Waving the dragon radar in the air, she resolves they just begin searching for the Dragon Balls now. But something strange happens. 
as it doesn't seem to pick up their signal. Krillin joining her, questions if she zoomed out. Maybe it's simply too zeroed in on their current location. But having passed IT-101, of course she did. Before he suggests, maybe it doesn't work on Namekian Dragon Balls. While the pair continue to banter in the background, Gohan calls out. He feels a great power. Could it be Frieza? Krillin, giving proper attention, senses the same. Before they realize it, it's heading right for him. Without a chance to hide, the source shows itself. Not correctly reading the tone of the situation, Gohan saunters on over to the native, chirping, Hello, Mr. Namek! Staring at the visitors with a less than warm expression, he demands to know who they stole this Namekian ship from, causing Krillin to nervously spout. It was given to him. But Gohan points out, they didn't exactly ask permission. When the Namek utters, You will pay for! Before an attack ball, or one of Frieza's pods, zooms behind the gang, landing a few miles away. Our heroes don't have to take too many guesses who may be inside of it, believing it immediately to be Vegeta. Krillin miss how he could possibly have recovered from his injury so soon. Thinking aloud, the warrior wonders if this is the beginning of a second invasion. While the Earthlings try to clear everything up, how they aren't with that guy who just landed. In fact, he killed a bunch of their friends, one of which being a Namekian, and they've only ventured here to revive them. But having enough talk, the native decides he'll simply read their minds to obtain the information he needs. While the pod smolders in the crater, its door slowly creaks open, as whoever is inside prepares to wreak havoc on this world. Naturally, Vegeta. Disgusted, he's reduced to relying on his scouter once again, sensing only a single power level. A giant one, pondering if Frieza could possibly be here alone. Back with the others, the man finally understands our heroes have good intentions and are not a threat or malevolent in any way, admitting their story is an amazing one. And there were indeed Dragon Balls here, but as of a few days ago, that is no longer the case. And around the same time, he himself was not the only being to inhabit this planet. Going back to less than a week ago, we find a desolated village, the Frieza Force being the culprits, going place to place collecting the Dragon Balls, leaving destruction and death in their wake. This being Frieza's first time seeing one of the Wish Orbs in person, finding the crystal intriguing. Scoping out the next, it's not far away, causing the Emperor to cackle, immortality is close at hand. As elsewhere on Namek, the Grand Elder senses his people fading one by one, and a sinister monster is upon them. Making his decision, he believes the only way to save the survivors is to sacrifice himself, urging Nail to take his power. Naturally, Nail is scared and confused by Guru's words, vowing he could never do such a thing, but is later admitting he hasn't much time left in the realm of the living either way. At least this way, he can still be useful. Also, if the young warrior were to accept, the Elder could actually live much longer within Nail, and perhaps many more lives could be saved. Getting a look at yet another broken village, a beaten local scowls at the Space Lord as he hovers over him, swearing that even if he does manage to collect all the Dragon Balls, he'll never get his wish. When the orb turns to stone, signifying Nail has made his decision. Frieza commanding he explain what he's done. Barking, he thinks he can stop him from getting his wish by doing this. Zarbon's ball also changing, noting he believes it to have affected the entire collection of them. The native falling to his knees as tears drench his face, knowing full well this means the Grand Elder is no more. But the tyrant still thinks this is all just an elaborate trick. Going on to shout he doesn't understand, it's over. There are no more Dragon Balls and Frieza will never have his wish. But all this leaves the dictator with is more motivation to slaughter every Namekian in this village to see if that changes the man's mind about what has happened. At the same time, the new nail beelines towards the chaos, finding one of his fellow Namek's down. It seems he's too late to save all of them. Furious, he gazes towards the people responsible for the senseless violence. But the men quickly find out what they're in for. How dare you slaughter my children! Making his way to Frieza himself, Dodoria gently scoffs. This one is tougher than the others. Calling out to his lord, he's on it. K 
killing him with a single shot. Sarban sees the reality of the situation, knowing this guy must be more powerful than even the Ginyu Force. Appreciating such strength, Frieza has a proposal for Nail, requesting he join his elite army. Not even entertaining the question, the Namek demands they leave the planet immediately, otherwise he'll kill them too. Taking offense, the tyrant wants to teach this guy a lesson, as he mustn't be aware who the fearsome Lord Frieza even is, shouting out if the native even knows his power. Interrupting the dictator with a kick to the face, Nail has reached the point of no return. Powering up to his second form, Frieza bellows he'll regret what he's just done. Proving too much for the combined forces of Guru and Nail, the alien invaders emerge victorious. Frieza still determined to search for the Dragon Balls. If they don't change back, he'll simply destroy the stupid planet. Seeming to be the tearful Namek from before, spots Nail lying on the ground, who has since pulled himself up as his regeneration abilities have vastly improved. Reaching out, he tells the other, I'm sorry, my son. We thought we could repel these invading forces but their strength was more than we believed. When the man realizes the Grand Elder isn't dead after all, merely residing in Nail, that means not all hope is lost. And this is only the beginning, begging Nail to take his power as well, and the others, as the entirety of the Namekian people are willing to become one with Nail in order to defeat this demon. Living as a single being would be much better than getting slaughtered one by one. As a few hours pass, Things almost seem calm on the green world. Arriving in another village, a soldier thinks it's really strange they previously detected many powers here. And now, not a single one. Even the villagers from before have vanished off the scouters. And not having found a single additional Dragon Ball, Frieza has had it with this world, vowing to crush it. Destroy. Crush. You only know destruction. But as long as there's life in me, Namek will not be destroyed. Your life, on the other hand, ends here. Growing annoyed with Nail's pestering appearances, one of the henchmen timidly point out he seems… bigger this time around. The Namek reminding how useless it is to search for the Dragon Balls. Now I'm mad! Let me reveal my true power! Transform again, as many times as you'd like. It won't change anything. Charging his death ball and screaming for Nail to die, along with this entire stupid planet. The warrior calmly utters, He who lives by the sword, will perish by the sword. As Frieza realizes he can't move, Nail has paralyzed him in place. Go to hell! And the death of Frieza brings us back full circle to Gohan and the others. Elated to discover Vegeta won't even stand a chance against this guy, Bulma suggesting he can just create a new set of Dragon Balls. But unfortunately, he does not possess that power, as he is a warrior, not a member of the Dragon Clan and he's lost some abilities with the fusions. Kui and Vegeta peering in from a distance, the former trembling, this guy must be the one who eliminated Frieza and everyone else. That's why there's been no response. The prince grumbling, he better not believe this little setback will be enough to save his life, still holding on to the grudge. But putting the focus back on our heroes, he wonders, how did the Earthlings manage to make it all the way out here? When Kui, trying to save his own skin, stammers he never really liked Frieza anyway asking if he thinks those dragon things are still here. Continuing, the Namek tells he cannot make Dragon Balls and he cannot have children, believing himself truly to be the last of the Namekians. Apologizing, these voyagers made their trip for nothing. Without a choice, the gang decides to just turn around and head back to Earth. Piping up, Gohan questions, Mr. Nail, you look like Mr. Piccolo. I'll help you if I can. Thanking the child for his generosity, the Namek has decided he won't go by that name anymore, given that he's changed so much. And from here on out, he will be referred to as Gas Karkul. And leaving us with a smile, Gast sneaks up on Vegeta and Kui, knowing they were watching all along. 
explaining, he plans to commandeer the spaceship of their leader to explore the universe in search of a solution to revive the Namekian people. And this pair should know how to operate such a vessel. If not, he could just kill them now. And though, the ultimate fate of the prince and his Frieza Force rival isn't revealed today, Gast wouldn't find a solution to his problem. Until, the Vargas inevitably track down the Namek to invite him to the Interuniversal Tournament. At the edge of the galaxy lies the planet Icarion, famous for hosting a city as large as a small country, whose sole function is to collect and preserve knowledge and cultures of all known worlds. Its people, the Alcmenians, are neutral by nature and ensure the safety of their city through treaty agreements with the planet's neighboring civilizations. Though, such alliances are quite useless when it's the Frost Demons who seek your allegiance, as inside this gigantic structure, someone shouts, You're slow on the uptake, great sage! In such detailed talent and artwork that is so, so not right for Dragon Ball, a man barters with Cooler, beckoning, their knowledge is for all who seek it and are willing to learn. But the Frost Demon declares, the information of this world is now his and his alone, as is the planet itself. The native pleading, their people have enjoyed peace for eons now, so why do this today? Cooler snipping, the man misunderstands. The only reason their world has been left alone for so long is simply because it's distant location in the universe, nothing more. Demanding the natives of the planet surrender power immediately. Further barking, he takes solace in the fact that he sees their information as a potential weapon. Otherwise, this kingdom would already be reduced to ashes. When Salsa shouts out for his leader, spotting Frieza's ship in the sky. But as we know, and as Cooler knows, Frieza met his end on Namek somehow. So his brother deduces, whoever is piloting that ship is either a scavenger or the executioner. Spouting, this is the ship of his brother, Prince Frieza, and this man is going to tell him exactly how it came into his possession, bluntly inquiring if he was the one who killed him. But calmly emerging, Gast merely questions if Cooler really wants to challenge him. Or will he instead be wiser than his sibling? Not taking kindly to resistance, Salza powers his blade, shouting how dare he speak to Lord Cooler in that way, begging his master to let him take him out. But surprisingly, his leader advises against it. Even Gast growls the armored squadron member should listen to his boss. But bellowing for silence! Using the opportunity to mercilessly take down Cooler. The Galactic Prince still clings to life, though his men are shredded to pieces. And unfortunately, Gast has not come here to talk to him, ending the Space Lord for good. In the palace, one of the natives is elated to see their problem has been solved, but his elder presses not to get carried away, as nothing assures this man is not merely another tyrant. Though, presenting himself before him, the Namek explains the situation. Given he cannot reproduce, and the Dragon Balls are no more, he has searched the universe to find a way to save his people. Since this is a planet of knowledge, he hopes they will have a solution for his predicament. But it's revealed, the Namekians decided against sharing their information. Nevertheless, as thanks for his intervention, they will reach out to other worlds to seek a solution. But the issue remains, the murder of Prince Cooler will undoubtedly attract the wrath of King Cold, and this entire galaxy will suffer from his mourning. And there is little question, he will come to this planet and destroy it, Gast being the only one who could hope to stand up against him. It's brought up, he must annihilate him. But the Namek scoffs he is no one's to command. Though he's reminded, if this planet is destroyed, the chance of him restoring his people is greatly reduced, introducing a child called Thorn, who will act as his guide. But Gast doesn't believe the aid of a kid will do much to help him. The natives press not to underestimate the younger generation of this world, as the people here are renowned for their knowledge, questioning if he agrees to save them once more. Reluctantly, Gast brings the youngster to the ship, who couldn't be happier to get a look at a royal imperial vessel. Running around, he abruptly stops, finding Vegeta and Kui. He asks who they are. Since Gast himself didn't know how to fly this thing, he uh, hired these two pilots, releasing them from suspended animation. He demands they lead him to their emperor. Beginning the journey, Thorne mentions the controls of the ship aren't too complex, so next time, he shouldn't have any issues in taking the helm. Either way, it's projected they'll arrive on Cold Planet 1 tomorrow, and with any luck, they'll hold the element of surprise and their foe won't even see it coming, or have time to prepare. But Vegeta pipes up, piffing they not be ignorant, 
Cold's empire is vast, and his spies are everywhere. There is no doubt he's already aware of Cooler and Frieza's demise, and is fully anticipating their arrival. And the Emperor will be more than prepared to avenge his sons. The day would pass, and the crew arrives at Cold's personal planet. Descending upon a very alien-looking palace, Gas turns to his captives, alerting they're free since they're no longer needed. Flying away, Vegeta has never been so insulted, but at least he's alive. Gazing up at enormous statues, the Namek gets his first look at his opponent, even stating this aloud. But stepping in, a voice utters, Not quite! Presenting himself in his final form, Cold questions how his visitor likes his kingdom. But having no desire to make friendly with this tyrant, Gas quips and illustrates the megalomania that thrives so well in his bloodline. Thorn trembling, already knowing what Cold's original form means for his strength. Explaining, this state's power threshold is so high, even the Frost Demons themselves struggle to control it. And if rumors are true, and Frieza's final form is about the same as Cold's second, one can only imagine what strength he bears. <laughs> well, did that wake you up? Mm. You're completely irresponsible. You could have destroyed the whole planet. That show you up, huh? Just who do you think you are? Meanwhile, in the palace, Queen Vegeta searched for a way off the planet, getting lost in its maze-like architecture. Staring at the battle, the prince merely mutters the word. Terrifying! Coming over to question what he's talking about, the pair get a look at Cold's death ball, amazed he could pack so much energy in such a small attack. Knowing the impending massacre, they resolve to get out of here quick. But upon finding only a single space pod, Kui seems to have had a change of heart regarding his rival, having survived so much of them during their imprisonment by Ghast. Deciding it won't be comfortable, but there is enough room for the both of them. But Vegeta hasn't changed. Proving to be just as sinister as ever, the prince laughs aloud he'd even consider the idea of sharing it. Leaving Kui to die on this world, one way or another. Five seconds until shuttle launch. Good! That's enough! Thorn, find some cover. Even with the ground beneath the pair rumbling, the kid tries to find a safe place, if at all possible. When Vegeta's pod is seen dashing through the air, but it seems the vessel can't move fast enough, as the sheer force of energy and debris send it flying off course, causing the prince to believe that idiot Cold will turn this planet to ashes before he even has time to escape. Miserable! Calling Cold as foolish and arrogant as his sons, his reign has come to an end. But not believing the battle to be finished yet, Cold screams and Namek doesn't know what he's talking about. With a final blast, Cold is no more, Thorn and Vegeta looking on in disbelief. Letting out a long exhale, Gas falls back to the ground, the child running at him, unable to contain his excitement. Going on and on like kids do, the Namek humorously tells him to shut up. With Vegeta's retreat, our two heroes sit amongst the rubble. Upon healing the child's minor injuries, Gast admits it'd be a good idea to train Thorn, not wanting to have to worry about him in the events he faces any dangerous encounters. Walking off, the kid questions what about the other two? Even if they are a lot weaker, won't they still be a danger to others? But the fused warrior doesn't think so. First off, one of them is dead. Second, the survivor of the two will likely venture out to do his own thing now, especially because he's no longer under the Frost Demon's boot, surely settling some personal scores along the way, but will in no way be a threat to Thorn or his people, assuring he not worry. With the Imperial ship they arrived on being destroyed, it wouldn't take long for the Achmenians to send a vessel of their own to bring the pair back to Icarion. Alas, they have still not found a solution to the Namek's problem. However, they offer him sanctuary in their city as thanks for his services, who graciously accepts. And with time, they may find the answers Gast is looking for and will surely continue to search for him. Thus, Gast found a semblance of peace. While not ultimately what he seeks, it will serve as a means of fulfillment until he finds a way to revive his people.
four months later, on a remote planet. The Ginyu Force, Frieza's personal guard, has fallen at the hands of Vegeta, who has discovered the power of the Super Saiyan. But comparing it to Ghast, the prince falls to his knees, knowing it's not enough, leaving yet another hole within him. In Universe 8, or the Realm of the Frost Demons, after a hard-fought battle, by impossible odds, the remaining heroes of Earth have Vegeta, the Prince of All Saiyans, on the ropes. As he attempts to crawl back to his space pod in a bid to retreat, Krillin approaches him, wielding Yajirobe's sword. Growling, the invader killed his friends. He vows to avenge him. Unable to move, Vegeta can only look on helplessly. DIE! NO! WAIT! ME! VEGETA! KILLED! Brutally decapitating his foe, he heard his friends plea too late, asking if Goku said something. But with nothing that can be done, our hero brushes it off, muttering it wasn't very reasonable anyway, leaving the executioner confused. Minutes later, Bulma and the others would arrive to deliver Aiden the only way they could, retrieving the bodies, as well as Gohan, Goku, and Krillin, coming up with a game plan to resurrect the others while heading to the hospital deciding to venture to planet Namek in search of their Dragon Balls in order to bring those back lost to the Saiyans. While Goku had to stay behind to mend his much more serious injuries, Bulma would accompany Earth's most two competent warriors. Though, a wayward scouter happened to pick up on their plans, and the Galactic Emperor Lord Frieza would take interest in these wish orbs as well, intercepting the gang on the alien world. Upon landing, they quickly discovered they weren't welcome as a pair of soldiers would render their ship immobile within minutes of arriving. The ruthless Frost Demon slaughtered all in his way in his search for immortality. Dodoria and Zarbon, his right-hand men, were even more powerful than Vegeta. And as for Frieza himself, he was indescribably worse. But finally healed, thanks to some timely grown sensu beans, Goku dashed into space, but wouldn't arrive for another six days. Meanwhile, Gohan and Krillin had already blown their cover in order to save the life of a Namekian child, barely escaping the mighty Dodoria alive, who believed he had put an end to the pair. Dende, their new native friend, gave his trust to these visitors. But trouble soon came sprinting back, as Frieza demanded his underling present him with the bodies of the Earthlings. As Krillin and Bulma discuss, there are only two places left that possess their Dragon Ball. The former knows he has to warn them of the evil to come. Dende then mentions he must go see the Grand Elder. It may be very far away from here, but he has no choice, causing Gohan to accompany the child. In the last village, the Elder consents Krillin's pure intentions, but spying on him, one of Frieza's men, who plans to alert his lord immediately. But quickly feeling his presence, our hero spots him in the sky. Confused how he was seen, he takes off, knowing there are too many for him to handle in a fight. But he doesn't flee fast enough. Capturing and restraining their guest, Krillin notes how lucky they are, as this guy is just one of the weak ones. But a pool doesn't let this deter his confidence, vowing Frieza will destroy them all. Ignoring him, Krillin notes the remaining three are much stronger than he and Gohan, and if this low-level warrior found the village, the others probably won't be far behind. Making his way back to the spot where he believed the Earthlings to have perished, Dodoria resorts to even searching underwater to find him. Bearing no trace, he figures they surely escaped after all. But without at least one of the pair, he knows Frieza will have his head, deciding to scour the globe endlessly at maximum speed. On their way to Guru, Gohan questions if they're getting close, but it will actually be quite a while until they arrive, so he suggests they take a short break. Ironically enough, mentioning it's not like anyone is looking for them. As the hours passed, Dodoria continued his searching, and after the rest, the boys quickly approached the Grand Elder, but would soon be found as Frieza's underling spots him. Though struggling to catch his breath, he promises this is where they die. Nail! I sense something outside. Go, go and see. Shouting for Dende to run while he slows him down. Nail arrives to shield both the children. Frustrated, Dodoria demands to know who this is now, before stating it doesn't matter, 
as he's just going to die like the rest of them. Dende calling out to his hero, explaining this is one of the evil invaders that killed everyone in his village, while Gohan can't help but notice the parallels between this man and Piccolo. One-shotting him! Nail puts a quick end to the skirmish. With a giant grin, the little Saiyan gets excited to see how strong this guy is, his friend explaining how Nail here is the personal guard of the Grand Elder and the strongest warrior on the planet. Though at first, appearing a bit cautious of the Earthling, he ushers them both to follow him as the Grand Elder awaits them. Back with Bulma, Krillin brings in their first Namekian Dragon Ball, while the very anime-eyed scientist tries to think of a plan. With the capture of the soldier in the village, that means there should only be three bad guys left. Cutting her off, a mentally defeated Krillin argues, with the terrifying power their enemies possess, the only safe option is to wait for Goku to arrive, which is still five days away from now. With the Space Lord, he announces to Zarbon his plan to call in the Ginyu Force, and much like Goku, they too will arrive in five days, and they'll bring new scouters with them. Since Dodoria and Apul decided to go missing, he's going to need his other right-hand man to seek out the remaining villages, while Frieza himself stays alongside the Dragon Balls. With no argument, Zarbon agrees. With Gohan, the Grand Elder thanks him for saving Dende, as well as deducing he's an Earthling. Before going on about how terrible all of this is, the Dragon Balls were supposed to inspire prosperity and wisdom, not bring about the destruction of his children. Making a suggestion, if they will aid he and his friends in gathering the Dragon Balls, they will resurrect Piccolo, which will bring back their own dragon, and everyone can be saved. The name Piccolo coming to the curiosity of the great leader, placing his hand upon the boy's head. He reads his mind to see the history of the Earthlings, also taking this time to notice how immense Gohan's potential is, stating he will unlock it. Hold on for a second, what? Feeling power within himself like never before, Gohan questions if he could do this to Krillin too, taking off to retrieve his ally. But before leaving, Guru would tell his life, and by extension the Namekian Dragon Balls, will soon come to an end. So they will need to hurry in this endeavor. Less than an hour later, Krillin senses Gohan approaching, but in disbelief at his new strength. Explaining everything from Nail to Guru, he insists he has to come get his potential unlocked too. But with his focus on that Nail fellow instead, Krillin thinks if they have a new powerful ally, then maybe. Stopping short, the pair sense an incredible strength nearby, as Zarbon has found the last village. Though the leader tries to usher him away, assuring there is no Dragon Ball here, the villain doesn't believe him for a second. Already seeing where this is going, Krillin goes to stop Gohan from doing anything rash, but the revitalized young warrior has a new sense of confidence. He thinks they have a chance to save the villagers. But arriving, they're already too late, as every one of them lie dead. Untying a pool, the soldier immediately fills Zarbon in on the doings of Gohan and Krillin, attacking Dodoria, and most importantly, stating they took the ball. Chuckling to himself, Zarbon wonders if that idiot Dodoria is also tied up somewhere in a village like this. Knowing this isn't good, Apul goes to sneak off to warn Frieza. But Krillin doesn't let that happen, spouting to the invader, he isn't as nice as the Namekians. And with a sinister gleam, Zarbon growls, this little brat here holds his own well. Seeing Gohan fall, Krillin knew this was more than they could handle, figuring here goes nothing. <laughs> Using a scatter bullet, it fools the enemy, leading to a direct hit. But of course, this barely manages to ruffle his hair, though Zarbon admits he is getting irritated. <laughs> Furious, Gohan demands to know how someone could do this to all these innocent people. Catching his breath, Krillin shouts for Gohan to come on, they need to leave now, but the child is set on finishing him. The other Earthling continues to argue that surely these guys are as indestructible as Vegeta, when Gohan reveals they're not. In fact, the pink one was killed with a single attack. Rising from his crater, Zarbon asks, Dodoria? Inquiring who managed to kill him. Effortlessly apprehending our heroes, their evil adversary assures he won't kill them right away, as he has a few questions first, wanting to know where both the Dragon Balls and Adoria are. <laughs> Saying aloud, he'll roughen them up a bit first, before bringing them 
to Lord Frieza. Continuing the events of Universe 8, with a hand at his throat, Krillin gasps for Zarbon to wait. He will reveal the location of their Dragon Ball. Despite Gohan's protest, he points behind himself, slowly muttering, he gave it to. Barking, he finishes sentence. The snaky fighter puts his fingers to his head, <laughs> hitting his foe point blank with a solar flare, momentarily stunning their captor. Krillin does what we've always wanted him to do, combining the previous technique with his destructo disc. but somehow pulls it to the right, only maiming his adversary. Still with enough strength to transform, Zarbon is obviously done trying to get information out of the Earthlings. And not missing, Frieza's underling believes the two of them are surely dead. Knowing he must return to the ship for medical attention, Gohan arises from the rubble, Though battered, he set on keeping his word and finishing Zarbon here. Looking over to his friend, Zarbon seems to fall to the ground lifeless, pleading for his ally to say something. He can only mutter he's sorry as he succumbs to his injuries. The next day, Bulma speeds to Guru's house with a still very injured Gohan in the back seat. Appearing to have arrived, Nail demands to know how she found him. She quickly explains she simply followed the signal of their Dragon Ball, but urging that's not important at the moment. Pleading Gohan needs care immediately. Walking over to his friend, Dende fixes him up in mere seconds. Who shouts for Krillin upon jolting awake? Though surprised to see how quickly the boy was healed, Bulma can only apologize to him, implying Krillin really is dead. Updating the Namekians on their encounter with Zarbon, Gohan firmly presses they need to gather the remainder of the Dragon Balls and revive their friends. But the remaining balls are with Frieza personally, asking if she'd rather wait for his father to arrive. She actually has quite a different idea. By the time Goku gets here, surely Frieza will have called in for backup. Their mission isn't to kill him, it's simply to obtain the Dragon Balls. Currently, they still have the advantage in numbers, and he won't be able to keep an eye on all of them and watch the balls simultaneously. Nail understanding where she's coming from and agreeing, believing the time to act is now. At the tyrant ship, Gohan notes he's in that vessel, and his power, it's just unreal. Questioning if Nail is really sure he can handle this, but he insists not to worry about him. Urging the child, he only focus on being completely discreet on his duty here. Blasting a couple holes in the ship, Nail shouts from the sky the demon below killed his family, and now it's the monster's time to die, promising he will regret bringing this slaughter onto his people. A bit nettled, this man up and decided to destroy his ship. Frieza barks back, it is the Namek who will die. During this commotion, Gohan takes the opportunity to sneak past the Emperor, who then warns Nail not to expect his death to be a quick one. As our hero creates a smokescreen in hopes of buying himself a little more time, Gohan finds the Dragon Balls at last. But the Namek's tactic was quickly saw past, Frieza demanding to know what he takes him for, taking shelter behind a giant boulder. The Space Lord is done playing around, swearing he will not escape, remembering being told the Dragon Balls are quite durable. He punts them away, Bulma taking notice they've started moving on her radar. With only one left, Gohan decides to just take this last one by hand, as Bulma and Dende rush to recover the others. And while they're a bit scattered, they know they are now the only ones on the planet possessing the ability to track them. With Nail on his last leg, Frieza offers him a deal. He will allow him to live a little bit longer if he hands over the rest of the Dragon Balls. And foolishly, the warrior scoffs. He doesn't understand a thing before catching himself and not revealing the plan. Fiercely scowling, the demon will never have his wish, as the Dragon Balls grant their power only to those truly deserving, to those who want to save their friends, not to a monster like him. Nail's body appearing to fall into a nearby lake, Frieza mutters to himself, he'll have to call in for a replacement ship as well. And given the time that has passed, surely Zarbon is dead now too. Tracking down the others, 
Gohan proudly wields the six-star ball above his head, handing it over. He explains now he has to go back to help Nail. But grabbing him, Bulma barks if he doesn't follow the plan. She'll pulverize him herself, putting him back in line. But Dende assures him not to worry, as Nail is really strong, and he'll escape for sure. Bulma reinforcing that once they make their wish, everything will work out. And with only three left to gather, it shouldn't be too much longer. Testing out a ship, it can at least still fly. But the tyrant can't get over the foolishness of that Namekian, wondering what he was thinking in such a hopeless and suicidal attack. Frustrated, these natives can't see a lost cause when it's right in front of them. Collecting yet another Dragon Ball. Frieza at last notices what has happened. And recovering the final one, it seems our heroes are in position to bring everyone back, rejoining the Grand Elder with Frieza's five Dragon Balls. The Emperor himself searches the planet at full speed for him. But Namek is an immensely large world, Guru calling upon Dende to summon Puranga. Noticing it suddenly becoming night for the first time, Frieza knows what this must mean, and the others have collected the orbs. Charging his death ball, he bellows they will all die if they think they can get away with this. Dende explaining, their dragon can only revive one person at a time. Bulma wonders what they can do. When Piccolo communicates telepathically through King Kai, noting if they bring him back, that will also revive Kami and Shenron. And with the Dragon Balls of the Earth, they can bring back everyone else with a single wish. Asking if Dende got all that, he goes to command it to Puranga. Gohan and Bulma elated to see their mission finally come full circle. Cackling, that'll teach you. Namek has become a barren wasteland. Still careening through space, Goku trains diligently. As he gets a terrible, ominous feeling, Piccolo shots for King Kai to tell them what happened. Who reveals? Planet Namek has been devastated. Still chuckling at his work, Frieza acknowledges he may have gotten a bit reckless, but surely no one will be able to survive on this world now. Also noting, his ship was made to resist this kind of attack. Somehow? Vowing to leave this planet, never wanting to hear of it again. As with our heroes, they have all been taken out by the blast. The Dragon Balls turn to stone with the passing of Guru. Four days later, Goku would arrive, digging makeshift graves for the four of them. And without any Dragon Balls left in the universe, there isn't any hope in bringing anyone back. He then feels a faint power, resembling Piccolo. And if there's a surviving Namekian, maybe hope isn't completely lost. Heading to its location, he begins to dig. Fishing around, Goku can feel someone. King Kai astonished, Nail survived, showing insane resilience after being buried for several days. Piccolo taking some pride in his heritage. Pulling him from the ground before, gently lying him down. Lucky for Nail, Goku held on to a few sensu beans. Fully healed, Nail knows the Grand Elder would want him to forget all of this and move forward with his life. But on the inside, the Namek knows he can't do such a thing. He demands vengeance from the one who destroyed his people. Goku feels the same, wanting to make the one responsible pay for his crimes. After all, what's stopping him from doing something like this again? Maybe even to the Earth next time. King Kai budding in, presses Goku doesn't understand. Frieza isn't only a hundredfold stronger than a Saiyan. He's pretty much invincible, and he hasn't even shown a fraction of his true power. If Goku were to face him, he will die, pure and simple. But he argues back, everyone he knows is already dead. He'd only be joining them. Same for Nail, causing some random lady on Earth to let out a sneeze. Yamcha chiming in, deciding if Nail can't make new Dragon Balls, then they have very little to lose in chasing down Frieza. After all, even his son is in Otherworld now offering his support to Goku. Taking off, he then announces, if he's going to be staying in Otherworld, he's at least going to go and find Bulma, before Piccolo puts in his two cents on the situation. Elaborating, no one can deny Goku his vengeance. Recommending to King Kai, he flat out tell him where Frieza's planet is located. Though reluctant, Kaiosama complies. And a few days later, a soldier below spots an unknown ship, warning they identify themselves or they'll be fired upon. But instead of shooting them out of the sky, they let the silent vessel land and send dozens of men to greet them, armed to the teeth. Emerging, Nail recognizes the soldier's armor as Frieza's, 
Goku adding the Saiyans were that kind too. Shouting to the warriors, Goku explains they only want Frieza. If they let him through, no harm will come to anyone else. But we know that's not how the Frieza Force does things by now. Back up! Back up! Yeesh, what strength! I ended up quick in case more come. You thought you were done with me? Questioning which one of these guys are Frieza, Raccoon laughs in his face at the thought. If one of them were Frieza, he wouldn't have been able to land a single hit. Birder suggests Goku must have come here looking for a job or something, obviously not even considering someone would dare challenge his lord. Reiterating his previous statement, Goku remarks they really don't want to hurt either of them, just Frieza himself. Causing Birder to spout, there are only two ways they will ever lay eyes on their master, either tied up the hands and feet or dead. When Nail chimes in, confidently uttering, that's too bad for them. The Ginyu amazed to see a Namekian, under the belief they were all dead. In a much more peaceful area of the compound, Jace seems to be having a wonderful dream, causing him to talk in his sleep. In his fantasy, Captain Ginyu has decided to make him the new captain and rebrand themselves as the Jace Commando. His lady friend grabbing her, I guess, alien version of a cell phone, giggling she needs to tell the girls about this. As he continues, announcing he'll then name Ginyu Minister of the Jace Commando Choreographies before scoffing, Uteru, bah, I'll ditch you tomorrow. Which is who this woman infers to be given her reaction. Just as a scouter begins to ring out, jolting him awake and several feet out of his bed, as someone informs him of an emergency nearby, replying he's on his way. As he and Goldo sprint down a corridor, the latter explaining how Raccoon and Birder got their butts handed to him, all while mowing down on a croissant. Jay's finding this news very alarming. The self-proclaimed fastest in the universe zips around Nail, taunting him in the process. But while he is indeed quick, Nail states his movements are repetitive. Away, the captain poses for a photo with a child. As it seems this world plays host to tourism, the kid thanks Ginyu for the picture, claiming to be his biggest fan, and his friends are going to be extremely jealous. In this universe, it seems Frieza has fooled a few civilizations into believing he's not pure evil, just as Frost did in Super. He then gets an incoming message on his scouter, telling the boy, justice and duty calls who completely eats it up. The caller alerting him of the situation on the other side of the planet. Ginyu knows, even at top speed, it'll take him at least five minutes to get there. Doing away with the first wave of Ginyus. Naturally, Goku struggles much less than his ally. Arriving, Jace is even more shocked to see the report is true. Raccoon and Birder are down. Going on again, he points out they're not dead, and he doesn't want to fight. Though he can't even finish that sentence. Goldo, while tricky in his own right, but much less of a fighter, believes Jace is downright mental if he thinks he's going to engage head-to-head -head with warriors that could take out the other two Ginyus. Obliviously taunting him, Goku bends down to his level, simply asking where Frieza is, but shouting for him to stop. He's gone. Our hero taking note he can instantly teleport, thinking how cool it'd be if he could do that one day too. But as we know, this is just Goldo's time freeze, and since Goku can sense Ki, he doesn't stay hidden for long, politely inquiring if he could answer his question. <laughs> Having no other choice, the Ginyu uses his paralysis technique. <laughs> Trapping him with the attack, Goku is now at his foe's mercy, knowing this is bad. Luckily, the Saiyan himself has seen something like this before, asking what 432 times 17 is. Instantly answering 7,344, turns out Goldo is much better at math than Chaozu. Wondering, well, what now? Goldo shouting out to his partner to attack him while he can. And it looks like he's the last man standing. With nothing else, he decides to simply impale the Saiyan. Trying to think fast, maybe a maximum Kaioken would free him. Just as Goldo fires. Thanking his savior, Nail keeps himself focused, starting to doubt whether or not Frieza is even here, believing they would have surely felt his presence by now. When Ginyu enters the room, confirming, no, Lord Frieza is not on this planet. Finding it astonishing they came here only to defy him, surely they are insane. Before giving in to his natural Ginyu theatrics, my 
My friends! Proud warriors! All dead! Raccoon correcting, they're all fine actually. His commander a bit deflated and at least the moment being killed. Powering up. Ginyu vows, this little escapade ends now, as their strength is completely insignificant against not only their ruler, but even he himself. Nail admits, he's immensely outclassed on this one, but Goku still has one more trick up his sleeve. While in space, a soldier begs for Frieza's attention, as an urgent message has come from the capital, reporting, a Namekian and Saiyan are causing a lot of trouble. But he finds this information ridiculous, both those species are extinct. But his minion assures it's true. Regretfully, he orders the ship turned back to base, and whoever's at the end of this stupid joke is going to pay. Rejoining Ginyu and Goku mid-battle, the captain admits this Saiyan here is remarkably strong, declaring his admiration for him. And he would like to have his. Stopping, he realizes Goku isn't listening. But unfortunately, it's not due to his usual carefree nature. It's because he can sense an insane power approaching. As Frieza's ship, enters the atmosphere. Growing frustrated and being ignored, he takes this as the perfect opportunity, using his body swap technique. Look out! Without knowing what he was in for, Nail takes the attack head on for his ally, becoming Ginyu, asking if his friend is okay in the confusion. While it doesn't take Nail more than a few seconds to realize what just happened, knowing Goku was the true target, turning to use the attack again. Nail shots for Goku to just get Frieza, and he'll handle Ginyu. A bit put off by the IRL Ginyu saying this, and not Nail, and still not aware of what just happened, he still knows he's right. Facing off against the tyrant in the sky, Goku states, without a doubt, this must be Frieza. His power surpasses the others by far. Thinking, Frieza can't place who this is, theorizing it could be the brother of Raditz, forgetting which planet he had him sent to. In fact, this Saiyan completely slipped his mind all these years, until now. And if he managed to make it this far, he must outclass Vegeta greatly, worried he could actually be the fabled Super Saiyan, knowing it was right to eradicate those monkeys. Goku, being how he is, recommends they take this away from the city as to not endanger any innocent lives. But Frieza finds this remark nothing short of insulting, as he plans to execute this pathetic fool with a single shot. Knocking the Space Lord to the ground below, Goku feels guilty for not forcing him away from the metropolis. Standing and popping off his armor, the demon vows, by the time this is done, Goku is going to know hell. While crazy powerful, Frieza simply isn't a great fighter. So Goku takes the opportunity for a chance to fire him away from all the people. Impossible! Watching while he transforms again, our hero wonders how many states he has. Not able to overcome his weaker form, Nail gets the upper hand on Ginyu, the dynamic spouting. If he doesn't like it, then he should return him to his original body. And untimely enough, Goldo takes this as his moment to save his leader. As Ginyu moves in screaming, you don't need to tell me twice. His underling uses his paralysis attack again. Who mistakes the two? Laughing aloud, vengeance is his, but the real Ginyu tries to call Goldo an idiot as he's got the wrong guy, while Nail casually walks his way. Nail doesn't spare on the gore taking him down. As he mutters, he was far too dangerous to keep alive. Ginyu bellowing what a moron his subordinate is, or was. Now in his assault form, Frieza admits he's been pushed to his limits. Using his glue box seeker, it makes a direct hit on Goku but the Saiyan manages to brush it off, deciding he has to take this to Kaioken times 10. Though the tyrant is amazed, he managed to survive that single shot, let alone be perfectly fine. Taking note on how both Goku and Frieza's powers continue to increase, Nail knows he doesn't have the strength to see this vengeance mission to the end, but in Ginyu's body, it is an opportunity, but first he'll need to do away with the real Ginyu. <laughs> Having lost his family and his planet, today 
Nail chooses to also lose his identity. Finishing off Ginyu and killing his own body. Nail thinks, if Goku falls, then at least he himself will have the ability to exchange bodies. That way, he can stay hidden in Frieza's ranks and hit him when he least suspects it. Though the biggest challenge may be teaching his mind what this body already knows. Getting Frieza down in the dirt, Goku states the demon has lost, telling him to promise he'll never hurt anyone again for the rest of his life. But once more, the demon is only insulted by the Saiyan's words. With that final blast, it's over. Goku managed to put up a valiant battle, but in Frieza's true form, he was but an insect. The Galactic Emperor's rule will continue, and the Z Fighter's place in the universe has come to an end. Feeling Goku's aura fade away, Raccoon makes his way over. Stammering, Neil explains to his subordinate that it's all good, as he eliminated the Namek. But the Ginyu Force brute scoffs, his bluff isn't taking. Change! Ah, finally! Coming full circle to Frieza's flashback, which may or may not be at the 1 hour 52 minute 11 second mark in the tournament marathon video, whenever that's up, Ginyu sees Frieza changed his form. But arriving, he screams to know what they have done. The capital of his perfect empire is destroyed, a magnificent gem of beauty. There's nothing left. But even though the Ginyus know who is really to blame, they dare not speak it. In fact, the captain takes full responsibility, as he was unable to contain the Saiyan. He presses, it's his fault. Executing him, his master can only angrily sneer. Oh really? Announcing their days of dancing are finished, and it's time for them to find a new name for their squad. Frieza demands they burn the commander's corpse, taking him out of sight. Ginyu body snatches the henchman, walking out without anybody the wiser. Resolved to not let himself be surprised again, the tyrant vows to obtain control of this form permanently. A few days pass, Ginyu finds himself out enjoying the nightlife, but still taken aback how Frieza renounced him. He had done everything for him, he had so much respect for him. Two more weeks go by, and the former captain still sulks on what happened, realizing how unfair his master has been. He gave him everything, and this is his reward? When another soldier happens by, mocking, hey pipsqueak, laying low are we? Once again changing forms, apparently to the leader of this regiment, he kneels before Frieza, declaring the planet is theirs. However, there were many Frieza Force casualties, who only disinterestedly responds, good, I'm busy, leave. Growing ever more infuriated, Ginyu realizes these men are literally dying for their ruler, and he doesn't even care. Over the next several years, Ginyu would take control over many bodies, but finding himself downgrading to a non-warrior life, he's greatly bored. But there's no way he'll ever work for Frieza again. Spouting, he betrayed him. He dishonored him. He deserves to have his body taken. And staring at an image of the Cold Family, he gets a much better idea. How about he put Frieza under his orders? Rushing to alert King Cold, a minion shouts two elite guards were found dead. But not even taking his eyes off his work, the ruler piffs this off. Shrugging, they merely use the energy detectors, as this intruder must have a high power and won't be able to hide. But snapping the guard's neck, he smirks, not necessarily. Having seen this technique only a few times before, Cold actually gets a kick out of a bean who can fluctuate their power, calmly asking what he wants. Several other soldiers head in as a familiar glare shines from the room. They stop short of entering while calling out to their highness. But scoffing, they're too slow and he's already handled the situation, demanding they clean up this mess and leave. But inside, he can't believe the change worked, not fully confident it would be effective on a frost demon. But focusing, Ginyu knows he must discover everything about Cold in order to pull this off. Naturally, he's aware of all his public videos, but all of his tells are another story. Not to mention this crazy power, as his key is overwhelming, as if he's going to explode. But mastering his true form with his advanced mental prowess and combat discipline, his reduced states became useless, but not using them would cause attention to his quote, sons. As life went on, communication among the three frost demons was few and far between, 
with neither Cooler or Frieza having a clue. As a true fighter, Ginyu continued to train his body in secret, passing limits no other demon before him had approached. Even his anger towards Frieza faded away. But how will this play into the multiverse tournament and their last opportunity to obtain the Dragon Balls? Year 737, the day of Planet Vegeta's destruction. The Earthlings Universe, number nine. Spotting a lone space pod escaping the cataclysm. Cooler's men don't hesitate in deciding to intercept the vessel as no good could possibly come from leaving it be. Obliterating it on the spot. Zarbon worriedly approaches Frieza, alerting his brother's ship has been spotted nearby. Furious at this, he demands to know what that treacherous snake is doing in his territory. Immediately confronting the trespasser, he wants to know what he believes he's doing, interfering in his affairs. But he doubles down on his actions, calling his brother a fool and letting a Saiyan escape. He is merely here to assist in finishing the job competently. Though the Emperor didn't ask Cooler to do anything, claiming to have spared that Saiyan purposely to serve him later. Even with this, his sibling shows no remorse, simply telling him too bad. Getting right in his face, Frieza barks he not enter his sector again. Disrespecting him further, he growls if he's done here, he can allow himself to. Backhanding Frieza, he dictates he not come near him or be spoken to in such a way. Understandingly taken aback by this, the younger brother shrieks he can't believe he had the goal not to only trespass in his territory, but to also attack him while in his powered down state no less. When their father gets word of his actions here today, he vows Cooler will regret it for at least the next hundred years. But that's only if he doesn't receive even more tragic news. Killing his own family. Zarbon and Dodoria can't believe the sight before him. In fact, they aren't given the opportunity to process it. Cooler hissing what a shame it is that during Frieza's secret mission, something went horribly wrong. Whatever happened, no living witnesses remain to account for the dreadful loss of the fearsome Lord Frieza. Stacking the bodies into a pile, he commands his underlings to drag them back to his brother's ship and send it into the nearest star. That should tie things up here just fine. In a calculated, swift secret plan of his own, Cooler plotted an idea in a bid for King Cold to hand this territory and everything else Frieza ruled over to him. And thus began the reign of Cooler in this part of the universe, extending all the way to Earth, on which Son Goku would not arrive. Never would this reality know the potential of the infant in that pod, who was snuffed out before his adventure could ever begin, undoubtedly resulting in a domino effect of unprecedented proportions. Twelve years go by. The following events occur in both universes 9 and 3, the latter being Bardock and Raichi's realm. Bulma begins her journey to find the Dragon Ball on Mount Paozu. Sticking to the bleep on her radar, she knows the next closest one must be around here somewhere. Stopping at a tiny shack, since we're familiar with the luxury she comes from, she can't help but comment to herself on what a rundown place it is. Drawing her weapon, she doesn't want to take any chances. Making her way in, the wily old Gohan heard her car pull up and chooses to hide quietly behind the door, scoping out the intruder's actions. Relieved to find no one here, she wonders where that Dragon Ball could be. When Gohan pipes up behind her, questioning if Miss Burglar is looking for something. Firing six rounds and screaming in fright. Somehow the grandpa catches seven bullets. Before dropping ten, so in reality, she probably just drained the entire magazine. But semantics aside, he chides the young girl, reprimanding that was very dangerous what she just did. But she could only stand in amazement that he literally just caught bullets. He then scolds, well they were going to damage my wall. After a grocery list of excuses and a couple cups of tea, Bulma told the old man exactly what she was looking for and why, revealing her knowledge of Shenron's power and her quest to bring the seven orbs together. Upon hearing this, Gohan is happy to hand over his Dragon Ball, but only on the condition he accompanies her, as it's obvious she'll face some unsightly danger ahead. And not to mention, she herself is a danger to anyone that stands in her way, given how trigger-happy she is. The young lady actually has no issue with this offer, glad to have him along. In her head, an invincible martial arts master will be the perfect bodyguard and may even speed things up a bit. Well, of course, he's merely content in going on a road trip with a stunning young girl. 
Their adventures would play out very similar to the familiar story, but with Gohan reuniting with Roshi and Turtle. And not long later, Ox King on Fire Mountain, avoiding what was initially a minor confrontation. Discovering it was Oolong terrorizing Aru Village, not a vicious monster, and facing off against Yamcha in the Diablo Desert, making quick work of him as the bandit bows before him, begging to be taken on as a disciple. Even a little romance would ensue, with only a few more minor annoyances in their way. A rabbit and his cronies would get to stay on Earth, and the Pilaf gang gets what's coming to him. Soon, their adventure was complete, and they collected all seven Dragon Balls. But, and still meeting Yamcha, and getting to make a wish with no interference, what did Bulma wish for? 45 years pass. The Vargas land on the lookout to invite the Earth's heroes to their tournament. Tien, never one to turn down a challenge, is the first to accept the proposal. Yamcha banging his fists together, boasts they've already fought the entirety of their own universe. What could possibly be worse than the others? When two young students of Krillin, also sporting turtle shells, hop up and down begging their sensei to allow them to come with. Apologizing it's too soon for his pupils, as they still have much training to do before participating in an event like this. Knowing if they see the Z Fighters battle at full power, they would lose all hope. One assuring they've gotten plenty strong. Krillin presses, they just worry about keeping that up, and they might be ready next time. Continuing to argue, they complain they'll never learn to fight only by wearing these turtle shells and doing random jobs. Of course, we know that's how Krillin was initially introduced to the Kame way as well. But nowadays, it also doesn't hurt in paying the bills of the school. Remembering back to the good old days, he was the Turtle Master's only student. But surely, the focus did nothing to hurt his progress. Yamcha butting in, urging they not underestimate their training, as his own biggest defeat came from a great master of this school. Essentially reiterating the story we just saw, he tells of how Gohan agreed to be the bodyguard of a young girl, joining her on a perilous journey. And at the time, he himself was one of those perils, robbing them in the desert, demanding they hand over all capsules and money. Alternatively, they could always hand over their lives instead. Twisting his mustache, Gohan jokes the youngster shouldn't play with such pointy things. After all, he could hurt himself brandishing a weapon like that. Oolong cheering on the old-timer from a distance, while Poir can only look in horror. Deducing what's going on from the stories he's heard, Yamcha, now much more alert, questions if this man happens to be the great martial artist's son Gohan by chance. Keeping up with his lighthearted humor, the master has to admit it's kind of embarrassing to be recognized under these circumstances. But instead of backing down, Yamcha is more determined than ever to win this fight, believing it will be an honor to defeat him with the strongest attack. Waking up at a vital moment, the groggy Bulma hisses they're being really noisy and she can't sleep. Spotting the beautiful woman before him, the warrior's brain turns to potatoes. So Gohan plants him in the ground with a modest kick. Confused that was his… strongest technique. Back in the present, the former bandit giggles he was able to find a master and love at the same time. The kids whispering how weird this guy is. Catching him off guard, Tien tells them not to be sad, as their day will come. After all, they are in the best school. He would know this firsthand. The girl quipping, oh what, you're also going to tell us a… Talking over her, he assures no. It's a long story and he generally doesn't get nostalgic. Really not letting it go, they continue to try to sway their teacher, wanting to at least watch the fights. When Videl comes swooshing up onto the lookout, thanking the others for inviting her as well, excited to compete against new foes. Yamcha asking if she really plans on taking the Z-Sword, but it does always seem to impress the opponents. The children politely greet her, who's just as cordial in seeing them too. Getting on their good side, she inquires if they'd like to take care of her motorcycle while they're gone. And given the facial expressions, I think we know the answer. Zooming to space, they now shout for their sensei to take his time in that other universe, being given something of interest besides training to keep them entertained. While there are still many stories untold in this realm, such as where these two students of Krillin came from, how Videl found herself in possession of the Z-Sword, or how Yamcha became an android. For now, 
It's just left to our imagination. On Earth, September 10th, year 749. In Universes 3 and 9, Bulma, Sun Gohan, and Yamcha met while searching for the Dragon Balls. And now, they all live at Capsule Corp together. Refer to Chapter 69 to expand on this, or check out Part 59 of this video series. In Universe 13, a demon child is still killing people. But far away from all this, near the peaceful island which hosts Kame House, a young man is seeking a master. Following similar motions as the original series, Curlin presents his would-be master with some… particular qualities that really impress him. But he should know that he doesn't usually take on pupils. If he wants to become one, he will have to achieve a task for him, which the youngster has no problem blindly agreeing to. He heads back out to sea chanting a jaunty tune. Fetching an energetic young sexy girl for my master. Oh wait, is he preparing a kidnapping? Is, is his new master a paleontologist and making him his accomplice? No, no! He's sure the two of them are going to be the perfect role models for all the young readers out there. Although, having just rowed all the way there to the island, he can't believe that he has to cross the entire ocean again. He'll never find a girl out here. Sure enough, a mermaid pops out of the water. Looks like something conked her on the head and caused her to lose consciousness. Pulling her aboard, the boy questions if she's okay, but she's unable to even form a proper sentence. Growing up, look in his eye, Krillin promises to take her to a doctor. Moments later, he calls out to his master that he's back, who himself is already suited up for his date. He's surprised he's returned so soon. He whips outside to see the mermaid, now alive and well for the mysterious bump on her head. He quickly and excitedly approaches her to ask how she's doing. And alive and well may have been a bit of an overstatement, as her head actually hurts a lot. The boy at least has the foresight to let Roshi know what's going on. He told her that he could heal her. So Kame House MD moves in to examine her closely. What she needs is... Freaking up! Masahi de Chichis. Getting about what he deserves. The old-timer remains undeterred. He proudly informs that his training is notoriously very hard. He will have to find another voluptuous girl. But there's only water around them. How the heck are they gonna do that? Leveling with them, that is true. It will take another approach. He suggests that they go to the city. He will show them the ways of a true pickup artist. Unleashing his airboat. Inflatable raft. Complete with an unnecessary helm. An exposed serpentine pulley for the fan, I think. Overweight anchor and what appears to be a gaudy exhaust pipe from a hot rod. And a backwards jet engine? Then again, this entrance could work as the air intake and the housing narrows to a point to allow a more controlled propelling jet. Since of course, the accompanying craft isn't intended for air travel. Though I'm not sure if such a compact design would allow for the necessary devices to guarantee proper ignition and execution within the combustion chamber and would leave the engine more or less just an expensive and really dangerous blowtorch. And an old school speaker system. In all fairness, Roshi even admits that the first step to impress a girl is with a flashy and expensive ride. However, his wannabe student doesn't think this is it. The second step is to dress like an impressive gentleman. Though again, Krillin doesn't feel the same. But thinking he has a theory, the master must be so good at picking up girls, he gives himself a handicap like the stupid raft in these hokey clothes. Something I gotta disagree with. Now I wear a hoodie and gym shorts almost every day of the year, but you can't hate on a nice suit. And while the raft may be distinguished, I'd still rock it every single day. Coming ashore, the gang attaches the craft to a dock and happily rush in to land. The old timer is convinced that this city will be good. Getting a look. Oh my. Oh my. Popeye. Krillin just knows this place is perfect. They'll surely find a girl for Master here, and then they can start the real training. However, the Turtle Hermit immediately takes the wind out of his protege's sail. He informs that they won't be going to the beach. It's too crowded. Also, albeit keeping this part to himself, he's sort of not allowed there anymore. 
He concludes that they'll talk to girls sitting in cafes, parks, or walking on the street. It's well known that girls love to be interrupted by passing strangers completely unprovoked. It's also considered romantic to catcall them with ridiculous and generic pet names. And this plan went about as expected. Running up to yet another woman, he still hasn't lost an ounce of resolve. Or learn to talk better? He jubilantly shouts, Hello, Miss Perkybum! Who actually responds a bit more polite than deserved. Maybe even knocking the old man down a peg if he had any shame. Yes, old man? You need help crossing the street? Then, as one could guess, he does something likely illegal, causing her to shout for the police. Although they could have easily overpowered the authorities, they comply and are put in a cell. The guard yells that they'll stay in here until they've learned some respect. Well, it was about this time Krillin started to get suspicious. Maybe this isn't the proper way to pick up ladies. After all, they haven't even gotten the slightest positive response since arriving here. But Roshi doesn't understand. Back in his day, they didn't ask girls for their opinions. And when exactly was his day? About 300 years ago? Why does he ask? Which actually makes a lot of sense canonically if you think about it. Roshi is older than the sand on his island. It doesn't excuse his routinely less than gentlemanly behavior, but it does at least make a lot more sense. Just then, a group of cops roll in as excited as ever. One shouts, Good news! We got launch at last! The secretary is just as happy as the officer appears to be. Looking in close, and what we already know about her, it's pretty obvious why she went so peacefully. The clerk's smile quickly turns sour as she informs that there's a pervert in one of the cells. Be sure to put her in the other. Which, good looking out for the inmates. As he walks in to examine the arrestees, in one area, a sad young boy and feeble old man. The other, a spike hair man and a literal warthog. Though as we all know, looks can be deceiving. It turns out that the hogman is only in for tax fraud, but the buff dude committed one of the worst sins of mankind. Maybe Launch is better off with the pervy old man. Wouldn't take long before night fell over the mainland. It seems Roshi made his attempt at doing a little sweet talking. A still handcuffed launch summarizes the Arnie spun. She wants to confirm that he's telling her that she could just go live with him in a quiet place away from the city? She thinks that would be the best option for her. She'll go with him. Yes! They did it! They did it, boy! Although the girl looks on a bit bemused, Krillin sees the situation a little differently than reality. He thinks the only reason the master is so happy is because he finally gets to be his official pupil. Gazing outward to the full moon outside, which means absolutely nothing on a planet bereft of Saiyan life. Launch is afraid that they will only be able to achieve this proposed life after years of prison. While she may or may not remember exactly why she's here, it's pretty clear she's at least aware of her other self's actions. And that's all? Simple problems with simple solutions. What's a little prison escape when you're the strongest man in the world? Snapping her cuffs with the slightest of pulls, Kame Seren grabs the bars blocking their path to freedom, nonchalantly uttering, Time to elope! He effortlessly makes a new doorway for the cell, but the tax fraud and scumbag call after him. Heavens, good sirs! You can't do that! This is public property! Their tax dollars paid for this! The other echoing, Yeah, where's the respect? The trio don't waste any time dragging their feet and quickly make their way back to the water. Krillin suggests that maybe they could go through the sewers to go better unnoticed. Orochi squabbles that he's not that kind of martial arts turtle. They get to the dock without any ensuing drama. First, the master rushers launch onto the craft. The pair needlessly catch their breath on the dock. The old man whispers to his pupil that he thinks she likes him. But at least at the moment, she's more focused on how cold the night has gotten. Instead of hopping on also, the former takes his time boasting to Krillin how the ways of a gentleman. <laughs> as a familiar sneeze screams out over the ocean. With that powerful sneeze, the bandit Evil Doer launch has returned. Takes no delay in stealing their boat, cackling into the darkness. Adios, losers! Leaving them high and dry, the two are instantly surrounded by the local authorities. They demand the pair surrender as they're being arrested for breach of moral standards and vandalism. 
which sounds a lot better than a charge of destruction of a government building and aiding and abetting and other laws I'm not educated enough to know. Alas, Tommy Sen and Krillin go quietly and were sentenced to only two months of community service. Now wearing his mentor's heavy shell, he questions why he has to wear this thing and do all the work. The thingy quick, the old man tells the boy that this is his training. His introduction into the turtle school begins now. Which actually isn't a bad excuse. He'll have to remember that one for the future. Universe 3 and 9, or the realms where Goku never became the hero of Earth. On planet Earth, we find ourselves at the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai, May 6, age 750. For a quick refresher, this was the first tournament Goku and Krillin competed in. It features fighters such as Jackie Chun, Ranfan, Nam, Yamcha, Giren, and Bacterian. In this universe, it appears that Yamcha and Krillin both represent Kami School, but haven't met. Yamcha introduces himself, informing him of this information. Looking back at him with a cocky sneer, the boy chortles that he must have got conned. Master Roshi only has one pupil, and that's him. And he's absolutely right. Yamcha's master's son Gohan. He was the first pupil of Master Roshi. Something Krillin can't believe. The great son Gohan? He thought he was dead. If we remember to the last chapter, it's actually stated that Yamcha, Bulma, and son Gohan all met and now live together at Capsule Corp. The two of whom unexpectedly run into each other. Of course, even the best disguise wouldn't fool them. Gohan is really happy to see his former master. Who feels the same? The announcer calls out to gain the attention of everyone around. They're going to draw their order to see who's facing who. The first round will consist of Krillin versus Giren. Then Jackie Chun versus Ranfan. Yamcha versus Bacterian. And Nam versus Brace Lu. Watching on, Poir cheers on his best friend. And if you didn't know, Poir is indeed a boy. On the other hand, Bulma steams that he better win. He's been snubbing her for months while training with Sun Gohan for this. The tournament doesn't take any time getting underway. The announcer declares the start of the bracket, Krillin versus Giren. If we remember how much trouble Goku had against this fighter in the original series, we know that he's far from the least formidable in this contest. Almost immediately after the match begins, he lays his foe flat on the stage even faster than he expected. But hopping back up, it's not over yet. You want more? Oh. Let go, you little pest! Oh. In a desperate attempt to shake Krillin's hold, Giren foolishly pushes himself forward and out of the ring. But what? Wait, if he's out of the ring, then so is his opponent! Although, that isn't necessarily true. As we can see, he managed to keep his feet inside the arena. Making it official, it is the end of the first match, and Krillin's the winner! The second match will consist of Jackie Chun vs. Ranfan. If you're familiar with the original series, you're aware of the latter's... tactics. She immediately gets flirty with the old man, seductively requesting that he be gentle with her causing Roshi to completely fall out of his faux persona for a moment. He eagerly replies, No worries, my dear. You're in good hands. <laughs> Restraining her from her abrupt assault, he condemns the little lady that she seems pretty angry, who manipulatively screams for the pervert to let go of him. But, but this is a fight. They're supposed to touch each other leading to him letting his guard down, just like she planned. Unfortunately for her, even her strongest punch has completely no effect on the strongest human on Earth. However, her hand being on his chest gives him all the reason he needs to. Hiroshi. Miss Sasha did she, she's coming full circle. He laughs and now it's his turn. She quickly retreats in the realization that this guy really is a pervert. Men like him have nothing in their pants. Has he ever known a real woman? While it's a strategy I highly discourage against real-world perverts, she nearly completely disrobes in the ring asking if he has the huevos to touch her now. In this case, on the other hand, it works perfectly. Jackie Chun's own blood pressure propels him out of the ring giving Ranfan the victory. 
Quickly moving on to the next fight, Yamcha will face off against Bacterian. As Ranfan dresses and leaves the stage, Gohan, or Bryce Liu, approaches her to quip that that was very cheeky of her. Who has a pretty fair comeback to this? Bacterian has on less clothes than anyone here, and nobody's saying a thing to him. And while I admit that Ranfan's strategy is less than conventional in martial arts, a good fighter also has to be focused and disciplined to not allow such things to distract him. The former wolf bandit enters the ring with a fitting bandana. He figures if he wears this thing, his smell won't affect him. <laughs> As the fiend tries to incapacitate Yamcha with his horrid breath, luckily the bandana does its... It... It's, uh... <laughs> ripping it off! Him just breathing on it was enough to make it utterly reek! The foul monster cackles that his smell won't leave him now. It'll be stuck on him for this entire fight. <laughs> Even the crowd is having trouble suffering through the stench. Bulma holds her nose and shudders that Yamcha will need to take eight showers if he ever wants to approach her again. With the Kame student, he needs to breathe, but he doesn't want to dare open his mouth to do so. As he goes in for one quick inhale, Bacterian hatches his most fiendish move. Red attack! <laughs> Following that sinister onslaught, Yamcha falls unconscious. After a quick 10 count, Bacterian is declared the winner. This battle does come with a bit of an asterisk, though. The authors excuse themselves from this pitiful fight, but as you know, Yamcha could never make it past the first round. Also, unlike another one of our heroes, he has a nose. The final match of this round will consist of Nam and Bryce Liu. At least this is a more conventional fight where neither warrior has any gimmicky tricks. Boma can't help but notice that the old guy reminds her of someone. Alas, with what could have been a very fun fight to watch, we're not really treated to any of it. Gohan rings out Nam without much issue, but congratulates him on fighting well. Though for the humble traveler, all this means is he won't be able to save his village. Given the altruist he is, or at least pretty good-hearted person from what we know he is, he questions save it from what? He wants to hear everything. The first semifinal will be Krillin and Ranfan. The young man cowers to himself that he wanted to be a strong martial artist to impress girls, but he can't even look at him head on. He'll ask Yamcha about this. A hot guy like him can't be scared of girls. Even against a, what, 13-year-old? Ranfan has no shame and maintains her previous strategy. She gets all girl-faced and fawns that he was super strong against Guren. She only hopes he won't hurt her. The good news is that Ranfan may have been an alright fighter despite her dirty style, but against what is essentially a superhuman at this point in the story, she stands no chance. With that ring out, Krillin advances to the finals. Hiroshi quarrels, that was much too fast, Krillin! She didn't even have time to undress! We now have Bacterian and Bryce Liu. Unlike Yamcha, Gohan has had a lot more experience in battle and has no desire to bother getting close. He's gonna avoid the smell with a quick Kamehame. He sends him soaring out of bounds. An incredible instant victory by Bryce Liu. He has demonstrated for them a technique reserved for the elite. But this acts as a sort of getaway for the turtle students. That old man, he just used a legendary technique of Master Roshi. Yamcha grits that he knew it. It's son Gohan. Why is he participating in a disguise? This echoes Yamcha's suspicion of Jackie Chun in the original series. Gohan glances down towards the announcer. They can start the next fight immediately if they want. And with no reason to decline, looks like that's what they're gonna do. Yansha approaches Krillin. Apparently feeling a bit betrayed by his master, he reveals that he knows all of Bryce Liu's weaknesses. Moments later, the duo find themselves facing off. Even with the secrets Yansha told him, Krillin doesn't appear fully confident. His initial onslaught only works to tire him out. He suddenly stops and gazes at his foe deadpan. Bryce questions if he's done attacking. Who replies that it's useless. He sees all his attacks coming. So evade this, charging the Kamehameha. But it's only a distraction as he deploys part of Yamcha's advice and tickles him. The old man is paralyzed and unable to fight back. 
when Krillin releases the most fiendish plan of all. Hitting him right in his old man back pain. That's when the youngster goes in for the finishing blow. He plans to send him out of the ring like pretty much all the others in this tournament. Unfortunately. This is something Gohan easily counters and instead sends him flying. It looks like he's going to need more experience to defeat him. This gives Gohan the victory and secures Roshi's plan. After all, he only entered as Jackie Chun to defeat his own pupil. That way, they would still have something to work for. If they were to win here so quick and easily, it would demotivate them to become stronger. Good thing Gohan happened to show up with the same idea. Returning to Nam, Son Gohan offers him his winnings from this tournament. He only asks that he use it well. Who is far too humble to accept. That money is his. However, he doesn't need it. He lives a hermit's life. Or at least he did before becoming accommodated free of charge by the richest people on Earth. Yamcha cuts right to the chase. Why such a disguise? Who stares daggers into him and admits they did it so the next generation wouldn't get too full of themselves. But they? Who else does he mean? And no one, of course. He's just a silly old man. Though naturally, he just doesn't want to blow Roshi's cover. And thus, the pupils of the Turtle School didn't become full of themselves. They continue their training with renewed vigor, even though Yamcha would definitely take a few vacations. Unknown to them, their story will continue, forced by terrible events. In Universe 11, the same universe Bobbity would one day rule over. Our heroes faced a different threat in the three cyborgs of Dr. Dro. Though beaten in their last encounter, they live to fight another day. The Saiyan Prince, however, takes his defeat poorly. And while Goku still battles the deadly heart virus, Piccolo decides to make the biggest decision of his life. Speaking to his fellow Namek, Kami himself confirms, he and Piccolo, or rather his predecessor, used to be a single entity. But of course, Piccolo already knows this well. Without even having to speak it, Kami questions, is this truly necessary? Taken aback, he'd suggest it's not, as even Trunks, who literally traveled back in time to warn these creatures will destroy the world, has given them all the proof they need. And after they almost killed, cutting his sentence short, Kami interjects, Earth's heroes were the ones who started that fight, and the cyborgs consciously chose to spare all of their lives. Questioning his elder, if this renders them not a threat in his eyes, that's not the case. But if he's going to make the final decision of his life, he at least wants a good reason. In Universe 18, our universe, Kami had feelings of unease these past four years because of the presence of a certain life form. But here, Cell never arrives. Mentioning to Piccolo, merging would leave the Dragon Balls useless. And today, it's not power they need, refusing to fuse back into a single individual. Again, in our universe, Bulma alerted the others over the phone a second time machine was found. However, in this instance, the conversation would go a bit differently. Krillin inquires where she's calling from, having tried to get a hold of Gohan to no avail. But ignoring him, she questions if her son from the future is with him. Handing the call over, she makes the request for him to head back to Jero's lab to recover any computers, hard drives, whatever he can find and bring him to her. But having already tried that in his own time and discovering nothing but rubble, and while the universes may change, Bulma's stubbornness does not. So she asks him to go anyway, pointing out they probably checked years after the fact. But now that only a few hours have passed, it's worth a shot. And sure enough, they discover Jero's hidden basement. Trunks mumbles, he'll have to check this place out in his own time too. Stepping up to a sort of incubation chamber, Krillin shouts from behind he's found the schematics to the cyborgs. Confident Bulma will be able to do something with them. With that, Krillin suggests they destroy the tank behind him. Something about it just gives him the creeps. Obliterating the lab and any remaining useful data, hope seems to have found its way back into the Z-Warrior's hands. Three days would pass. At Kame House, Goku recovers from the heart virus, with aspirations to stand up against the cyborgs. He tells the others he plans to train for the next year. If he can't beat them by then, then probably nothing else can be done. Roshi points out the obvious and they probably don't have that long. But Goku knows a place where time is generally not a factor. Gathering everyone at Kami's lookout, 
they would enter the room of spirit and time. No! The god of Earth declining the proposal, denying their entry to the room. Just as with Piccolo, he claims they're all overreacting. First of all, these so-called monster cyborgs have only committed a few petty crimes at worst. Second, the sacred chamber is a very dangerous place and will only ever be used as a last resort. And third, there is no way he would help someone like Vegeta become more powerful. Growling back, the prince is aghast this is his thanks for living here peacefully for the last four years, not so much as hurting a fly. But ready to die on this hill, the god barks he would sooner trust his evil counterpart than him, stating, the problem with villains like he is they believe not pillaging and murdering suddenly makes them angels. Trunks butts in, assuring Kami the cyborgs of his time are indeed mass murderers. As of now, they've almost completely wiped out the entire human race. If they aren't stopped here and now, it's only a matter of when they will strike. Understanding where the time traveler comes from, the Guardian simply believes this timeline and his are vastly different. Krillin agreeing with Kami, admits he too doesn't feel they're all bad, and now that Goku's back, they shouldn't be much of a problem. Scoffing, Piccolo reminds the cyborgs clearly stated their goal is to kill Goku, but ready to risk the world for some. Krillin continues to make his case, arguing at one time Piccolo and Vegeta also vowed to kill Goku. Even Tien, but now they're all friends. We are friends. friends! I will kill Kakarot! I'll terrorize this world! Either way, at an impasse with Kami, the gang would train the old-fashioned way, just out of earshot of the cyborgs. But having such a short time frame, will Goku be able to find a level above Super Saiyan soon enough? The would-be villains arriving at Kame House. 18 squabbles with her brother. Since he just had to travel by vehicle instead of just flying, Goku has probably had long enough to find the perfect hiding place, having searched Mount Paozu as well. 17 admits he too is getting a bit bored at their lack of success. Pointing out to sea, 16 announces Son Goku is roughly 3,400 kilometers in this direction. Questioning how he knows this, the android has detected him training several times now. Then asking the obvious, and if he's so motivated to kill Goku, why didn't he mention this earlier? This goes unanswered as Seventeen is ready to fight. Instructing his son, Goku explains just making your key larger isn't going to do it. To go Super Saiyan, Gohan must release his anger. When Krillin spots something in the sky, the cyborgs have arrived. Seventeen mockingly shouts out to the hide-and-seek champion of the world, Goku himself challenging the Saiyan to a fight to the death outright. 18 adding, if anyone tries to interfere, 16 and herself will put them down instantly. But 16 refuses to, maybe because he's only programmed to kill Goku? The Saiyan agrees, but wants to go to a more deserted place first, yelling this is a deserted place as only his house is here. But with Bulma inside, the scientists are quickly alerted to the presence of our villains, working feverishly to finish their latest device. Blocking the blast, Trunks screams for them not to attack his mother. Keeping her word, 18 stops him with ease, piffing these guys really can't help themselves. While doing little to engage in the battle, 17 taunts our hero, asking if he only plans to evade. While in the forest, it seems Vegeta chose to take to solitude for his training. Sensing the fluctuating key, he knows what must be happening. Teleporting behind him, the cyborg confusedly questions how Goku just did that who, like a fool, reveals he can move instantaneously by locking onto someone's key, and Krillin was behind him, his aggressor actually taking an interest in this ability. While his sister is less enthused, barking she's past the point of annoyance. Now's our chance! Together! Even their combined efforts only frustrate 18. Calling out to Gohan, Bulma excitedly shouts she's finished the device, and they're saved. Explaining to the boy, this remote will deactivate the cyborgs. All they have to do is use it near him. But overhearing, 
saving Bulma. The remote is knocked out of her hand. Getting clever and teleporting out of the dog pile. Goku claims the device, but doesn't feel it's all too fair to kill him with the press of a button. Bulma, after being unintentionally bodied by Tien, shouts for him to get close to him and use it already, threatening to blow up the entire planet if they come anywhere near him. The scientist questions if he can use instant transmission to get close, but the Saiyan needs to be able to feel his key to do so. When Krillin asks where 18 went, jumping into the nearby lake, She uses her energy to cause a flood in the area. Before quipping, she hopes 16 doesn't rust. But more importantly, she destroys the remote. Bulma screaming she didn't intend it to be kicked and drowned. But the ramifications of this quickly swells over the fighters, believing now they're doomed. Vegeta scoffs, as if this plan would have worked anyway. Before 17 scowls, they've gone too far now, and he's going to kill them all. But jeering that won't change anything, Bulma had the forethought to send the plans of the remote to scientists all over the world, and it's only a matter of days before they'll build another one that can work for miles away. So, this is the end for the cyborgs, causing the villain to scream their new mission is to hunt down every scientist on the planet, trunk stating they've finally shown their true colors, but 16 merely utters, no. Turning to 17, he urges he not be a criminal. Before all of this, he was a decent person. He never killed humans or animals for fun. Arguing the Z Fighters can kill them at any time though. Krillin chimes in, but they don't want to. If the cyborgs don't go on some kind of rampage, the Dragon Team won't bother them. And if they ever just want a good fight, he's sure Goku would be willing to accept at any time. Who adds, that sounds great, but if he wants a real challenge, he'll have to give him a bit longer to train. But 18 is convinced they're lying, pleading her brother not listen, as there is no way anyone would just let him go after almost killing him. Chuckling that his own comment just came full circle, from Kami's lookout, Krillin Schwartz he thought Jiro gave him a bit more information, telling how Goku not only let Piccolo go after their battle, but also Vegeta, and they both threatened to destroy the entire planet. Gohan backing him up, states there's no reason they can't all live in peace. And doubling down on his hate, Phallus? Tien chimes, he for one would actually be glad to have their help, in case they ever need assistance against Vegeta. As our hero approaches him, admitting it was an awesome fight, asking if they can have a rematch tomorrow, who is still a bit apprehensive. Goku gives him a slap on the back, giggling he's happy they're all friends now, though 18 warns he not push it. In 16 remarks, he will still kill Goku, eventually. And so the cyborgs would stick around, 17 making the perfect sparring partner for Goku and Vegeta. It wouldn't take long for them to become a part of everyday life. The more time passed, the closer they got. And naturally, the day arrived when Goku would actually surpass his newest training partner, standing victorious. The Saiyan can't help but laugh at how jealous Vegeta will be when he finds out who's busy finding out something else at the moment, Krillin and 18 falling for each other as they would in our realm. The situation here resolved, Trunks decided to head on home, but the cyborgs of the future still being much stronger than himself, and their hearts too corrupted to ever change. He would easily defeat them with his mother's remote, and devastatingly, as he was about to venture back to see his friends once more, Cell caught him by surprise, killing him. The biological android stealing the time machine for himself, but going a bit further into the past than Trunks planned to. Because so, he created yet another timeline. But that's a story we already know. Landing on Earth, the Frost Demons find themselves one step closer to getting their revenge. King Cold questions his son if he really wants to wait for the Super Saiyan, as it's going to take at least another three hours. But the sadistic Frieza chorts, of course he does. And while they wait, they can kill all his little human friends before he arrives. Not far away, Vegeta must confess something to our heroes. This is undoubtedly the end of their planet. When the Emperor commands his underlings go span out and kill all Earthlings. Spotting his henchmen flying overhead, Piccolo calls out the invasion has begun. The prince only scoffing how typical it is for the tyrant to send his grunts to do all the legwork. Regardless, they have to find a way to stop Frieza's army all while using as little energy as possible as to not draw attention. 
The Z Fighter zipping into action. Only Bulma, Puar, and Vegeta remain. Venturing far to the north, a few soldiers spot a town at last. As one is struck by what appears to be a large rock. Lo, Krillin and Gohan stand before him, ready to defend all nearby innocents. Though underestimating the pair, the apparent leader taunts. Well, well, what do we have here? To the west, one henchman questions what the average power of a human is, the other merely sighing. Very low. <laughs> and to the south. What's happening? I'm not detecting anybody. Finally, the east. A few land in the middle of a crowded area, but Yamcha arrives at the same time. But even while being heroic, he manages to pull a… him. Exerting himself a bit too much, Gohan senses his power. Vegeta fuming that idiot just blew their element of surprise. Bulma brings up a fair point, and at least he's doing something. Reporting back to his master, a soldier alerts they've lost touch with all forces. They've all simply vanished, noting they spotted powers of over 5,000, but only popping up on the scouter for a very short moment. Knowing they've been found out, Tien and Piccolo rush back, the Namekian volunteering to hold him off as long as he can, apparently learning nothing in his death against the Saiyans, urging Tien to regroup with the others and not make his presence known. The Frost Demons rise into the air, as Frieza is aghast to see Piccolo here. All the Z Fighters together as planned, Tien is furious Piccolo is going to be the one to pay for their screw-up, as something else catches Gohan's attention. Goku! His father is returning home! Frieza telling this to Piccolo, and the Namek telepathically relaying it to the boy. Krillin excitedly spouting this changes everything. Now they only need to hold out long enough for him to arrive. <laughs> Predictably overpowering Piccolo with ease, Frieza goes to deliver the finishing blow, when Gohan screams for his mentor, but showcasing the same result. The tyrant growls the pair can die together. When Goku arrives, commanding Frieza stop. Amazed to see his adversary on this world so soon, the Saiyan taunts he attack him first, if he dares. Not hesitating to do so, the Emperor barks Goku is no match for him anymore. His father believing he's dead already, Frieza knows there's no way a single blast would be enough. Tightening his hold on Gohan, screaming for Earth Zero to show himself, or he'll start the slaughter by killing this child. Bastard! Yamcha of all fighters charges the invader. With tears in his eyes, though his foe is able to dodge, this causes him to release his hold on Gohan. Reaching out, he calls out once more for Goku to show himself. If he's not here on the count of three, interrupting, Gohan coughs Frieza must really be stupid, as that wasn't his father he just saw, it was their shape-shifting friend Puar, and that attack undoubtedly did kill him. Not believing the kid, the demon screams he's lying, and he will kill them all! A beam coming out of nowhere stopping Frieza in his tracks! Even King Cold wonders who that could have been. This time, the real Goku! His friends surrounding him with elation! He apologizes for being late feeling they were managing quite well for themselves at first, so he wasn't sure if he should step in or not. But not everyone is happy to see him, the Space Lord growling at him, a miss how he managed to get here so soon. At any rate, he can still deliver on that desolation he promised, but not willing to let happen to Earth what he did to Namek. Resurrection effing Frieza, Goku kills him with a single Kamehameha. Vegeta most surprised at this. Stepping towards the action, Tien isn't having any of his cowardice, calling him out for only showing up when the battle is already over. Though the prince sees things differently, confused why any of them would expect him to throw his life away, fighting alongside weaklings, knowing there is no chance at victory without Kakarot here, adding he's not willing to die before defeating the legendary Super Saiyan himself. While this chatter ensues, Cold begins to look a little off. Goku calls out to him, informing he has nothing against him. Only Frieza, and he'd be best to get back in his ship and forget about this planet and its inhabitants. Powering up and shouting that isn't going to happen! Cold takes on his assault form, Vegeta grunting in terror what a fool Kakarot is, who only stares on in silence. Even though being knocked to the ground, Gohan proclaims his faith in his father, 
sensing he's much stronger than he was on Namek. Which may be the case, but he still appears to be struggling early on. Krillin and Piccolo feeling pessimistic. Knowing here and now, this monster is stronger than Goku, and he still has one more transformation up his sleeve in case this isn't enough. Tien baffled how a single being could house this much energy. <laughs> Pinning Goku to the ground and relieving him of his Super Saiyan form. Cold gazes down at his foe, laughing how pathetic he is. We have to help him! Earth Zero's powerless against the might of the Frost Demon, when one of its villains screams this pitiful excuse for a king is going to die at the hands of a Saiyan, just like his feeble son. Knowing he doesn't have the power to destroy Cold, but he won't be able to escape this planet's explosion. Krillin shouts that's even worse than outright losing to the invader. Easily deflecting the blast, Vegeta can't believe he sent it back without breaking a sweat. Panning again to Krillin, he can't believe the irony of King Cold saving the Earth. Furious with the Prince, Piccolo realizes that last attack may have actually scared him, gaining hope they can take him down. Asking if he remembers their fight against Raditz, which causes Goku to let out a smirk, only hoping this time it ends a little more in his favor. Without having to say anything further, he agrees to buy the Namek a little time. Who adds, he will idiotically yell like Vegeta did, so Cold shouldn't see it coming. Powering back up, this fight isn't over. Angrily asking if Goku just plans to keep running away, he mocks our hero, questioning if he really thought he wouldn't notice his friend with his fingers to his head charging an attack. But it's actually Tien he's referring to. Blocking the technique, he chorts. Was that supposed to? Huh? <laughs> Managing to stave off Piccolo, the king grits his teeth through the pain. Goku once again commanding he leave, as it's clear he's lost this fight. Staggering towards him, Cole stutters he will never retreat, not until he kills every last one of them. Arguing he's no longer in a position to threaten anyone, Goku insists he should consider himself lucky to be alive. You're so naive, Kakarot! Taking his opportunity to blast the king head on. This time, Vegeta succeeds, reiterating what he shouted before. Death at the hands of a Saiyan. Condemning the prince for his actions, Piccolo has to actually stand up for Vegeta on this one, agreeing he indeed can be quite naive. Even Yamcha on his side. After all, he probably would just come back mechanized and ready for revenge. But no matter how many choose to side with logic, Gohan is merely happy to have his father back, embracing him and joyfully expressing how much he and Chi Chi missed him. Remembering his wife is a thing, he resolves to head home, putting his fingers to his forehead about to show off instant transmission for the first time. Bulma comes barreling towards him, screaming to know what took him so long to get here. She demands he explain everything this instant, who promises to do so, just as soon as she stops yelling. And while he may not have been the MVP in the fight against Cold, Goku nonetheless arrives yet again at the very last moment, saving his friends. But how many more times would he manage to do so? The androids rain hellfire on a defenseless city, as in the air. Gohan peers in on the destruction, knowing he can't defeat him. But suddenly, he senses an unfamiliar key. Finding the source, he's grateful he decided to suppress his own energy, believing this man to be an alien soldier. Surely it couldn't be one of Frieza's men. But no, it's Pui Pui. Gohan doesn't want to leave the androids, but needs to know what this guy's up to. Leading Earth's hero far away, we find ourselves in a small countryside village where several residents have been slaughtered. Women, children, no one spared. Landing, it's even worse than he thought, but nearby, Pui Pui heads towards an active ship. Throwing his energy drainer, Babidi shouts, that's all the power you could find me. Being a bit of a change of pace for Gohan, he's confused why the wizard isn't happy there are so few warriors to resist here. Then, senses an ungodly key signature. 
While Deburr on his own is a force to be reckoned with, he informs, I found its master! Holding Majin Buu's cocoon. Happy to see his minion after what felt like forever, the villain grows concerned, as there clearly isn't enough energy on this planet to hatch the creature, resolving to reluctantly travel to another world. Though the Demon King warns not to judge a book by its cover, even Pui Pui chimes in, mentioning a couple of Earthlings he'd spotted earlier. They had no energy at all themselves, but the blasts they were firing generated 250 killies. Astonishing Bobbity, deciding not to leave the planet after all, he instructs Tabura to get the egg to the ship. When Gohan calls towards him, growling, leaving this planet was actually the best choice they had, urging they get in that spacecraft and leave this world. Elated at such a surprise, Tabura sees the power lingering inside our hero. Playing the part, Bobbity waves goodbye as he promises they'll leave. Gohan's surprised they'd actually do such a thing. As Tabura bids farewell, Yep, just a trick, of course. The Earthling amazed he's even faster than the cyborgs. It seems the plan for the demon is to merely hold Gohan while they absorb his power. Somehow able to wriggle free with an explosion of energy. The Demon Lord praises his enemy for having the ability to hide his power well, admitting he let his guard down, as the half Saiyan himself feels the same. It's not just everyone who can get the drop on him like that. I'm not everyone. None can compete with the Lord of Darkness. Dodging the spit, Gohan believes his adversary is just being a dirty fighter, but little does he know. Finally taking Piccolo's advice to heart, saved his skin this time around. As the Lugie hits Pui Pui, he turns to stone. What do you think you're doing, you idiot? Yes, you're right, Master. With a cocky smirk, Deburr insists our hero should thank his master. Because of him, his death will be postponed. And if he wants them to leave, he better follow the demon inside the ship. Not knowing if this is a bluff or another trick, Gohan does know he can't allow them to stay on the planet. Cautiously entering the spacecraft, the warrior takes a look around. Coming to a door, he barks that he knows they're watching him. And if they don't open this door, he'll simply destroy it. With our antagonist, Bobbity scolds the Demon Lord, not for turning Pui Pui into a statue, but for almost doing so to their power source. They won't be able to get a drop of energy from a stupid rock. Sorry, Master. You've told me he's quite strong. So, I've sent them to a realm where he will have the advantage. Gohan panically wonders where he is and what has happened, as Yakon lurks in the shadows, explaining they've been sent to his planet. One drenched in darkness, the perfect environment for him to seek his next victim. Then someone says, So you're back, little brother. Apparently, Yakon has a sibling named Merkit and pleads, They must spare this one from death for now and merely neutralize him for the master. And not under Bobbity's control, Merkit sneers, Still a slave to that worm. Say, the light from your prey is magnificent. Why don't we share it instead? which causes Gohan to ponder what they mean by sharing his light. The two continue to squabble as Yakan urges he cannot do such a thing, Merkit pressing. You would prefer to share this wonder with the stinking midget instead of your own sister. And just like myself, Gohan is shocked to find out this thing is a girl before taking control over the situation, mocking. Your sister's right, you know. Family comes first. With sinister eyes and a drooling mouth, the creature bellows. Well said! Come to Merkit, little dear! Quickly taking a chomp out of the light, the other Nkoku Saijin darts over, demanding she stop. But his sister brushes him off, quipping he keep his words for that dwarf in the petticoat. Though, unknown to her, a certain, gowned adorned little person is listening in very closely, and thinks he has a resolution for this family conflict. Instantly, Merkit falls under the control of the wizard. Now is when Gohan realizes these warriors are actually slaves to Bobbity, not willing servants. Wondering what he should do, gaining a little distance, he thinks back to Vegeta's advice, believing he was right. He himself is too soft and needs to be ruthless. Looking up at the halfling, they snark how stupid Gohan is. Having moved so far away, surely he can no longer see him. But little do they know. Our hero doesn't need his eyes to win a battle. <laughs> Laughing he missed, Gohan assures he didn't, and that was merely a warning. 
illuminating the area. It seems he may still be on the ship in some capacity after all. Shouting out to the villain, he demands to be brought back, or he'll destroy this entire vessel. Calling the Saiyan a fool, he scoffs he'll be stuck here forever in this world if he does such a thing. Bluffing, he replies that he's a Saiyan, and it won't be hard to find his way back, giving him to the count of three. But inside his head, he really hopes Bobbity doesn't know a thing about Saiyans. But lucky for him, it works. And set on the idea of taking Vegeta's advice, he's going to be as ruthless as possible in getting rid of these guys. Running amok, Bobbity's aghast he couldn't take control of this so-called Saiyan. Unable to fathom, he must be pure of heart. Shifting his head, he questions Deborah if he's finished with his punishment. In developing bags under his eyes, he informs he has, and that punishment was giving his own energy to the cocoon. Though appearing pale in the face, the wizard commands he go and get rid of this guy, and if he tries to use a stone technique again, the penalty will be twice as harsh. Facing Gohan only seconds later, he takes note, the demon seems far weaker and slower than before, but still pretty tough. Taking down the vastly deluded Debura, Bobbity believes he has one final plan, moving behind his minion to position him as a shield. Narrowing his eyes, Gohan barks he'll get rid of them himself, spaceship and all, as they have no reason to stay in this world. But playing to the Earthling's weakness, the wizard presses if he attacks, Debura will die, and surely such a pure heart can never strike a wounded man while he's helpless. Proving the villain's plan to contain some fallacies, he struggles to get to his feet, wondering how he could do such a thing. But the egg appears undamaged. Bobbity cackles no one can damage Boo's cocoon, as his power exceeds imagination. Casting a spell, he attempts to unleash the Majin on the universe, believing the energy he's gathered to be enough for his resurrection. As it splits open, the wizard calls for Boo to answer, but only smoke emerges causing Gohan to slightly retch at the smell of rotten food and candy, strangely enough. With his last-ditch effort in vain, Bobbity baffles at the situation, screaming in fury and frustration. His plan to rule the universe has been all for naught. Knowing his father would spare the life of this miserable creature, Piccolo and Vegeta would have blasted him into oblivion, and years of fighting the cyborgs have given Gohan a different perspective on what it means to be a hero. Proving once again, he is indeed worthy to succeed his father, saving the Earth and entire universe without even knowing it. A few days later, Bobby's ship was seen going to Earth! What? In Universe 12, age 790, Trunks hovers over a mountain range, spotting a manhole, seemingly in deep thought. He suddenly shouts his hatred for this place. Descending, we find him in Jero's lab, asking aloud, So, where are you? quickly turning to discover Android 16, exactly what he came for. A few days pass, and Trunks' time still lies in ruin. Within Capsule Core, Bulma appears to have been working hard on the android. Finished with the testing, they go to switch him on, and with the click of a few buttons. Cautiously, Trunks beckons. Uh, 16? Who calmly responds. Yes. First things first being to let the robot know Son Goku died a long time ago, causing a short silence in 16, before muttering, Okay. Still guarded, he explains, from what he understands, 16 is a kind creature and wants to protect the Earth and innocent beings, questioning if that's correct and applies to humans, which, with a smile, he confirms it indeed does, and having one last thing to prove. Powering up, the Time Traveler makes sure the android can sense his energy and how superior it is to his own. So if they were to come to blows, he knows who would win, which the android acknowledges. Even going as far to admit, Dro never fathomed such power, which Trunks takes pride in. Powering down, he makes an offer. If he and his mother repair him, he will devote his existence to helping humanity rebuild itself, checking to see if that's okay. And 16 actually finds great joy in knowing he can aid the planet but reaffirming, if you were to hurt anyone in any way, he will not hesitate to destroy him, just like he did to 17 and 18. With everything crystal clear, Trunks' timeline begins to look brighter and brighter, 
Bulma, Trunks, and the survivors of the android's decimation would gain a powerful and ironic ally that day, having it been the androids and scientists to start the destruction of the world. It would now be the same that seek to put it back together. In Universe 12, West City aged 794, or 27 years after the androids first appeared. Today will be another good day for the Earth. With the androids being vanquished for so many years, it is now estimated that over 85% of the Earth's infrastructures have been restored. And with the population slowly coming back as well, a new king shall be elected to govern us in the upcoming days. Breathing easy at the sound of this broadcast, Bulma feels that at long last, things are truly starting to feel like old times. Looking over at a shelf of photos from another age, she just knows that Gohan and Goku are looking down on them from paradise and smiling. And Vegeta too. Surely he's looking up with pride from the darkest, hottest, most skin-boiling pit of hell knowing that his son is a hero. She just wishes he could see him in person as he is now. As presumably the front door opens, the scientist greets whoever it is with a smile. Looks like someone had an eventful morning. Entering. Trunks tells how that was the first time in weeks he's been able to train extensively. It's getting pretty rare nowadays. Prompting his mother to comment that she bets rebuilding this world takes both leadership and brawn. The former surely thanks to herself, although he does have both in abundance. She hasn't made breakfast yet, so she'll start on that now. Trunks should expect it to be ready in about half an hour. He should hit the showers in the meantime. Pausing. She has a good point. It's probably a good idea to clean himself up. But first, he wanted to ask one thing. Curious, she questions what that is. In a few hours, he'll have someone coming over to hang out with. He just wanted to give her a heads up in case she was planning anything for him this afternoon. Given the look on his face, this isn't just someone. Giving Bulma the perfect opportunity to prod her spawn like the... Spawn prodder she is. With a big smile, she inquires if her boy's bringing his girlfriend over. Well, she bellows out with laughter at her own antics. Trunk shouts that this is serious. He hasn't gotten to see her in over two weeks. As we avoid any innuendos this could suggest. The scientist promises to be on her best behavior. She won't bother them in the slightest. Trunks continues. As for Android 16, he should be helping out the International Committee in making when they're interrupted by the entire building beginning to rumble. Though it could easily be mistaken for more tragedy for our heroes, this is actually the moment that the Vargas would show up in this universe. Continuing to tear through the sky of West City, one of the Namekians has to ask if they should really be going this fast. But of course, this is the best way to gain the attention of those who they seek. Their mission is to gather warriors, and this little spectacle will surely get them excited for what they have to offer. In doing just that, they've fully gotten the attention of the planet's most powerful fighter. It may feel like an earthquake, but Trunks senses distinct new energies outside, and they're definitely not human. He demands that his mother stay here and not leave unless he tells her. Obviously, after the chaos that the androids brought, he's not willing to take any chances. The ship landing in front of him, he wonders what an alien spaceship is doing here of all times and places. Just how they have for every other universe, the Vargas politely greet him, further stating that he's definitely the one they're seeking. And if that's so, Trunks just wants to know who they are and what they want. At the same time, he wonders what Namekians are doing here. He never thought he'd see them on Earth again. The same Varga as before explains their race, and how they've come from a universe parallel to this one. They use their technology to cross over to this plane of existence. Assuming he doesn't already know, the Namics also explain their presence in assisting the Vargas for a grand spectacle that's never been seen before in all the universes. But another universe? Our hero believes he's familiar with this. They mean time travel. Though not quite. There isn't just one universe, but many of them. Each one follows its own path, but with different situations and choices. They weren't aware of any possibilities of time dilations. 
Meaning Big Brain Bulma discovered something even the Vargas couldn't. Continuing, to their knowledge, after countless hours of testing, they are the only ones to discover multiversal travel. With such a unique gift, they decided to host a tournament of epic proportions to reflect this. The other Namekian explains that the Vargas contacted the highest gods, the Kaioshin, for permission. Once granted, they contacted them for usage of the Dragon Balls. They agreed and the winner will ultimately be allowed to make three wishes of their choosing. The three wishes! Naturally, this Trunks lives in a world without Dragon Balls. This is almost unbelievable. For so long, he and his mother have not been able to reach Planet Namek due to the destruction caused by the androids. But now, hope is clearer than ever. They can fix the infrastructures, restore the planet, or even... or even revive those who have been killed. Everyone murdered can finally come back. He'll finally get to see Master Gohan again, or even his father. Not Goku, though. He'll still be deader than dirt. That'll show him for dying of natural causes. The visitors elaborate that anyone who falls victim to... mortality will be revived by other sets of Dragon Balls, and the possibility of having a good challenge shall become reality from these matches. This is a once-in-a-lifetime chance, and they just want to know if he's interested or not. However, this is something he needs to think about. If they can give him a couple hours, he needs to consult with some trusted companions of his. Then, he will have an answer for them. Understanding, they inform him that they'll be right here when he's decided. And so, about two hours pass by. Trunks, Bulma, and Sixteen conspire outside of Capsule Corp. Bulma has to admit that this tournament sounds like it could be the best thing to ever happen to them. Goku would be drooling if he were still around to see this. And if this tournament is the real deal, Trunks believes there's a good chance he may even get to see their friends from the past. It's been about ten years since they last saw each other. His mother adds that it would do him some good to see Vegeta again. Hopefully, his girlfriend will be okay with him being gone for so long, especially since he just canceled on her at the last minute. But her red-faced trunk shouts that she understands, and for her to stop teasing him about it. Sixteen turns to the Celestial Visitors to question just how many universes will be attending this event. Surely it can't be too many. To be precise, they're planning to bring 20 universes to this event. So far, 11 are already on tournament grounds. This will be the 12th universe that they've discovered and invited for participation. As the android seems to be in deep thought for a moment. The scientist has to ask if he's decided whether to join or not. Given the considerations, Sixteen concludes that there will be a small chance that Goku, or an optimal version of which, will be attending. This alone makes participation worth it. So his answer is yes, he will be joining. A little strange that Bulma never found a way to disable this feature. She finds it odd that even after all these years, his obsession with Goku still remains strong. Regardless, she knows that he'll behave. His good nature can overpower his programming any day of the week. She has complete faith he won't do anything sinister. With that, the Varga inquires the group if they're ready to join. And with the obvious answer, Trunks beckons their guests to lead the way. Before boarding the ship, he makes sure his mother's positive that she doesn't want to join him. She'll be safe with him in 16. But with the two of them gone, somebody needs to stay behind and help with the leadership around here. He doesn't need to worry. She can defend herself. Just make her proud by kicking some butt in the tournament. Receiving this confirmation, Trunks would join his robot friend on the ship. The pilot alerts all on board to prepare for liftoff. As Trunks lets it sink in that for the first time in ages, his Saiyan blood is growing restless. The challenges he'll be facing will truly be amazing, and he can only hope that his father will be there. Bulma sees them off from Capsule Corp. This could just be the miracle they need to truly return their timeline back to normal. Landing in what is clearly the employee-only parking lot. The pair are taken to the pathway which will bring them to the arena. They can feel free to wander around. They shouldn't be surprised if certain participants don't recognize them. Everybody comes from different worlds. Some differ only by a small detail, and others are unrecognizable to the reality that they know. Getting a look at the enormous stadium and the crowd in attendance. They weren't kidding. This place is huge and teeming with life. It also seems that the spaces to the right is where the new competitors will eventually show up. To their left, it's already full with fighters. Sixteen scanners are picking up on some big powers. I'm about to do 
some shit. <laughs> Trunks, this is mind-boggling. One look and it's obvious that many here are the real deal. That guy over there, referring to Debura, he's comparable to Cell once he absorbed 18. To think that there are some who have reached that threshold. Simultaneously, the wizard notes that they finally have some new guests, inquiring the King of Demons how strong he thinks they are. Who chuckles that the swordsman power is laughable. His own sister could crush him easily. Maybe you're referring to a certain time traveler. The tall one, he can't sense, but he doesn't seem like much. They're both challengers who shouldn't concern them. First getting a glimpse of his father from the old way Saiyans, even if a bit scruffy. Without a doubt, his dad is within that group. Seems like the Saiyan race still lives on elsewhere, even though a bit primitive. When the android points out someone with a big power is coming from just over there. Revealing Bojack and his gang, a group that Trunks is already familiar with. However, it was before 16 was relevant in this timeline. He himself had never encountered the pirate, but remembers stories told by Trunks, who elaborates that he's a despicable alien pirate who tried to invade Earth during his last trip to the past. He's pure evil. Alongside Cell and Broly, he's one of the worst threats he's ever faced. His power makes 17 and 18 and their primes seem like ants. Don't the organizers understand who they brought to this place? That monster has no heart and will enslave everyone if given the opportunity. Overhearing the squabble, Zenbu turns to notice Trunks, one of the few sea fighters he never got the chance to absorb. Or at least not this version. Goku and the others inside of him are confirming that this is the one from the future. The boy has grown, which makes the Majin wonder how strong he has become. And that person next to him, he is 16. Interesting. The robot still lives on in this world. He can't help but ponder if that's the exact same Trunks who came to his own universe 27 years ago. By mathematical deduction, there's an infinite number of universes, which makes it improbable. Eventually, he will find his answers nonetheless. Either way, he's happy to see that a true Super Saiyan has at last debuted among the public. It's been 20 years since he last faced one. And knowing his luck, more besides this boy shall begin appearing in due time. And speak of the devil, it appears that things shall be getting a bit more interesting from here on out. Back with Trunks, he mentions that they can't afford to drop their guard at any given moment. Who knows what or who is coming next? Just as he hears a very familiar voice, Emperor Vegeta spouts out, So these are the tournament's grounds. What a piece of rush, low quality trash! Seeing his father adored in royal garb, alongside Goku and two Saiyans he's never seen before. What will Trunks make of the destined version of Vegeta that was never to be in our universe? And how will Vegeta feel about the son he never had? Hearing that purple-haired boy say something, the brash emperor turns to rudely inquire if he said something to him. Though without any current interest in getting to know him, he made the remarks, No sir. Causing the former to scoff, that's what he thought. Raditz comments to his little brother that it looks like he's got some competition on who can irritate Vegeta the fastest. Though the feral version of our hero hisses that he can go screw himself. He'll beat everyone's bottom here if he has to. He bows to no man, including Vegeta. Prompting the Emperor to interrupt, he informs the group that they should make a good impression among these universes. So if he finds any of them acting like a complete clown and making them look ridiculous, Say like not showing proper respect to their rightful leader, for instance. Immortal or not, he himself is still dozens of times stronger than them. Speaking to Kakarot in particular as he's the real one with behavioral issues. He better not think for a second that he won't pulverize him the instant he embarrasses him. He has no qualms about scattering his ashes here. Though with a bigger mouth than brain. Kakarot snarls that Vegeta thinks he's stronger? They can settle. But before getting the next sentence out, Raditz speaks over him and shouts that Kakarot humbly apologizes for his rude behavior, begging he be forgiven. Forcing him to bow. The Emperor utters that was a wise move of the low-level warrior. Raditz better be sure to keep his leash close, or he knows what'll happen. As their leader walks off, the older of Bardock's sons thanks him for being so understanding. They have taken his words to heart. However, the fury still burns in Kakarot's stomach. He vows that one day, Vegeta will die. 
Why does stupid Raditz always have to get in the way of his vengeance? Nonetheless, soon he shall dance over his skull. Mark his words. Spectating the entire confrontation. Trunks thinks that this version of his father is even darker than the one he met in the past before he changed for the better. Sixteen notes that his scanners are picking up an uneasy power within him. He believes it would be wise to steer clear. Although... He finally found a Goku that's within his acceptable thresholds. He hopes to f terminate him once and for all. With a bead of sweat, the half sand figures at least he'll finally be able to get his wish. His mind really elsewhere. He has a bad feeling about all of this. First Bojack, and now an evil version of his father with no redeeming qualities. Just how messed up are the other universes? A few hours pass as the other contestants are rounded up. Coldly piercing through a dicey cut of villain from a greater slice of life. Trunks can't help but scowl that since they arrived, they act like they own the place. He doesn't recognize the soldiers, but Frieza and his family clearly roll that universe. He feels sorry for those forced to be in servitude to those creatures. His companion replies that in their own world, Goku killed them all when they invaded Earth. But when he went back to the past, Trunks took him out himself, which is correct. Though the one behind Frieza and King Cold, he doesn't recognize. He assumes he also died in their universe somehow, or at least he hopes so. But at least there's one universe where hope does live on. Those guys over there. He saw them in photos and was told stories about their courage. Revealing Yamcha, Tien, Krillin, some guy, and Videl. And actually, after looking it up, and this is lifted directly from the Dragon Ball Multiverse fandom page, linked below. At some point, Yamcha is augmented into a cyborg by Dr. Jiro. It was he who was given the designation of Artificial Human number 17. He was likely selected instead of Lapis and Lazuli, who became Artificial Human 17 and 18 in the standard Dragon Ball timeline. Jiro's motivation for creating the Artificial Humans in Universe 9 is currently unknown. Son Goku never arrived on Earth. Henceforth, he could have never destroyed the Red Ribbon Army. It's also unknown if any iteration of Android 18 exists in this universe, whether it be Lazuli or somebody else. It could very well be possible Yamcha is the only one converted into a cyborg by Jiro. As such, it's unknown who, if anyone, destroyed the Red Ribbon Army, fueling Jiro's desire for revenge. Or maybe, Jiro's not a bad guy at all here. <laughs> and while we're talking about these folks and to dive even deeper into the lore, it was confirmed in the Dragon Ball Multiverse novel series that Tien and Krillin did die at some point. Because so, they were able to train under King Kai and learn the Kaioken. Also, this is Bulma, and this is Trunks, the spawn of her and Yamcha, and is married to Videl. Lore peddling aside, Trunks noticed this before I even turned the page. He states that there's a version of himself and his mother there. He looks different from himself, but it's definitely him. Yet again, scanning with the scanners, 16 hypothesizes that there's about a 50% difference, most likely different fathers. Which makes sense, he's likely fully human. As the robot stone quickly turns serious, and asking what's wrong. In the shadows, we can make an assumption. Seventeen utters to his sister that it looks like those bird people weren't lying. There's definitely more humans left than they realized. Who replies that now they can definitely have more fun than before. Furious! It can't be! Those monsters are alive and here too? Though turning not to Trunks, but the Emperor Saiyan. Eighteen laughs if it isn't Vegeta again. It looks like he's still a shrimp she sees causing him to tersely question just who the heck this woman is. She best mind her own business if she knows what's good for her, which only encourages her to continue her chortles and seeing he's still the same smug idiot from their world. It takes her back a bit. Stroking her hair, she smirks to the little man that they killed him for giggles. They were nothing to them, even when he tried copying her by turning blonde. A statement that gets his attention. He now wonders just who these two disrespectful individuals are. They know his name. And what she means by blonde, do they mean Super Saiyan? There's no way they could know so much. Unless. With a new voice, cackles out with laughter from the Saiyan universe. Kakara howls that he never thought he would see two punks addressing their dear prince like this. It's honestly too funny. But with one look, he can tell that they are human somehow. Which means, he himself needs to kill them. Seventeen finally piping up. He smiles, 
Well, look at this. They're long-awaited Goku. He's definitely a bit different based on their data, but worthy to die all the same. At last, they can finally get rid of their programming once they end this miserable fool's life. But who cares about the tournament? Kakarot is fine with teaching these little brats some manners here and now. Again, his brother and Toe demanding he wait. As something appears to get the attention of everyone in attendance. Boo remarks that it seems tensions have finally started to run high among those familiar with each other. Though the power everyone feels isn't Vegito or Gast or anyone. But Trunks letting his anger swell over at the sight of the androids. Those murderous pigs! The mere thought they even breathe, knowing what they've done, is an injustice he cannot live with. Sixteen stops him. He recommends his counterpart let it go and not make a scene. Since this is a tournament, he may have a shot in the ring. Resolving to let his benevolence win. He's right. This little display of power does manage to pique the interest of those nearby. Bujin thinks he recognizes that guy. He's the one who killed Gokua. Or Gakua. The dub isn't being Koku. Back in their own universe. Zangya backs us up. He seems to be just as strong as ever. Of course, Bojack looks at him as just another small fry. If they killed him in their universe, they can surely do it again. He's not a threat to them. When Vegeta, the Emperor one, finally realizes something. There's no doubt about it. That boy has Saiyan blood coursing through his veins. He's a Super Saiyan. But no, Saiyan has such colorful features. Referring to his hair and eyes, of course. So he must be mixed race. But who are his parents? Vegeta likely speculates that he would know who either his Saiyan mother or father are, given that there are so few of their kind left in this universe. Really poking the bear. The androids decide to take a hop and skip to offer a visit to dear old Trunks. They comment how they've been searching for him for years. So this is where he's been hiding all this time. And it seems like he's trained a bit. But still, he's nothing compared to them. Which likely isn't the case. Trunks barks that the two of them are scum. Just them existing and having to share the same oxygen as them makes them want to vomit. They better be warned here and now. If they take another step, the organizers won't be able to save them from his wrath. 18 giggles, so much macho talk coming from a pretty boy. He doesn't need to worry. They'll kill him in due time, just as they did to his mother, prompting a quick interruption from 16. He demands that both of them leave now. They have overstayed their welcome. He and Trunks want nothing to do with them. Is that clear? Getting a load of this guy, 17 states that it appears Trunks managed to make a friend. He's pretty tall, and he doesn't look entirely human. Who is he? Who simply tells he's a creation of Dr. Jero designated as Android 16. That's all they need to know. Coming to a shock to the cyborgs, they didn't know that the doctor's earlier prototypes were still active. They thought there was only the two of them left. With a bit of silence, 18 rolls her eyes that they'll be back eventually. Trunks won't escape them forever. She can tell that he is the version from their world. Her brother continues that as for Android 16, he will rue the day that he sided with these deplorable humans in the end. Hopping back to their quarters, it looks like that despicable Jero had more machines than they thought. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, they completely destroyed his lab. They're the only ones who should be left. After their leave, Trunks takes in the harsh reality that too many of these universes are being run by detestable vermin. What went so wrong in Universe 14 that causes Z-Fighters to lose this bad? A few more hours pass by. Peering over at one of the more interesting contestants, the mother of Ickle, the super strong warrior that was announced literally 15 years ago but was never born. The same one who, if has any surprise impact on the ending of the series, will just cause me to retire. But assuming that won't be the case, Ickle's mother chides an attendant that she expects nothing but the best for her child when he's finally born. Hence why she needs things done now, not tomorrow. Though listening, the Varga responds with a bit of an annoyed sigh, assuring he hears her. But inside, he knows he doesn't get paid enough for this stuff. Given her less than usual physique for a warrior, it's kind of hard to believe that someone like her is the strongest fighter in an entire universe. What happened to make such a reality? Truth is, 16 reasons that it could be anything. 
Although a strange power is emitting from her, he can't pinpoint its exact nature. Of course, we've already been made aware that it's her unborn child, not the woman herself that's the warrior. But he wasn't born in time for his match against Seventeen, so he is disqualified. When a few familiar voices enter the arena, one shouts to her dad that she's so excited. A calming voice responds that he knows and he's happy for her. A grumbly baritone rumbles that he just hopes there's a good challenge here. Those bird brains better not disappoint. Before a teenage timbre comments it against him and his dad, he'd be surprised if anyone could last five seconds. A shadowy figure warns that everybody should stay sharp out here. Friendly tournament or not, who knows what's already here ready to cause some trouble. Universe 16, also known as Vegito in some Brawl's universe. Goten calls out to his best friend that he's so pumped. Once they become Gotenks, he just knows they're going to be unstoppable, causing Trunks to holler back in agreement. He wants to explore this place while they can, though. Who knows what they'll find? The duo jetting off. Gohan notices someone in particular. Is that? Returning the surprise, Trunks sees his old friend, too. Getting a look at him, he's much older than the one he ran into in the past. But he still knows it's actually him. This brings back some memories. The former tells his family that he'll be back in a bit. He sees an old friend that he hasn't spoken to in almost three decades. Speaking to the man still inside the entryway, who we already know is Vegito, Piccolo brings attention to the fact that his son from the future is also here. The fused warrior should go see him. Making Vegito laugh, he's sure Trunks will be surprised to see what's become of his father. But in due time, he will go talk to him. And he can also tell that he's kept up on his training, wondering how much stronger he's gotten in comparison to the Trunks of his own universe. Landing, Gohan happily greets his old friend saying it's good to see him again. And he's grown! Which is... Kinda bizarre. As Gohan was like 11 or 12 when they last saw each other and Trunks was 17-ish? Then again, maybe I'm the only one who stopped growing after 7th grade. <laughs> My crushing insecurities aside, Trunks could say the same thing. He grew much differently than the Gohan from his world. Laughing this off, though clearly a bit embarrassed, the times of peace have really gotten him spoiled. Things have been great for the most part since the last time they saw each other. Acknowledging Android 16, Gohan states it's a pleasure to meet him again. He's sure Trunks told him what happened back where he's from. And of course he has. The robot expresses how glad his counterpart fought to protect nature, even if it meant death. Trunks takes this as an opportunity to point out the new faces in Gohan's group as well. Naturally, he recognizes Piccolo. And uh, himself, but not the others. Who are they? Looking back towards him, the woman who is by his side is his wife Fidel. The younger girl by her is their daughter. Her name's Pan. Then, the young man next to Trunks is Goten, his younger brother. Then there's his half-sister Brawl, who likely won't be relevant in this tournament at all. Future Trunks takes this all in. The family has really grown over the years. Since Goku's been dead, he knows it's not easy being the main caretaker of things. Reminder, this Trunks only knows that Goku decided to stay dead after the defeat of Cell. He has no idea that he came back to fight Majin Buu or any of that. Continuing, he'd like him to tell him, how are his mother and father doing? How are Vegeta and Bulma? Which brings in an interesting conversation. He's sorry to say this, but just like his own dad, Vegeta's gone. Forever. It's a long story, but he no longer exists in this world or the next. Bulma has actually remarried. Like a punch to the chest, the time traveler never thought that final moment would be... the final moment he would see his father. However, Gohan does have some good news. There is a person in this universe who came with him. He's not out in the open yet, but he is. <laughs> Though before he can finish that thought, something catches the both of their attentions. Same with Vegito. He smirks at this particular key and the idea that he decided to come to this tournament. He sure brings back a lot of memories from his progenitor's experience with him. The nightmare never ends. It's Cell. Striking fear into many of our heroes. The bio android chuckles that he bets this is a past variation of his universe. Quote, the Piccolo is a dead giveaway, though nobody else of worth has shown up. Too bad. Spotting a worthy foe. The fiend then chortles that here's little Gohan all grown up. And Trunks is also with him. How delightful. The sons of Goku and Vegeta that delivered so many opportunities are now standing before him again. Perhaps coming here was wise after all. 
The chance to kill Gohan a second time and to score a third kill on Trunks would make for an excellent warm-up. A perfect way to showcase his complete power. Speaking only loud enough for Trunks to hear, Gohan apologizes to leave so soon, but he needs to be there for his family in case that monster gets any bright ideas. <laughs> Leaving the time traveler to get lost in his own thoughts. Cell, the biological demon of terror is now here. How can this be happening? Even after so many years, he's still not on his level. They're all in grave danger if Cell makes a move. Freaking Jiro! He deserves a fate worse than hell for creating so much pain and suffering across the multiverse. Trunks would kill him himself given the opportunity. To think his world, brought to the brink of destruction, is actually one of the lucky ones. How sad is that? Kicking it over to the best character of the series, Zen Buu spouts to himself how wonderful it is that he gets to meet Perfect Cell, the greatest threat the Earth ever faced, after himself. He must say, it's like looking at a slightly lesser version of himself. Too bad he can never become truly perfect, unlike the Majin. But he alone needn't hog the spotlight. Buu's personal wish has been granted. The one he's been waiting for to finally show himself. The only one he could never defeat. Vegito. Though he is curious if he's even a match for him now. For now, it's time for a nap. He doesn't think there'll be any more interesting participants. Almost all the cards have been set. Now he just needs to deal everyone's hands. Spotting the most vanilla of all universes. Trunks lays eyes on Goku himself. And his father. He's surprised to see another group got here so fast. And they seem almost identical to Universe 16. Android 16 utters that this is good news. Now there are two versions of Goku to kill. He likes these odds. But that's not what Trunks was saying. He's sure he's not being serious anyway. Hopefully. However, that's not all. Universe 19 has also just been filled up. He doesn't sense much power from them, but their armor looks tough. Before peering over to the original big bad of this event. He might think it's impossible, but it's Broly. Again wondering what the organizers could have been thinking. Bojack and Cell are bad enough, but to have that psychopath here is too much. The robot iterates that he is the legendary Super Saiyan that Trunks has spoke of. His scanners simply fail to fully gauge his power. He might be the strongest one here. After knowing all those who'll be participating, it's clear as day that Trunks has no chance at actually winning. Gohan and the others. Of his world. He's sorry. He won't be able to revive them. Still, his Saiyan blood refuses to cave in. Hope may still live on. He will fight as hard as he can and prevail to the bitter end. At the very least, he can test his limits and find out where he's lacking. And while he is skeptical of the Vargas at first, he also achieved his dream in getting to see his friends of the past. Plus, his father is right there. In a little bit, he'll go over and introduce himself. And of course, he'll also speak to Goku. Gohan was right. He does make things better just by being here. It's good to see him back alive. Just then, the announcer bellows that all the challengers have arrived. They've randomly selected the matches, so may the fighters get ready. 16 asks his friend if he's ready for these fights. And he is. These battles will indeed stand against the test of time itself. The android agrees. Trunks should just know that if they somehow meet in the ring, he won't be holding back. And the same goes for the big old bag of gears. Trunks doesn't plan on pulling punches either. As Nappa and Cargo enter the ring. It now begins. Universe 13, year 737. Planet Earth, home to humans, humanoids, and animals. A mysterious child screeches as an old man attempts to calm him down who insists he doesn't mean any harm. <laughs> Trying to get a hold of the infant, no matter what he does, all the baby wants to do is kick and scream, simply full of violence. The elderly fellow thinks how fortunate it is that he was the one who found him, as this little guy is strong enough to probably kill someone. Raising the boy, Grandpa Gohan writes a letter to Kami Senen, or Master Roshi, detailing how he found and adopted a strange human infant with a monkey tail. However, he is very violent and aggressive, but only towards him, not animals. Yesterday, he nearly fell to his death from a cliff during one of his outbursts. Seeming to be just a year old, the boy also appears to understand when Gohan speaks to him, and has even spoken his first words himself. Kill humans. He's only calm when eating, and when learning self-control through martial arts. 
beckoning his master if he knows someone who could offer counsel regarding this kid, not able to bring in a normal person as it would put him in danger. Not even able to go through a full night's sleep, Gohan continues to think of a solution. Considering it may be possible he just needs a feminine touch, remembering Ox may have a young daughter. But thinking it through, he probably wouldn't respond well to the request of introducing a hyper-violent homicidal maniac to her. When the demon himself comes tugging at the old man's pant leg, simply saying, martial arts. But Gohan tells him it's too late to train. With that, he barks, wanna eat, causing him to simply reply, wanna sleep when Goku's heart begins to thud as he appears to fall into a trance. Gohan bending down to see if the boy's okay. Tonight is the night the Saiyan would transform on the Earth for the first time. Running back to his home to fetch the Naoi bow. The situation gets more intense by the second. Gohan tries to think of something else he can do, and since the tail kind of stands out a bit, he thinks that may be his weakness. While we get an interesting origin to the rock-paper-scissors technique, the old-timer falls here to the mighty invader, who resumes his original goal, to kill all humans, stomping off into the night. For years, a savage beast has been destroying villages, methodically one after another, causing an entire continent to live in fear, as with each night of devastation, it is known to leave no survivors. But upon closer inspection, we see the one terrorizing these people is something we already know. A shadow casts down on a giant, ape-like footprint. As Roshi sighs, what a terrible sight this is. Appearing to him, the monster has no desire to eat or rest, only to kill, as his violence is not random. Krillin even producing a few tears at the sight, but contradicts his master's statement, as he points out the pigs were mostly devoured. The hermit replying that may be true, but the villagers weren't, signifying this creature has a penchant for death, only eating when necessary, and not eating what it doesn't like. Further theorizing, it conveniently goes missing between attacks. Maybe there's someone behind the beast controlling it. Either way, this time around, the monster didn't finish the job, as there are still houses standing, directing Krillin to venture into the forest to search for survivors, while he snoops around here a little more. But he warns, this enemy is no simple animal, it's a fierce and well-skilled killer. We're then confronted with a vision of a young boy's past. His mother training him only to kill, and abusing him to instill this message into him. Also, Raditz was there. Nudging the kid awake, Krillin checks to see if he's okay, questioning if he's from the village. But the stranger, only able to barely open his eyes to see the sun gleaming off his visitor's head, can only mutter, human? Before his opposite points back to the way he came from, explaining they should both return to the village and regroup with the Turtle Master, piquing the Saiyan's interest. Knowing this guy smells like a human, but inquires if he's actually a turtle, who spouts he is as a member of the famed turtle school. Goku, or Kakarot, merely piffs at this and walks away. But Krillin doesn't take it to heart, only thinking he must still be in great shock. After all, all his family and friends are… gone. And he's probably exhausted having run throughout the entire night. Surely, this is what must be causing his strange behavior. Catching back up with him, the bald hero suggests they stick together. Seeing a river nearby on his way here, he thinks the two of them should go wash up. Thinking for a moment, Kakarot remembers, of course, turtles love water. Soon after, they find themselves at a remarkable landscape. Not hesitating to jump in, Krillin actually gets a kick out of seeing how innocent his new friend is. Even though they're about the same age, he just acts so carefree. Speaking of carefree, Krillin decides to hop in himself. Kakarot is astonished to see the so-called turtle can remove a shell, causing the Saiyan to think he sure doesn't look human Plus, humans normally live in packs. Hitting him with a water gun. He screams for the stupid turtle to stop running. Krillin finding great humor in this, uncontrollably laughing as he tries to evade his pursuer. 
as the sun moves in the sky. Playtime is over. Figuring it's much better than what he was wearing before, he gifts Kakarot with his Orin Temple Gi. Just happy it fits, he thinks it suits him well. Back in the village, Roshi spots a victim who he recognizes, having faced him at the World Martial Arts Tournament around a year ago. But of course, as Jackie Chun, he would have even made it to the finals had he not landed in the same bracket as the Turtle Master. Knowing full well, he must have protected his people with all of his strength, but it still wasn't enough. Even getting a clue, his abilities went far past hand-to-hand -hand combat as an axe sticks in a rock. Then he gets curious about something, noticing rather small footprints on the ground. Deducing somewhat, he was able to make this monster disappear, only to fall to the fists of a man. The man who controls the beast. As the boys continue to walk, Kakarot has a question, inquiring why the turtle here is so nice. Insisting he call him Krillin, he explains it's normal to want to help those in need, shocked how alone Kakarot must have been, causing the Saiyan to look at the ground, uttering, he's always been alone. Krillin quipping, but we're friends now, right? Taking a modest pause, Kakarot has to think what that word even means. When the torment of his mother begins to push itself into the front of the young man's mind, screeching at him, his new friend is a human and must die. But he convinces himself the kid is actually a turtle, just an animal, and he doesn't have to kill him. Gritting his teeth thinking how much fun he had, and he doesn't want to be alone again. Admits this intense mental battle, Krillin formally inquires what Kakarot's name is, who simply replies with the easy answer, as his turtle friend ushers him back to what he believes is his village. Assuring, no monster is there anymore. Just as Master Roshi discovers, the boy's severed tail. Spotting a shell, Kakarot is amazed to find another turtle. As his companion shouts to his master, he's found a survivor. Turning to him, he congratulates Krillin on a job well done, before sympathetically bending down to speak to the young villager, begging he explain what happened here. But growing a cold stare, Kakarot grunts this man looks like a human, which of course he is. It's not something Roshi ever tried hiding. <laughs> Calling them imposters, the Saiyan's assault resumes, catching the hermit off guard. <laughs> While mostly in control, Roshi realizes quickly his foe's power is immense. Trying to put together the pieces, he thinks to last night when there was a full moon, asking the child if he knows anything about the tale he found who bellows, that's his. Krillin, finally interfering, tries to hold Kakarot back, but his master barks for him to get away from the crazed fighter, believing him to be some kind of new werewolf. Delivering a blow to his neck, the child is subdued for now, Roshi only hoping he wasn't too violent with that last attack. Despite this affront, the hermit still finds pity for the boy, his aggressive werewolf nature even shining through when there is no full moon. After seeing this sight of him, Krillin lets out a sigh at the thought that the two of them could have been friends. Not believing he'll wake up for a while, the old timer states it's their duty to bring him back to a peaceful frame of mind. But opening a single eye, Showing to be even more resilient than Roshi thought, he quickly dashes through the trees. Giving chase, the Turtle Master doesn't want to lose him in the jungle. Stopping at a cave, the pair still haven't lost sight. But it seems the boy may be luring them into a trap. Even Roshi himself points this out. Because it's too dangerous, he insists his students stay behind and only join in when they both emerge. Not liking this, Krillin agrees to do so nonetheless. Thinking to himself, the cave is host to endless darkness. This must be what the child wanted. Able to sniff out the Turtle Master. Roshi has some tricks of his own to evade his enemy in the dark. But unfortunately, not so much to sense his surroundings. That crack to the head bumping pretty good. He begins to feel this will be harder than he thought. Hearing all kinds of impacts from inside the cavern, Krillin visibly worries about his sensei, before listening to the cadence of a signature attack. But Kakarot emerges the winner, 
dragging the beaten body of Master Roshi. His lone student rushing over in disbelief. Tears fill his eyes as he bellows he wanted to save the savage child. But unfeeling, he looks into Krillin's soul, informing his mission is to kill all humans. And one day, he will kill him too. Walking past him and dashing back into the forest. Making his way through the trees, he stops momentarily, taking a look at the only human to call him friend, even if just for a day. Alas, the brainwashing he underwent as an infant proves too much for him to change his ways. Sobbing for his fallen mentor, he stammers through his sadness to speak his final words to Roshi, saying his master only wanted to save that boy, but he turned out to be nothing but a cold-blooded monster. Swearing, somehow, he himself will manage to stop Kakarot, and for humanity, his duty is to kill him. Not long before the arrival of Raditz, Earth is now shown to only bear host to a small pocket of animal life. The vast majority of, if not all, humans and humanoids are dead. What are you doing, Krillin? I'm coming to stop you, demon! You'll die, Krillin! You'll die like all the others! Take that! In that! Oh! I... See? Now you're dead, too. Earth, on October 12th, year 761, in Universe 13, Raditz beelines towards the planet. With Yamcha and Tien, the pair seem to be witnessing something terrible. And sure enough, the entire city has been destroyed, growling. It was him again! Determined to track down this monster, Tien and Jeans doesn't even sense a single survivor. As the pod lands, the Saiyan steps out, happy to breathe the same air as his little brother. And if what he's heard is true, this world should sell well. It doesn't take long for the duo to sense his presence, feeling his powerful aura. They dash in the invader's direction, worried this fiend has gotten even stronger. Yamcha pointing out, this actually feels like someone new. Quickly moving in, Raditz picks up on our heroes approaching, curious as to why this planet has any survivors. Scoffing that wasn't very conscientious of his younger sibling, but he'll take care of it himself. Coming face to face, Yamcha demands to know who this guy is, who only responds by commenting on their power levels, as they seem rather strong to be humans, supposing they use this strength to evade his brother. But determined to get an answer, he shouts back in anger to explain who he is. But the Saiyan only grins. What does it matter to you? You will die! Stupid humans! Not bad! Not good enough! Full fake fist! Yamcha! Helping his ally back to his feet, he questions if he's okay, who quietly urges, you run away. No! Stop it! Come on! It's over! You go! What? Stop it, Tien! That's enough! Away from the battle, Kakarot finds himself in the middle of a forest, gazing out into nothing. He wonders why he's alone again. When a deer comes up to him, reaching out, he thanks the creature for the visit. With a sickening cackle, the Saiyan monster strikes down the innocent animal. When something else gets his attention, these two! Ha ha ha! I'm coming! Ah! Tien! As the series of Kikohos did nothing to injure Raditz, he piffs at the idea that such a pitiful attack would have been enough to defeat him. Returning the advice, he weakly grunts for Yamcha to run. Shut up! Savagely kicking his head into the ground, Yamcha takes the opportunity to retreat. But his foe isn't about to let him get away. While searching, it seems the Earthling has managed to give him the slip. And having destroyed a scouter, Raditz grows furious at the situation, screaming to know where he's hiding. And below, Yamcha wonders what he should do as the villain screams. What if you won't come out? Then I'll make you! While he tries to evade the explosions. Looking for an escape, he's approached by someone else. Creepily licking his chops, the man utters, Yum! Tender flesh! And 
before Kakarot can do it. Raditz finishes off the Earthling, the Saiyan scowling. Hey! That human was mine! But in the air, Raditz is elated to see his brother. What's the? Huh? Where did he- <laughs> Sedating the Earth Dweller the old-fashioned Saiyan way, the invader can't believe how much like their father he looks. Chalking his attack up to the loneliness, he'll forgive his brother this time, but from now on, he'll have to obey. Throwing him into a pod he had on standby, the two venture back to the other Saiyan survivors. In this universe, Kakarot and Raditz would be reunited as planned, and upon joining forces with Nappa and Vegeta, what effect will this have on their reality? Frieza Planet 54 After subduing his brother and retrieving him from a desolated Earth, Raditz speaks with a member of the medical staff on Kakarot's condition. Most worrisome, it's blatantly evident he's suffering from several mental disorders, likely due to living alone his entire life, only chasing a singular destructive goal. But as Saiyans are, Raditz doesn't care for the details, only wanting to know if they can, quote, fix him. A pool, or another member of a pool's race, goes into how he was given sedatives to calm him down, for now. But as his brother, he will need to speak to him every day to work through these problems and bring his mind back to functioning order, believing his will is strong, and his sanity should return with time. Five days later, Them! There! Must kill! No, Kakarot! They're not under contract! Ten days later... Ah, use the cutlery, Kakarot! The what? I throw power! It goes boom! Twenty days later... You must concentrate your energy and know where it comes from for you to attack efficiently. While the sibling trains, Raditz has a conversation with somebody on his scouter, saying aloud he believes Kakarot is ready to join him. Although he isn't very strong, he's gotten back on track pretty fast. He simply needed some real Saiyan training. Ending the communication, we find out it was either Nappa or Prince Vegeta he was speaking to, and they'll be regrouping with them in less than a year. But this news only frustrates the savage warrior, not wanting to sit idly for that long, before asking if they had a planet to slaughter. But the more experienced fighter doesn't feel it's the best idea for only the two of them to attack, wanting to increase their numbers first. But pressing the issue, Kakarot questions if they really need these other guys. But in full transparency, his older brother tells, Nappa and Vegeta are each ten times stronger than either of them, and it's not enough to be the most powerful individuals on Frieza Planet 54, admitting that's why he searched for his younger sibling in the first place. As alone, he is nothing in the eyes of an elite. Showing not one for manners, of course, Kakarot quips, So without your lack of confidence, I'd still be on Earth. Going a bit Tyson Fury, or maybe Mike Tyson, on his foe and licking the blood from his face. This gives our forlorn hero an idea. To show them what they're really worth, the brotherly duo should stomp that planet before they even arrive. But bellowing out in laughter, Raditz points out the natives aren't weak like the Earthlings, and his power is a poultry 576. But Kakarot urges he check that scouter again. <laughs> Skyrocketing, for him at least, and now reads nearly three times as high at 1445. It seems there are things the lesser warrior has learned on Earth that he can teach his brother. Though impressive, they need a lot more for the world they're heading to. In fact, they aren't even powerful enough to control Cybermen, resolved to teach each other everything they know. Kakarot believes in six months they'll be making the power detector cry. But proving to have their work cut out for him, only four weeks later, Kakarot faces 13G gravity for the first time. Not much more intense than Planet Vegeta's pull, but he finds himself puking his guts out hands and knees on the ground. Another month would pass, and they may be pushing themselves too hard. But hey, a good beating can also help a Saiyan's progress. Raditz taught Kakarot the advantages of flying, how in the air, the weak points of an opponent change, and the ground is no longer a protector. The younger brother then tells his elder to set a scouter aside and scout for himself, feeling the energy of those nearby. Studying up, they learn the scientific process of how the full moon transforms them into Azarus. As Raditz states, there are no celestial satellites orbiting their target. Kakarot theorizes they don't need one, just the strange light the moon admits. Maybe they can harness it into some kind of device. Between that and the Cybermen, they'll trash that planet. And the Earth having sold well, Raditz was rewarded handsomely. If the engineers here could make some sort of tiny lamp. And finally, on the sixth month, they head towards planet Helior, host of the Hell Lights.
Quite a unique and remarkable world. Not only does it have no moons, but no star either. Lit and heated by a gigantic construction that simulates the job a sun would normally do. But given its shape, it does create a rather interesting sky. As on the ground, a message rings out to a few individuals. As an off-duty soldier scoffs, it appears the Kallax are attacking again. So unfortunately, his leave is cancelled. His family gripping him, crying he just got here. But nothing can be done as duty calls. His wife and daughter staring on as he flies away. The girl's mother grunts she's gonna go find her a new dad. Who couldn't be happier in the betrayal? Though familiar with fending off attacks, the Hellolites never expected to be invaded by an army of only two people. No, Kakaroth! I told you not this building! You didn't say anything about it! I said not the scientific instructions! Learn to recognize them! While the Saiyans squabble about what building is what, a couple of soldiers aim a giant weapon. Sprinting towards the action, the bloodthirsty Kakarot is excited to find more people to kill. Raditz warning to leave the ones in white coats alive. At the Heliors militaristic headquarters, an officer panically reports to his superior. The troops they sent were quickly slaughtered, leaving the commander to wonder just who these guys are. Resolved to send the Ultras to take care of them, but devastatingly, they're currently battling the Kallax on Anshot 1, and it'll take at least two days for him to return. Butting in, Another informs they actually do have one Ultra ready at the helm, as she just recently got back from a mission. With the invaders, Kakara still brushes up on his architectural education, inquiring what to do about the buildings with flags. Raditz snipping those are priority targets. Touching down, little brother questions where she came from. Continuing to mentor, the Elder states she's obviously an elite warrior, revealing the one called Fiend. Amazed to see they don't need weapons to fire energy. Kakarot quips. <laughs> Not that elite. Take this! <laughs> hey! She's a real pain in the ass! After vowing to teach Kakarot some manners and blocking the other with a shield, she shouts to the latter to explain who they are and to tell her everything, or she'll end his friend here. Raising his hand to the sky, he replies for her to tell him everything, or he'll put an end to this little city of hers. Asking, what? Raditz then realizes she doesn't have any information he needs. Decimating the surrounding area, Fiend protects herself with the energy shield. Grabbing her from behind, the warrior gasps he was out cold, but her brutal opponent scowls. He's been through much worse <laughs> on Earth, surely putting an end to the Heliore elite. Word of her demise making it back to headquarters. The commander demands every elite to be recalled from their missions. Grabbing his brother, Raditz decides it'd be a good idea to hide for a while as he regains his strength. Who can't help but giggle. <laughs> You destroyed all the scientific buildings! I saved your life, stupid! Several weeks have passed since the two Saiyans began their invasion. In the mothership, the Hell Light Resistance fiercely searches for the pair of monsters who murdered their comrade, not to mention plenty of other soldiers and civilians. The commander demands to know why their detectors haven't picked up their life force. Normally, it should be an effortless endeavor to locate them, but they've completely dropped off the radar, correctly believing this means they can hide their power her leader mumbling. Meanwhile, they can only sit on their hands, leaving it to four Ultras to take care of the problem, hoping it'll be enough. But the Ultras are pretty confident. After all, Fiend almost defeated them on her own, so against all of them, these villains stand no chance. Away, Raditz arrives to a small clearing in the middle of a forest, Kakarot asking if he found any meds, who luckily enough has, but knows it's only a matter of time before he's unable to steal them discreetly. Not hesitating to gulp down the entire bottle, he tosses it behind him, revealing about a dozen other empty containers, who then questions if he brought any food, who did this planet a favor by hunting a Gungan. Calling out the invaders are attacking again, the Ultras rush into action. Wigner, seemingly the leader, tells the others to lure them out of the city and not to hesitate when engaged in battle, as they have proven to be savage warriors. Laying waste while zipping down a street, Raditz barks at Kakarot, inquiring where he is, who's apparently still Goku somewhere deep on the inside, and a simple creature at that. When he sees food, he eats food, 
Taking a break for lunch amidst this destruction. Are you really? Immediately surrounded by the Ultras, Kakarot assumes they're just the same as the other and want to make them talk. Fire! You're way too slow. Over there! After them! There's more below. They can handle it. We'll get the other. What the? Transforming into Azarus, Kakarot growls. It looks like the blood lamps work well. Calling back to base, the ultra named LiDAR contacts HQ, stating their problem just got a whole lot hairier. Firing at the natives, the warrior finds his glove scuffed by the attack. Thinking this is surely impossible, nothing ever penetrates their shields. Theorizing the Saiyan's blasts may be different from the technology they know. The data collected from Fiend's battle indicated a small percentage was able to make it past her barrier. If it's as it appears, and these guys are much stronger now, things are going to get bad very fast. But the first goal is to keep them away from the city, as they fire at the great apes and fly away and attempt to put some distance between them and civilization. Kakarot questions if they should follow, but Raditz offers a lesson to his younger sibling. Innocent people make excellent shields. No! What are these creatures? I'll finish them myself. Go help the others. Not you. Ultra Waver! Incapacitated for now, the commander screams at Wigner for using the Ultra Waver in a populated area, demanding to know if he's lost his mind. But the soldier made sure the beast took the full impact of the blast, believing the Ultra Waver was the only thing strong enough to hurt these guys. And on an open line, the Burly Ultra gets this message loud and clear. Eat this! He's getting weaker! Returning to normal after having his tail destroyed, things are looking more and more grim for the Saiyans, as the Hell Light shouts out this newly discovered weakness to his team. The lone female warrior wants to end this now. That's what you think! Destroying the construction that acts as the planet's sun, pieces of the enormous structure fall to Heli or below, destined to impact the world with the same devastation as hundreds of meteors. Striking down the commander and the mothership in mere seconds. Laughing at his last ditch effort, Widner bellows out. He just killed everyone on the planet. As the innocent people in the city begin to panic even more, the great ape rushes over to his brother to shield him. As a massive explosion encapsulates the metropolis, the quick but immense violence finally comes to an end, leaving a dim and desolated world of what used to be one of the most technologically advanced societies in the universe. The Ultras all seemingly fallen. Though Kakarot appears relatively unscathed in comparison, smiling, he mutters, Population eliminated. Mission complete. With a click of his blood lamp, he returns to his humanoid form. And as his injuries are now more clear, Raditz is the one who really avoided the explosions. Unable to believe his brother actually protected him, shouting how he managed to resist all of that. The Saiyan coughs he didn't, before losing consciousness and falling to the ground. Raditz frantically yelling at him to answer in concern. But Wigner pulls himself from the rubble his civilization destroyed. He takes aim at the invaders. Bastards, you won't survive this! <laughs> Nappa and Vegeta finally make their way to Helior, right on time. Actually, a bit early. But judging by the look on his face, Raditz is not completely happy to be saved. As the prince screams, demanding to know what these idiots have done. Still alive, Kakarot gives the best attempt at a smile he can, technically accomplishing what they set out to do. He announces they've captured the planet and it's ready for sale. Sale? Sale? What do you think is left to sell here?
after recovering Raditz and Kakara from their farce on Helior. The group of Saiyans grub up at an alien restaurant, in a better universe than ours. Vegeta screams at the odor of the low-class warriors, barking their antics have made Frieza fiercely angry. Nappa booming, he wanted to obtain the secrets of the Hell Lights, and they destroyed them all like the idiots they are. Adding, the Emperor is also annoyed in Kakarot being retrieved from Earth without a prior consultation. Curious why, the burly warrior informs he didn't want the Wayward Saiyan to be influenced by the three of them. Kakarot cracks that actually makes sense, given the trio aren't very respectable. But upon reflecting back to the days before Planet Vegeta's destruction, at least in this story, Frieza intended Kakarot to simply die on Earth over time. Regardless, Vegeta explodes that makes two disobediences in a row, and he's going to kill all of them for sure. The naive fighter piffing, why not just beat him up? You idiot! Frieza's stronger than us by a buttload! But Kakarot continues to find humor in his own arrogance, assured he's killed plenty of guys just like him back on Earth. Sure, he'll lose once or twice, maybe even three times, only to return stronger than ever before. The prince taking solace and at least he's discovered the Zenkai boost. He resolves to seek an audience with their ruler, just he and Kakarot here. The fool snarking to himself, he'll easily take out Frieza during that meeting, which will sort all of this out. Though his attitude quickly changes in the presence of his emperor. In his headquarters with Zarbon and Dodoria, the tyrant screams echo in the hollow room, shrieking the Saiyans are a pathetic, disgraceful example of supreme incompetence, imbecilic, arrogant monkeys who, daring to cut him off, Vegeta shares the dictator's frustrations, declaring it is indeed the fault of these Saiyans. You can't behave properly! Betraying and decapitating Kakarot with a single swipe of the hand. Pleading, he make amends for their failures, offering to also kill Raditz and Nappa immediately. But he himself will remain Frieza's loyal servant, no longer suffering the influence of hopeless Saiyans. Of course, having a slight bias in the prince's favor, the emperor agrees to this request. If he brings them the bodies of the other two, his incompetence will be forgiven. Seeing the bigger picture, Zarbon can't help but respect Vegeta's savvy, admitting it's pretty low to deflect Frieza's anger in such a way, but well played nonetheless. He even has the goal to contact Nappa on his scouter as he walks out, inquiring where Raditz is, who has no idea, but assumes he's off training somewhere. His superior commanding he be found, and the two of them return to their quarters within the hour. And sure enough, 60 minutes later he comes stomping in, ready to carry out what it takes for him to survive. But something causes him to turn white as a ghost upon entering. Kakarot is alive, and a bit nettled at having his head cut off and all. Nervously sneering, that's impossible. His counter spouts a hearty grin, snorting instead of betraying his own kind. How about becoming immortal, like himself? Together, they can all get stronger and surpass his ruler. Snapping out of his stupor, the prince demands to know how he obtained such an ability. Raditz urging he explain en route. For now, they need to immediately flee this world before Frieza catches wind. Escaping, the Saiyans head towards the SG sector, an area where Frieza's forces have been pushed back from. With any luck, it will offer relative peace. After changing ships many times, in a bid to throw the oppressors off their trail, Kakarot tells his story in person to the elite warriors. Vegeta convinced these Dragon Ball things can't possibly exist, though the low class Saiyan urges, and yet, their effects are apparent firsthand. Nappa fully buys into the idea, excited to go to Earth to find them. Alas, they don't work anymore, turning to stone ages ago. Before, they only used to be rocks for a single year. Either way, the prince knows Frieza would immediately spot them if they go to Earth. As Raditz enters through a door, when questioned on what his informant had to say, it seems Kakarot's description of the Dragon Balls has caught some interest, wanting to take the Saiyans to his master's planet to learn more. A few days pass. As some kind of militaristic compound, Raditz admits he's getting cold feet, sensing too many high powers here. His brother deducing, this master is being guarded by a group of strong warriors. Politely welcoming the outsiders in, Angela of Lord Slug's demon clan, who quells, his master is eager to meet them. Introducing his overlord properly, Angela presents the strangers to Lord Slug, powerful emperor of Sector SG. But something else has caught Kakarot's eye, a Dragon Ball, reaching out for it. Vegeta gives him a bunk on the head, commanding he restrain himself. The Namekian, taking great interest in their knowledge, inquires where they have seen the orbs. 
getting another pap to the face. Kakarot begins to blurt out on planet Earth, but the prince knows a bit more about how negotiations work. Contending, Slug first reveal where he found the Dragon Balls, and all of this will be a lot less painful. And it seems that is exactly what his henchmen were waiting for. Raditz pleads for Vegeta to calm down, knowing full well these guys are much stronger than the four of them, asking how he could possibly know that. Slug mumbles for his men to get these imbeciles to talk. Be reasonable and surrender, rather than put up a futile resistance. Ow! Surrender? That's not our style! Then, assume the consequences! I'm much stronger than Raditz! You'll need more than your silly punches to knock me out! Oh, he knows it! Huh? It's time to put you back! In your place! Get out of my sight! Now, it's your turn! I'm gonna make you eat your teeth! No thanks! Enough! Painlessly neutralizing the Saiyans, the room suddenly falls into a quiet standstill before Slug calls out, You, village idiot, come. Using his kinesis, he ushers Kakarot his way. Grabbing his head, he insists he will tell him everything. Where we learn, he was granted immortality by Shenron, created by the one named Kami, who is dead now. And thus, the Dragon Balls. Snatching the helmet from his head, it's only now discovered to our characters. This man is a Namek. Kakarot astonished to see he looks just like Kami. Vegeta also surprised in this revelation. With everything they need, Angela proposes. Their guests are still important prey for Frieza, believing it would be a wise diplomatic gift to deliver them straight to him. That is, if they're of no further use here, as their current defenses are still not enough to withstand a large attack from his empire. Liking this idea, his only request is they remain alive, for now. In a massive complex, the Saiyans find themselves locked away. Raditz beckoning Vegeta if he's able to break his restraints, who of course, is certain he can. So the lesser thinks the best plan is to make an escape when sufficiently healed. Having studied these people during their time in captivity, he's noticed the powerful bodyguards are gone, unable to feel their energies anywhere nearby. Nappa shouting they really need to teach them that ability. Later. Ha 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 ha! You're dead! Dead! You're all dead! Kill the humans! Watching the show before him, the prince has to ask if he always screams in his sleep like this, which is met with a reluctant, yup. Regardless, feeling the time is now, Vegeta braces himself to break out, just as Raditz warns he wait, sensing someone coming. One of the intellectuals of the compound, either Gaioshu or Kakuji. We'll just guess Gaioshu because they're almost identical. Who, in a surprise, reveals he's on their side, pleading they flee the planet together. Releasing the gang, Vegeta leers why he would help them, who tells he is merely a slave here. In return for his assistance, all he wants is to be dropped off on his home planet. Waking his brother, he alerts they're heading out. Huh? Now? We're running away? Activating his personal blood lamp, the slave utters they must remain quiet until reaching the ship. There are guards there, but should be nothing compared to the Saiyans. It's only important they kill them before they can activate the alarms. Once again pleading to everyone, remain very discreet. <laughs> Get lost, stupid irons! Oh, for the love of- Smashing his way through the prison, nearby soldiers go into full-blown defense mode. The captive of Slug running for dear life, while the others pick off guards one by one. Vegeta screaming to Raditz he's going to kill his brother. But... Flying towards the action, Slug's demon clan is still around after all. Metamacha diving for Nappa, mocking if he'd like to go another round. But following the near-death experience from before, he's much stronger. And now, he knows all his opponent's moves. Panically asking how this is happening. Nappa wastes no time in taking him out, but manages to quip the same techniques can't be used on a Saiyan twice. Angela arriving, wondering where a monster like this could have come from, but also ready for revenge. Lagging behind his comrades, Ziyun only thinks what a mess it is up ahead, convinced they need his help. But scoring a twofer, 
left unconscious by dumb luck, or maybe even a very calculated move by Kakarot. Returning to his… modest form? Kakarot asks where their spaceship is, but without a clue amidst all this chaos, they'll just have to steal a new one. Zooming off world, they manage to get away. Inside, while Raditz takes the controls, still with their eyes on the prize, Nappa believes it's clear the Dragon Balls and Namekians are somehow linked. So the next destination will be Planet Namek itself. Gaiosu informing he is able to hide any tracking Slug may have had on the ship, so they should be, essentially, invisible to him. Also pointing out the Namics live in isolation and have zero technology, so they should be able to remain hidden for a good while. Satisfied with this, the Saiyans are ever closer to getting their wish. Meanwhile, back at the remains of Helior and Frieza's quarters, a soldier alerts they have found the Saiyans, as well as their intended destination. Bellowing out. <laughs> I won, suckers! We're at the moment where Vegito allowed himself to be absorbed by Super Buu in the original series, and given the title, The Birth of Vegito, it may be safe to assume this is Vegito's Universe 16 in the Multiverse Tournament. Using a shield of key, our hero believes he's in the clear, at first thinking to lower the barrier, but in this iteration, he decides against it, just a gut feeling. Searching around, it doesn't take him long to find his friends. Reducing Super Buu back to his more brutish form, decreasing his strength dramatically, the fused fighter goes to look for an escape. Turning around, he sees Fat Buu, just as his foe makes his appearance. Talking to himself, he notes this is the one that was eaten after being transformed into junk food. Maybe while he's in here, he can find more who were absorbed that way as well. Overhearing his idea, Super Buu admits the other Majin was a special exception. There are no others besides him absorbed in such a way. Wondering what was going on, he declares Vegito is quite the tenacious one, and having the audacity to remove his cocoons, he will pay dearly. With a smirk, Vegito taunts for his enemy to bring it, he'll just blow a big hole in his body. But returning the cockiness, Boo doesn't believe he'll be able to. Confused has attacked very little. Turns out, our hero is so small, his strength means nothing. In fact, even in his powered down form, Boo claims to have the advantage. But, because why not? Vegito grabs hold of Fat Boo's cocoon, resolving to merely reduce his host's strength even further, causing him to go into a frenzied panic, screaming for his adversary to stop it and let the other Boo go. Liking the look of dread on his face, Vegito finds the situation very interesting. As the Majin goes on to yell, if that one is removed, he won't be himself anymore. No! Ripping it out of place, Super Buu falls to the floor, as the Saiyan knows it's time to leave. Realizing his surroundings are narrowing, whatever his foe is going to transform into, it seems to be happening sooner than later. Finding an escape, everyone returns to normal, placing his family and friends in a safe area. Oddly enough, Vegito actually senses an increase in energy from the Majin. Not as much as when Gohan was absorbed, but nonetheless unexpected. Becoming Kid Buu, our hero now senses a drop in power, noting how peculiar this all is. But still, at least he's less dangerous now. Randomly letting out a blast that could have easily destroyed the planet, the fused warrior realizes how crazy this new creature is. Vegito knows he has to finish this quick. And chomping away bit by bit, soon there is no more Majin left to destroy causing the Kaios to shout out in victory. As the others begin to regain consciousness, our hero questions if they're feeling okay. But upon laying eyes on the fusion, all three have to ask, Dad? Not really addressing the confusion at hand, Vegito simply inquires if Dende can arrange gathering the Dragon Balls, so all the innocent lives lost can be wished back. And while it'll take another four months for them to be restored, he'll do what he can in the time being. 
and a few days later, they would be gathered. The Namek even able to activate them early, undoing all the harm and destruction caused by Majin Buu. But not everyone's lives could return to normal, as there is no Goku or Vegeta anymore, only Vegito. Trunks rejecting this man, claiming he is not his father, who admits that's true. But he does have as much love for Trunks as his father did, for both the son and Brie family actually, causing some initial discourse between Chi Chi and Bulma. But letting out a laugh and shedding a tear, Chi Chi asks what she's thinking. Goku's been dead for seven years now, and she isn't going to steal Bulma's husband, merely requesting Vegito come and visit them and remain a father to Goten, which he is happy to do so. With this, life would resume, keeping his promise and being a father to two households, constantly teleporting between the two. He and Bulma would have a daughter with enormous potential, and around the same time, Pan was born to Videl and Gohan. A few years later, they both became students of Vegito, ushering in a whole new adventure of their own. Kabiru Planet, X Frieza 38. A party of some sort seems to be taking place, as Brawl, Pan, and Vegito stand by, not appearing to be enjoying themselves greatly. Suddenly, Vegito pipes, buffet lunch 3 o'clock, while looking to his nine. Grabbing a small bite, Brawl doesn't know what the heck they're doing here, scoffing at the idea it's supposed to be some kind of diplomatic mission, and it only feels like a waste of proper training time. Then hearing, Oh, what a ravishing goddess! As, who looks to be Pizza the Hut from Spaceballs approaches, stating it to be an honor to host the daughter of the great Vegito-sama, greeting her with a kiss to the hand. <laughs> Brawl clearly has more of Vegeta's personality than Goku's, but her father calmly requests she not assault the diplomats. In age 774 on Earth, two Saiyan warriors, among the most powerful in the universe, fuse thanks to the sacred Pataras of the Kaioshins, thus creating Vegito, the strongest being of all time. Resolved to aid the Kais, he was tasked with handling conflicts across the universe. None of his foes ever survived. He quickly became known to every civilized world as a great warrior, some even revering him as a god. As he trained his two companions, Pan and his daughter Brawl. At the latter's birth, the fused warrior held his child with pride, asking if his wife has any names in mind, Brawl being the only one. Thinking to himself, Brief, Bulma, Trunks. Ah, now it makes sense! In Universe 16, age 778. Pointing out she has a tail, Vegito pleads they let her keep it, having never seen Trunks with one. Though Bulma has one question. Is becoming a totally insane giant monkey hellbent on destroying cities and attacking friends a trait only unique to Goku when he transform, or is it common among all Saiyans? In an extended fantasy sequence, we find Uzaro Brawl manhandling her older brother, who shouts to his father his sister is bothering him. And in accordance to Namekian Battle Law, Section 372-B, Piccolo has lost one of his arms. Being held up by Gohan, he stutters he must save the planet. But the half-breed can't hit his own niece. She's not even a month old. Or is it his sister? Half sister. Even the great scholar doesn't know. Clamoring for Vegito to do something, he snaps back into reality, just love struck him by how healthy his daughter is. Returning to actual reality, amidst the awkward silence, Bulma questions what he's thinking about, then asks his wife if she plans on staying in bed for long. Pointing out his endless compassion, she reminds that childbirth is a rather demanding experience. Trying to make heads or tails of it, Bulma then piffs at how clueless he is. Thinking back to about 41 years ago, on planet Vegeta, a young prince happens in on a female Saiyan, going at a punching bag. Noticing his presence, she happily greets him. Confused, Vegeta thought she was due to deliver her baby today, informing, well yeah, but that was like hours ago, earlier this morning. The boy believing it to be a more difficult task, the woman merely continues her training, growling, what do I look like, a sissy? Then Vegito realizes, Saiyan and humans differ a tad in durability. Holding the infant, he questions if Bulma still has a scouter, knowing she repaired one long ago. Rolling her eyes, she reminds that the one that belonged to Raditz blew up. But she did make another, and it's in the cave, or closet, at home. Teleporting away, leaving the baby to freefall, Bulma grits her teeth in fear. But she only manages to travel about an inch downward, before her father makes it back. Turning the scouter on, 
Vegito wants to get an exact read on his daughter's power, a direct numerical figure, registering in at 13,568. The Saiyan fills with excitement, mocking, Take that, Broly! In your face! Standing, Bulma inquires if that's good. Burying a giant grin, her husband confirms it is. Chortling, she could easily squash Nappa from back in the day. And what Bulma knows about Nappa is that Tien and Chaozu died using their most powerful techniques against the alien invader, and it didn't even hurt them. Confused on why that's a good thing, Vegito misunderstands, assuring her not to worry, as she'll get way stronger. Bulma then picks up the phone to cancel on the babysitter. And that's how Sun Brawl joined the Brief family. Her adventures were only beginning. Looking at a card from Gohan and Videl, it reads, You're invited to visit Sun's family to see our little Pan, born yesterday. Tien being a little put off by the invitation. Age 780. Speaking up, Gohan humbly states he would like Piccolo to be Pan's godfather. He wanted to ask for Goten, but his mother was against it. All over the place, looking down at her daughter with a blushing face, Videl excitedly exclaims that she could one day become a great ruler, or a dancer, or a novel writer. Gohan pondering, maybe a scientist, or archaeologist, when a third voice chimes in. I see her as a space cop, crushing monsters and beating Frieza like scum, exploding one or two planets from time to time. Narrowing their eyes, naturally, this rationale is a combination of Goku and Vegeta. This Vegito had found his two pupils, who were going to help him retain order in the universe. Holding both Brawl and Pan in each hand, he realizes they take a bit to grow, don't they? Requesting if they can just toss him in the room of spirit and time for a few days, to the disinterest of the others. Five years later, Universe 16, age 785, in what may be the Break Wasteland, the area Piccolo first trained Gohan, Vegito calls for the girl's attention, explaining today it'll be a small and quiet course because Videl insisted on coming along, wondering why, but oh well. But Pan's mother says she needs the exercise, and she should be able to keep up with the two of them at their young age. Laughing at the thought, the Saiyan ushers the gang to warm up by taking a full lap around the planet. Rising to the sky, Pan beckons her mother if she's coming, who only now realizes what she's gotten herself into. Taking off, she can't even see him anymore. Falling back to the ground, she does some stretching, determined to get in that exercise one way or another. Just moments later, Vegito and the girls arrive back, Pan elated to see her mother. The girl then revealing, her mom was so fast and far ahead, they couldn't even see her. Koi, Videl mutters, er, yeah, fast, that's it. Grinning, the Patara prodigy requests they get serious now, to the horror of our human friend. But she decides she'll just sit and watch them for the rest of the day and get some exercise another time. As Vegito strolls away, satisfied no one will ever interfere with their training again. As a massive war takes place, our hero arrives accompanied by his daughter. This is Nagriga, a planet in constant war. Coaching, he instructs his student to stop the battle. She must hit him, but only a little, and be very careful. The inhabitants here are quite fragile. She can destroy the tanks, but only if no one is inside. And if someone shoots at her, don't take it personally. Probably a bad idea to break the weapons too. They seem to be filled with some kind of toxic gas. When someone in the distance shouts, Hey, did you see that? Continuing to give his daughter guidance, he suggests she toss any explosives into the sky, as they could hurt anyone else nearby. But in the background, the folks here seem to know who this warrior is. A bit too well, in fact. Turning to get started, the pair find every last soldier bowing at the space cop's feet in surrender. Telling her to just forget about it, she didn't understand anything he was saying anyway. Universe 16, 775, at Capsule Corps. Trunks lies in bed, awfully nervous about something. Shouting, Dad, there's a monster under my bed! I'm scared! In the room below, Vegito sits back at ease while Bulma urges he check on him. But he can detect energy of all living things and feel the tiniest vibration within a mile radius. There isn't any monster under his bed. Same year, Universe 18. The same scenario plays out. But this time with Vegeta entering, explaining to his son that if there is a monster under his bed, then he must destroy it like the rest of his enemies. And same universe, same time, somewhere else on Earth, Goten has the same issue. Screaming before Goku zips in within a millisecond, excitedly asking where this monster is. 
knocking the boy out of his bed to check under it. He chimes. Mr. Monster! Are you here? Yoo-hoo! Before overcome with disappointment, there actually is no monster. Universe 16 and 18, 10 years later. As Pan cries out, Gohan is the only father with a normal response. Ruffling his daughter's hair to comfort her, he assures that if there was a monster under her bed and it was dangerous for her, then the entire world would be in danger. Which I guess is better than the other's reaction. Not the most comforting though. Going through the joke one final time, only in Universe 16, you're 789. After a mission, Sun Bra sleeps on Xylon 38, feeling something amiss. She grabs a bulking monster by the throat, demanding to know what he's doing in her room. Calling for his father, he cries there's a monster on his bed and he's scared. Unfortunately, little as a little, stepped in the wrong room. Vegeta was born in the year 774. From the fusion of the two strongest warriors in the galaxy, he'd have more and more adventures to come. Whether as a space cop or target of forgotten beings, where Goku would attract monsters, Vegito attracts gods and anomalies from the very depths of space. And as the years would pass, his precious brawl would have a few emotional problems, coupled with danger and destruction, potentially close to that of Boo and Broly. As for Vegito himself, his Saiyan blood boils, lacking an adversary to match him. Around the same time in our universe when Goku leaves to train Oob. But here, of course, no such event would take place. On her own personal mission, young Brawl soars through the sky. But where could she be going? Touching down in Satan City, she enthusiastically runs to a house nearby. Opening the door, it's Gohan, who playfully asks who's there, before joyfully looking down to see Brawl. Cutting right through the cordial nonsense, she knows he could sense her approaching because she was not hiding her energy. Furthermore, she wants to know why he just called her Bra. A miss? He answers, because that's your name? In a huff, the youngster resentfully lectures that she is his sister and wants to be called Sun Bra. She is also part of the family. Her brother reminds names don't define who someone is. Besides, Bulma really doesn't like it. Pouting. Gohan realizes Brawl has not come to play with Pan. The two having a friendly spar in the sky. The more experienced fighter comments how strong his little opponent is, causing her to bulk. Those words is not something she hears often apparently, but her brother swears she really is. This prompts her to question why it is she can't beat him then. Why can't she turn into a Super Saiyan? Why are he and their father so invincible? Trying to make this a life lesson, Gohan reprimands she's only six. At that age, none of them even came close to the power she possesses. Heck, Goten and Trunks were a special case of their own, and even they don't graze her strength. However, the stubborn young child refuses to wait, despising the feeling of being powerless. She's found a way of her own to break through. Letting her emotions overcome her, she sobs he always wins. She's so weak. Transforming. She tells her elder she wants to go another round. Bro, no! Never shoots! Towards the ground! In a fight, there are no rules! The pretty much omnipresent Vegito, though off-world, senses full well what's going on with his daughter. But rest assured, Gohan will be able to take care of it. His friend here on the ground grumbles. Is there a problem, Mr. Policeman? It seems our fused warrior enjoys venturing through space, getting into the occasional shenanigans. The half saying warning if she doesn't calm down right now, he's going to stop her by force. This has gone far past what is safe for everyone nearby. But blinded by her own emotions and immaturity, the fact Gohan was not even using his full force before makes her ever the more furious. Easily, albeit not without rattling his nerves, he is able to put an end to Brawl's tantrum, rushing her to the lookout. Dende heals her. Luckily, her injuries were bad, but nothing life-threatening. Glancing around, she asks what happened and how they got here. Her father chiming in off-screen. Disappointed in her ability to maintain awareness and clarity, he tells her she has a self-control problem that needs to be taken care of. Ushering her to the room of spirit and time, Vegito instructs her to transform into a Super Saiyan. However, she can't do it on command. 
explaining she needs to be angry. Immediately pinpointing the issue, strong emotions work great to initially awaken the form, but after unlocking it for the first time, she needs to be in control. If she fails to master this, she's just as much of a danger to herself and everyone around her as their enemies are. Exclusively for this exercise, though, she can get as angry as she needs to be. As in here, there are no innocent bystanders to get in the way. Pondering on what he can do to make her mad. Outside, knowing the man well, Gohan only hopes their father isn't doing anything foolish in there. Having already been 10 minutes, that means just over two days have passed for them. Getting a sensation of unease, he thinks it'd be a good idea to check in to see how things are going. Swinging the door open, Vegito growls, that stupid brat! Obviously, the Vegeta side in the driver's seat. He vents to Gohan that she doesn't listen, she doesn't cooperate, and actively makes everything harder than it needs to be. Goku apparently taking the wheel by giving up an instant transmission in a way, as any fine father would do. As Gohan makes his way into the chamber to see what he can do, the others left wondering where Vegito could have run off to. And by the look on Bulma's face, it seems this type of behavior is just as typical of Vegito as it was of Vegeta. Kneeling down to comfort his little sister, he informs he'll be the one taking care of her training from here on out, questioning if she's hungry. As relatable as anyone, she snips she's always hungry, prompting him to request she turn into a Super Saiyan and follow him. Dejected, she lowers her head muttering she's not in the mood, inferring she's about as down with how the lesson is going as Vegeta was. Knowing how to press her buttons, he smirks, trunks his outside and says she fights like a girl. Mentorial manipulation done right, he then tells her she'll be staying this way all the time from now on, with only the exception of sleeping. This is how he himself prepared to master the form too. Cooking a dinner well above the ones he and Goku shared while training for the Cell games, he assures Brawl the anxiousness and intensity lessens with time. Also, for the short term, the two of them will simply live here for a little while. He's brought movies, books, board games, even Pan is gonna join him any minute now. Though, as her father's daughter, in more ways than one as she goes to town on a bowl of rice, she merely prefers training. None of that other stuff is all too fun. Compromising, he agrees to train a little too, but only for a limited time per day. While sparring and getting stronger is important, it's not the direct subject of why they've come here. Not much later, Pan walks into the chamber herself, happy to see her friend. By the looks of it, Videl didn't spare any supplies they could possibly need while here. Gazing up above her head, with eyes as wide as the oceans, she asks if she can. Not even having to finish the sentence, Brawl kneels down for her, technically niece, to feel her Super Saiyan hair. Gohan does well to keep the three of them entertained, while his sister, knowingly or not, grew used to her transformation. Who even finds a way to discover interest in activities that aren't fighting. This acting as a way to make Brawl take her conscious mind off her own incredible power and learn how to control it completely. Although, Gohan would have to steal a few lessons from Piccolo. Before too long, their training was finished, the youngster appearing to have a sense of calm and tranquility while maintaining her raw power. Emerging, student become mentor questions the Namek how long they were in there, but since the door is left open, the amount has been the same for each side. Calling many of Earth's heroes to the lookout, it seems the final lesson for Brawl is to make a statement to her friends and family on what she's learned, who reluctantly apologizes for almost destroying the planet, promising not to do it again. Although, with a typical lemon face, at least a sliver of this comes off as genuine regret. Though her father wants to stress test her word, asking if she'll be able to stay calm while transformed, and while fighting the most annoying person of all time. Without skipping a beat, she asks if that's why they brought Trunks here. Close, but it's actually Gotenks, who immediately jumps into character, jaunting it'll be an honor for her to spar with him. Sighing he is annoying, but way too weak for her, which angers the fused fighter, threatening to finish this little baby with only 1% of his power. Struggling more than he thought he would, Bulma has to remind Trunks to go easy on his sister. Eat that, brat! You eat that, with the cherry on top! Brawl's anger looking like it's getting the best of her. Gotenks shouts for everyone he'll take care of it, but the ensuing explosion will definitely destroy the lookout, screaming for everyone to get to safety. 
Vegito ready to jump into action. Gohan places his arm in front of him, urging he not move. When she disappears, Gotenks not even able to trace where she went. Sneaking up and pantsing him from behind. He can only swing wildly and miss the embarrassment, while a carefree brawl giggles away. Pan pointing to him and questioning what he's doing wearing underwear like that for. Who feverishly squabbles he doesn't choose what he wears. Charging a Kamehameha, he vows to reduce the child to ashes. When Vegito wisely chooses to intervene, not lost in the irony of the situation. Appearing dumbfounded, at least that can be said for one of them. Brawl taunts, it looks like Gotenks is the one losing his cool here. Making leaps of progress to pass her final test with flying colors. Confidently, Gohan deems their training a resounding success. With her newfound discipline, the Z Fighters have yet another hero in training of unprecedented potential. Meanwhile, in the world of the Kais, peering in on their mortal friends through a crystal ball, Kabito Kai finds great relief in seeing Vegito's little girl getting herself under control, knowing how bad things could have gotten if her impulsiveness went unchecked. Old Kai in agreement. At least, for now. But something doesn't sit right with the old timer. Very curious and concerned how exactly her life will play out. Six years after some brawl entered the room of spirit and time in order to take control of her emotions, Vegito is assigned to yet another mission by the Kaioshins. At first, he believes they're kidding and bringing up there's a new enemy, growing bored at the lack of a challenge since the defeat of Super Buu, which in itself wasn't too difficult for the fused fighter. Old Kai is a bit annoyed in his carefree attitude, as this opponent is actually their own fault. The most evil minds in the universe gathered to create a warrior capable of stopping Vegito once and for all. Having searched diligently for the location of their foe, they have narrowed it down to exactly four places he could possibly be. Each of these areas are not only well protected, but also linked. When one is entered, the other three will be aware. If any become privy to Vegito's presence, they'll quickly teleport to a new unknown area. To make things clear, this means our hero must search for them all at the same time. Shrugging, he quips he can just do it really fast, but that won't be good enough. Before mentioning they could simply use the Dragon Ball, which is met with a stern shouting to not even bring up the Dragon Balls. The next day, Vegito has gathered many of our heroes to travel in separate groups, each consisting of at least one warrior who can use instant transmission, or like technique. In the first party, it'll merely consist of himself alone. The next, Gohan, Old Kai, and for some reason Videl, who our main character confusedly questions why she's here to begin with. With a smile, she thought it looked like fun, though Vegito assures it won't be, before then asking what's up with these stupid costumes. Obviously, the bad guys should not see our faces! And the third group, Pan and Trunks will pair alongside Kibito Kai, the former hollering in excitement at her first solo mission. Trunks reminds a three-warrior team isn't exactly solo. Pausing, the young girl appears bewildered, as she meant it'll be her first time going on a mission without people stronger than her. Flustered, her elder spouts, he is so stronger than her! Finally, the last group will be Goten and some bra, who isn't too thrilled about having a babysitter. The old Kai attempts to quell, groups of two or more are actually better than being alone, as he instructs whoever is first to find their adversary, immediately alert the others. The rambunctious young lady inquires if she can just try to beat him up first, but he shouts she must tell her allies using telepathy. No need to prepare any further, Vegito instructs everyone to get in position. Guiding some brawl, Kibito Kai assists her with locking onto the location, who appears to still be learning to master the technique. But with that settled, everyone is ready to go. Some a bit more than others. Standing on his head to teleport, Gohan is a bit skeptical of the old timer's stance, but he assures this is the true ancient way. Intruders detected. Teleporting all bases now. Realizing the surroundings have changed, the Kai points out their foes teleported the base, but have brought all of them along. Now they shouldn't be able to escape. Elsewhere, a strange cube of magic water appears in space, around a mile end to end in every direction. Our hero annoyed why he had to get the underwater location, before hearing a voice vibrating like a thousand miniature waves, who proclaims this is the end of his existence. 
taunting him there in his head, and the powerful warrior will not be able to destroy him, as he'll have to face his greatest fear in order to escape this illusion. Revealing what he's afraid of most, one of his own becoming stronger than even himself, slowly walking towards the path of destruction, the universe annihilated by his own progeny. Vegito's daughter, governed by evil. Interrupted with a whack to the face. This creature can't believe he could strike his own daughter without hesitation. But she, or it, said it themselves. This is only an illusion. So what's the issue? Huh, interesting. <laughs> Believing the lack of oxygen will be Vegito's downfall. Besides, whether it's by magic, technology, or anything else, pure power defeats everything. But right now, this illusion would need to be at least a thousand times stronger in order to win. With Old Kai and the others, Gohan marvels at a medieval-style castle, just like the ones from way back when back home. A savage-looking beast charges right for him, but they can't sense any significant power on this planet. Videl asks if they should just let themselves into the compound. Old Kai feels that'd probably be the quickest way to get things moving. When a man calls after him, commanding these trespassers lay down any weapons and put their hands in the air. Technically, flinging the only nearby object that could be considered a weapon towards the castle guards. The general orders the men to fire. Gohan shouts for the old timer to get behind him so he can be protected from the onslaught of arrows. One of which hitting him in the head and more or less falling apart on impact. The elderly Kai jostles. He believes sometimes they forget he is a god. Coming back to his senses, Gohan feels if these people honestly think little pieces of wood and iron are anything to worry about, their warrior can't really be all that strong. But the Kaioshin theorizes they must have some kind of powerful, secret art, and maybe that's why they can't sense him. As a song carries through the wind, a mysterious woman chants in an unknown language summoning a mystical force out of thin air, bringing her chanting to a crescendo. Gohan braces himself for whatever could be coming next. After destroying their foe, and everything behind them, with the most mediocre of attacks, Old Kai begins to suspect whoever they're looking for is not here. Though Gohan appears slightly more proud of himself than he probably should be. A henchman makes his way through the corridor, calling out to his fellow soldiers if they know why they teleported just now. Happening into the wrong room, Pangeers. I think they have an idea, yes. Scampering away, he contacts the others to quickly send in the warrior. A large gate opens, leaving a pair of frigid eyes to peer in on our heroes. They're so stealthy, they don't even notice his approach. Trunks taps into the compound's computer, finding this is the same facility that mechanized Frieza a long time ago. It's possible they created the warrior they're after. Yes, they did! I am Gorkor the Great, turned invisible! I now have a power higher than Frieza himself! Or maybe not. Pan excitedly asks if this is who they've come for, but Trunks is pretty dismissive. Though the kid makes a good argument, he could be hiding his power. After all, he is supposedly part machine now. Kabito Kai agrees. Her idea isn't unheard of, but in this scenario, it's simply not the case. Uh, hey! Really not wanting to give up on her optimism, she then suggests he could have magic. But again, the Kai assures he would have sensed it. With one last theory, she. Hey! Don't ignore me! I'll crush you all! <laughs> Let me go, or I'll kill this thing! With the mighty Gorkor the Great Slain, we're left to only wonder about the fate of Vegito and the group of some brawl on Goten, whose adventure has been a relatively quiet one up until now. In a small, snow globe-like enclosure in orbit of a giant planet, the pair gaze at their surroundings, Goten and all at the sight before them. We're all not quite as impressed. Noticing they have air in here, it's reason the force field around them is acting as an artificial atmosphere. Sensing through the area, the young girl can feel billions of life forms on the world nearby. 
Goten disgruntled, the villains will probably try to use him as a human shield. As someone scoffs what the kids are doing here, demanding to know where Vegito is. Another in the back questions who these losers are, before the individual continues. Spouting, they'd been promised the opportunity to tear the head off the God Warrior. Finding himself intimidated, Goten grows concerned after feeling their immense key. But Brawl is quite the opposite, rolling her eyes that they're ridiculously weak. Clarifying his statement, for them, they are weak, but by universal standards, they're a massive threat, believing the group to be the ones they were sent here to stop. He then closes his eyes to contact Vegito where they are, but one of their enemies here has the ability to block out any telepathic technique, jeering they'll have to kill her in order to call their little friend. Sitting fine with Brawl, she resolves they'll do just that then. That's not normal! Confused how fighters like this still exist, being stronger than even the Supreme Kai, Goten questions where they've been hiding this entire time, though that's something they prefer to keep to themselves. Smirking that's okay, they have their own entrance to the world of the dead. After they're finished here, they'll simply pay her a visit when she's a disembodied little cloud. This minuscule show of arrogance enough to irritate the villain. Still trying to obtain information, Goten doubles down these guys stand no chance, asking again who they are. Breaking a bit, one of the warriors explains, they are the new and improved generation of the Heraclan, the worthy heirs to the mighty Bojack himself. But since Goten wasn't born during Bojack's initial visit to Earth, this means very little to the half Saiyan. Going into further detail, the man spouts Bojack was the most powerful fighter in the universe, sealed away by magic for centuries. After he escaped, he traveled to the planet Vegito lived on, where he ultimately met his end. That was 23 years ago now. Goten cracks if he had to remember all the dimwits that got themselves killed invading Earth. Interjecting, 300 years ago, the inhabitants of planet Hera developed a technology that made their people insanely powerful, Bojack being the primary example. And to obtain their revenge against Vegito, they've rediscovered and evolved the very same technology. The boy ironically congratulates his foe, but assures that won't be enough. Whoever killed their friend is undoubtedly much weaker than Vegito. I said evolve! Sending the villain soaring away, even the innocent bystanders on the world below spot the man streaking through the sky. Confidently tapping her feet to the ground, Brawl narrows her eyes in the realization these people had a bit of a power-up hiding in the shadows. Chirping, she'd love to continue this one-on-one. -on -one. After all, she is the only child of Vegito, if that helps entice anyone. Taking the bait, the apparent leader removes her coat while instructing her comrade to take care of the weak one. Appearing to struggle, Brawl barks to know what Goten is doing, but he argues he can't hit a woman causing the girl to humorously shout back. Sure you can, it works exactly the same! Flexing her real power, the girl now sees this won't be as easy as expected. I'm back, brat! As Goten is out cold, and Brawl finds herself getting bullied around, the villains leer, this has been fun, but can't wait for the real thing. These words resonate with the young prodigy. Furious, she asks, the real thing? Her power increasing wildly, she fiercely growls, she is the real thing. Screeching, she is Sun Brawl, the soon to be strongest god of all time. And they are nothing. Her blast obliterates the platform they are previously fighting on and sends the leader of the Harrahs to the planet below. Holding her wounds, she knows there's no way Brawl will. Not hesitating to erase the world from existence, along with the literal billions of innocent lives residing on it. What's more, despite her cold-hearted decision, she laughs aloud in satisfaction of her victory. Appearing out of nowhere, 
Vegito is able to subdue her, dragging her to the nearest habitable place. He stares at his child, asking if she remembers what she did. But she doesn't, only that she won. With a scowl, he reminds she destroyed that planet, killed Goten. She let herself get so out of control, she even caused the son of the star system to go supernova, which will engulf the two of them in a few minutes. Berating, she unlocked Super Saiyan 2 and became more of a monster than when she reached the first level. With her current power, even Gohan won't be able to stop her anymore. Finding joy in at last overtaking. Given the extreme circumstances of the situation, Vegito furiously yells for her to shut up. What he's saying is, now he alone is the final person in the universe who can stand in her way. This should be an overwhelmingly exciting feat, his own child worthy of going toe to toe with himself. But in this case, it only means they have a new Broly on their hands. As he lowers his head, he promised the Kaioshins he would keep the universe safe. This time, it was easy to block her path of destruction. Currently, he is still much stronger than her. Although, one day that will not be the case. So before that day arrives, he will kill her. Barking if she understands now. Sun Brawl needs to figure out a way to control herself. Otherwise, he won't even have a choice. As he teleports away, he growls she find her own way back to Earth. And when she gets there, she needs to gather the Dragon Balls to fix this. But she doesn't know where Earth is. Tears streaming down her face in frustration. This isn't what she intended. Whimpering, it's not her fault. Nonetheless, she's left alone to absorb the impact of what she's done. Earth, May 26, age 767. The following events occurred in Universe 17. During Gohan's final standoff against Cell, in spirit, Goku shouts for his son to hang in there as he hasn't released his full power yet. But mentally defeated and physically worn, his son doesn't believe he can continue. Despite his father's protest from Otherworld, telling his dad he is sorry, Gohan admits defeat, stating Cell is too strong for him. The monster using the opportunity to overtake the young Saiyan, bidding he say hello to his father for him. And with one last push, Gohan is no more. The Z Fighters looking on stunned, already severely beaten by the Cell Juniors, knowing there is nothing more that can be done. Though Cell mocks, now he's more tired than ever. This may be the hero's last chance. Vegeta knows the monster is only toying with them, but lets his pride take over anyway. Krillin knows they need to do something other than stand around. And though it may be futile, Piccolo too refuses to stand idly. Even if it may be in vain, Gohan must be avenged. So, who's next? Realizing now, all hope is truly lost, Tian and Yamcha explain how Cell just plans to finish them off one by one, reaching out his arm to end the Namek. Krillin launches his Kienzon, though he only uses it against Earth's fighters. As the last defense, Krillin may get it worse than anyone. A cell drags him out of Earth's atmosphere to suffocate him in the void of space. With no one to stand up to the monster, he knows he just has one thing left to do. Massacre the entire Earth. Landing in a below city, chaos has already begun to grip the planet. As it seems, news of Cell's victory has echoed through civilization. But the bug declares he doesn't plan to hog all the fun for himself, plopping out a Cell Jr. or two. Our poor Earth became a playground for him and his children, and this planet was only the first of a very long list. As for Trunks, he would never return home to his own Universe 14. Year 623 In every universe except 2 and 5, on the primary planet of King Cold's empire, we stumble across the Frost Demon Brothers mid-argument and in their second form. Cooler growls how arrogant his sibling is, who replies, it is the other who is wrong. Asserting in this state, they are equally powerful, even though Cooler is the elder of them. 
Ergo, he deserves an equal portion of the universe. But he snarls they're only in these forms because Frieza can't control his original state. But even in this diluted appearance, he himself is still far superior. Doubling down on his boast, Frieza powers up, suggesting they return to normal then. Good old Pops overhearing this gives the two of them a solid thwomp. Scolding, not only are they fighting without permission, but they would dare even think of doing so at full power, asking if they're trying to destroy the capital of his empire. Furthermore, he gets to decide who controls what, showing even Frost Stevens have to deal with the parental pecking order. Jumping forward, the day of Planet Vegeta's destruction. The next happenings occurred in all universes, except 1, 2, 3, 5, 9, and 10. Zarbon alerts Frieza a nearby ship has been detected and confirmed to be his brother, causing the tyrant to whip his head around, demanding to know what he thinks he's doing in his territory. But just as soon as he's noticed, Zarbon explains he now appears to be leaving. With no further questions, Frieza chooses to forgive him for now, resolving to head back home. And unknown to both of them at the moment, in most universes, this would be the last time the siblings ever ran into each other as their fates were now sealed by a wayward Saiyan who had escaped. Nearly 30 years would pass. These following events take place in universes 4, 6, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20. Cooler finally receives word. A pathetic Saiyan has killed his brother and father. Salsa admits it may be hard to believe, but that is indeed the case, and it happened on a planet called Earth. Cooler grits his teeth, believing it must be the same warrior Frieza faced on Namek, and he and Cold likely chased him down in a bit of revenge, believing without a shadow of a doubt he must be the fabled Super Saiyan. But confused, he questions his underling how his father was killed, who reveals he was in his powered down state the entire time, never getting the opportunity to use his real strength. Chuckling at this, their emperor thinks to himself that his father was invincible in his true form actually feeling his death was a bit deserved, as he never bothered to learn to permanently sustain it like he has. This now makes him the most powerful being in the universe, previously thinking he would have had to wait another three or four hundred years to be strong enough to kill him himself. Once again calling for Salsa's attention, he announces they're going to Earth immediately to wipe out the Saiyans once and for all. A few days later, the Sun family enjoys the outdoors in this time of peace. In universes 4, 6, 11, 16, 17, 18, and 20, Trunks would alert Goku of the android threat, so he feels they have three whole years to train and certainly have time for a picnic, but the quote future timelines. In universes 12, 14, and 15, he urges his wife, Gohan can finish his studies after their little picnic, not mentioning anything about training. And since these are the future timelines, chances are they're doomed regardless as Cooler's Armored Squadron appears in the sky. And we know what happens next. Or do we? The two warriors facing off, Cooler unveils a special trait that sets him apart from his family, being the only one of them to master a new level of transformation. Sensing he's much stronger than before, Tough. Surviving the massive attack with a cut across his entire body, Cooler taunts his opponent, asking if he went too hard, as he has a tendency of getting carried away while in this form. Before he offers the Saiyan a compliment, previously believing Goku would be much less durable. Staring the demon down, our hero remarks he hasn't even seen his full power yet, urging he not make the same mistake as his brother by underestimating him, who chooses to brush off this warning. You are starting to annoy me! That power! Kakarot! Taking Krillin down, the squad member then turns his focus to Gohan. But luckily, Piccolo arrives in time for the save. Making sure their friend is okay, Krillin's injuries don't appear to be life-threatening. Joking with the Namek, he sure did take long enough to get here, who cheekily replies, he's been slightly busy.
upon discovering. Goku's warning wasn't merely a bluff. Cooler is irate finding himself beaten down, wondering if this is the same power his father and brother felt. With the battle clearly taking a turn, Goku explains, the demon's strength has noticeably diminished, and it would be wise for him to throw in the towel. But pride is a stubborn thing. As Cooler spouts, he will never surrender, and he is the most powerful of the Frost Demons, and no one can defeat him. So long, Super Saiyan! What? No! I cannot lose! And so... Goku's attack propelled Cooler into the sun, thus would eliminate the last of the Frost Demons, who burnt alive in the star itself. However, our heroes wouldn't even know they had just ended once and for all the race of tyrants who had enslaved several galaxies for a near millennia, and the face of the universe had been changed forever. Year 786 in the room of spirit and time. I must have been five years old. Regularly, my grandfather and Vegeta would engage in battles to test their strength. I insisted on watching. I've never seen a real fight before. I'm ringing in my ears. The sound of the impacts attested to their destructive power. They were concentrated on one another, ignoring everything around them. Not giving a second's rest in front of so much raw power, I felt as if I was receiving the hits myself. My grandfather, who always had a smile and likable face, was concentrated with an expression that was as serious as it was scary. My entire body was trembling with fear as I tried desperately to hold back the tears in my eyes. Today, you're the bravest one! Eat! You have to become strong! Distance. Pan could barely hear the cadences of what the warriors were saying. Vegeta demands his rival get up, but with a smirk, Goku remarks they're done. Vegeta wins. However, the prince doesn't buy it, screaming for him to stop holding back and demanding to know why he himself won again when he knows for a fact that Kakarot is much stronger. Elaborating, Goku reminds the last time he used level 3, it ended the fight immediately. And, interjecting, Vegeta prods it drains all the user's energy. He knows, but if he holds back, they will never solve that problem. Getting in his face, he responds by telling him to then achieve level 3 himself already. They will be able to fight better and surpass it, because as things currently stand, he himself is the strongest, period. But his sparring partner argues that's not true. There is someone even stronger in this very room who doesn't even need transformation. Pointing to the entrance of the Room of Spirit and Time, he warns that door is their only way out of here, so he better protect it. Though, since Gohan has been away from battle for so long, he has a bit of a half-hearted response to the rather dire threat. Opening his palm, Vegeta bellows, REACT, IDIOTS! As her father steps in front of the blast, Pan is brought back to heartwarming memories of him from the time they went to the aquarium. To moments that completely contradict what's happening before her right now, where her mother asks him if he'd like to go train with them, but he lovingly declines to peacefully continue his book, urging the two of them enjoy themselves, prompting Pan to proclaim her and her mommy will be the strongest. As Vegeta's blast is shrunk down, she thinks of all the times Gohan read her a bedtime story about wild fables of heroes vanquishing evil villains by impossible odds. And the time she got lost in the grocery store. It was the first time she had ever been all alone. And instead of scolding her, he knew the fear she experienced was punishment enough and she wouldn't stray away again. So instead of shouting, he held her and simply reminded she has to be more careful and that he loves her. Easily neutralizing the attack, Gohan glances up at the prince over his glasses. But with his point proven, Vegeta scoffs, 
There, that's power. And Goku understands what he's talking about. But Gohan got his powers from a god, so he doubts they can, impatiently interrupting again. He scowls for Kakarot to do what he wants, but they won't fight again until he can do better than that. Turning the tables on our hero, it actually gets Goku a bit nettled, telling his rival to stop screwing around. Stomping off in a huff, Goku can't believe he's actually serious. But just as there's someone in this room more powerful than Goku, there's also someone more serious than Vegeta. Gohan calls for him the second he passes by, growling if he ever puts his little girl in danger again. He will kill him. After a short pause, the wayward prince puts his pride aside in a rare instance of humility, merely stating, noted, as he continues walking away. That day, I realized that if my grandfather could be terrifying, my dad was even more so. But I also knew that he would always be there to protect me. That was many years ago, and now, I see a girl who's like me in so many ways, much stronger than me. And from what I understand, our dads are the same. So then, if her father is just as strong as mine, why isn't he saving her? As Krillin belts out his favorite song by Journey, and maybe one of two most of us know, Gohan turns to Vegeta requesting he join in on the fun. But the prince is furious he left the room of spirit and time for something this ridiculous. Annoyed that Kakarot and his son would be stupid enough to sacrifice a day of training for this. But the boy feels they still have plenty of time to train before Cell's tournament, and there's nothing wrong with a little R&R. &R. Hitting the climax of the song. The Z Fighters are completely unaware. A menace bearing much more importance was making his way to the planet. Landing, a spacecraft unveils two wayward Saiyans, survivors of Frieza's malice, Paragus and his son Broly, inviting Prince Vegeta to become king of their new planet and claim his rightful place at the throne. But he refuses. Paragus then requests he come and defeat the legendary Super Saiyan, who has been destroying entire star systems one by one. This, however, gets Vegeta's curiosity soon venturing to the new planet Vegeta, but unknown to the prince. This was a well-planned trap. It wasn't long later revealed the celestial body was doomed, on a collision course with a deadly comet, and Broly was the legendary Super Saiyan himself. Goku inadvertently fueling the monster's power and rage, he would soon break free of his father's control, who had been using a device to contain his son's murderous nature. The Z Fighters found themselves not only with an impossibly powerful adversary, but a very short time limit to take him out. As the minutes passed, Broly's strength and savagery only grew, killing his own father even. One by one, he decommissioned our heroes. Unable to lay a scratch, Goku would be the lone warrior still standing, though not being spared the creature's wrath. With the comet making its approach, Goku and his allies were running out of options, Piccolo frantically suggesting they use the spirit bomb as a last resort. With few choices, Goku agrees, but knows Broly has to be distracted. Contrary, Vegeta finds this to be a stupid plan, as he of all people here knows that thing never works. In silent, it seems Gohan may be thinking of a plan of his own. Raising his hands to the universe, Goku begs all spare what energy they can. Gohan taking it upon himself to keep the tyrant busy, while everyone but Vegeta submits their power. He realizes the boy is far more impressive than he thought. At last resolving to donate his strength as well, Goku feels optimistic about the key they've gathered. When Paragus scolds his son, apparently not dead after all. Taking Broly's attention off the boy, he looks over. Even admits his rage, he's just as confused as we are. Approaching, turns out things aren't as they seem. As it was Oolong with a sneak attack, Goku shouts for him to get down and launches the Genkidama. Taking him off the planet and into the comet itself, Broly can only think back to how his anger started when he and Goku were mere infants. With the legendary Super Saiyan defeated, our heroes celebrate a hard-fought battle, feeling his keys slip away into nothing. They've not only saved themselves, but the planet as well. Krillin turning to his best friend, joyfully laughing that if they were able to beat Broly, then Cell should be a piece of cake. But Goku is apprehensive to compare the two. Broly was naturally invulnerable to almost anything they threw at him, but had no idea how to use his own power and barely knew how to fight. Having rested enough, the gang head back to Earth, believing the threat of the legendary Super Saiyan to be over, which was true until now. Gohan searches for his younger brother around what appears to be a mountain range, 
The two of them were supposed to get in some much needed training today, but since the young Saiyan has recently mastered the ability to fly, he never really knows where he is anymore. And sure enough, thousands of miles away, Goten is having the time of his life, meeting up with his best friend Trunks. He questions, So you got it? Celebrating, he shouts, Yeah, it was easy! As the boys holler their greatest wishes, fitting of any small child, of their own amusement parks and mountains of junk food. As we see, Trunks snatched the dragon radar from his mother. Gazing out over the horizon, the duo zero in on the beginning of their quest. With an interface so simple just about anyone could understand it, they realize they're exactly over the blinking dot, though being in the middle of a vast ocean. The ball is plunged far into the depths of the abyss. Goten complains he can't see a thing down there. Humorously stating the obvious, Trunks retorts, Of course, it's the ocean! Search again! But our deep sea diver has had enough of his underwater adventures, ushering his partner to take his place. With a swing and aftershock of energy, the boy has certainly doomed at least a few innocent bystanders with his reckless behavior. Goten bellowing, now they're definitely going to get scolded by his mother if Trunks is going to go around creating tsunamis. But while these great waves would never make their way to the coast, they did happen through an unconscious swimmer. With Broly regaining his wits, he senses who he believes to be, Trunks and Kakarot. But how did the legendary Super Saiyan find his way to this particular world? Colliding with the comet set to destroy planet New Vegeta and Goku's last-ditch effort in the Spirit Bomb, Broly dropped out of his legendary form and wandered through space. Slowly but surely, New Vegeta's gravity would pull him from orbit. There he stayed for six years, completely alone. Once back on his feet, he focused on his new goal finding his most formidable enemy. Sensing their key, he ventured after him, bearing neither spacecraft or oxygen. Arriving to Earth exhausted, he lost consciousness. Back with the boys, Goten chides if Trunks even managed to spot the ball, which he didn't. But unknown to them, Broly closes in fast, seeing the pair in the distance, confirming, to him at least, he's on the right planet. Turning to his friend, Trunks inquires if he feels something. Everybody else simultaneously sensing what's going on. Easily beating them down, Broly is bewildered, as these two appear too small to be Trunks and Kakarot. Everyone rushing to the scene. It seems the legendary warrior has the kids on the ropes immediately. Demanding Broly tell him where his son is. <laughs> Gohan can feel Vegeta is keeping their enemy busy, but not able to sense the kids anymore, which could mean. <laughs> While the two fight above, Gohan is luckily soon aided by 18, who is smart enough to use her energy to light the area, either communicating telepathically or simply gesturing with inference to the reader. She tells Gohan, Krillin informed her of the situation, and she'll look for the little ones. He needs to help Vegeta. Locked in a stalemate, Broly mocks, Not afraid of me anymore, Prince Vegeta! <clears throat> you remembered how to talk! <laughs> Gohan arriving just in time to land a surprise attack, shouting back to his ally they have to finish him quickly before he turns into the... <laughs> Legendary Super Saiyan. Now that he's transformed, Gohan worries he'll be invulnerable, Vegeta naturally already well aware, but argues it's been a long time since Cell. Fully confident Broly is far beneath him, scorning he's nothing but a legendary failure. Quickly finding out that's not the case. Luckily, 18 has managed to rescue both the boys. And at the sight of his bloody little brother, Wiping his face, Vegeta finds solace in Gohan returning to the good old days. Piccolo coming out of nowhere, mentioning he's the strongest of all of them, for now. But as he already knows, Broly's strength will continue to grow. Krillin and 18 rushing off with the kids, figuring they can take him back to the lookout for Dende's healing ability. Inquiring if they should stay and fight instead, Krillin has a pretty direct answer. Dear God, no! Broly can't be beaten the normal way. We must attack him all at once. Though simple and wise advice, Vegeta has no interest in the Namek's plans. 
in Otherworld. Goku can sense Broly's key all the way with King Kai, who warns the Saiyan must not make any hasty moves, continuing his attempt to sway the prince. Piccolo assures he's going to like his strategy. Everyone else will merely keep the brute busy, and Vegeta will launch his most powerful attack at him. Initially piffing at the idea, Piccolo goes to finish. By explaining, he'll use the blast to launch him into the sun. Resolving it's better than nothing, Vegeta begins to power up, but not one to stand by. Most times, Goku hones in on their location. As Kaiosama agrees this is a sufficient danger and he will be allowed to intervene, but they first must obtain authorization. However, the Saiyan knows there's no time for that. Understanding, Kinkai tells him to go for it, but take no more than a single second. <laughs> Laughing at the consequences, Goku assures he's not even leaving Otherworld, just a little training is all it is. Catching him in the back, Piccolo bellows for Gohan to do as Vegeta, knowing there isn't much time. I see! Don't wait for me then! And as Broly makes his way to the sun, and Goku following King Kai's word, he vanishes just as quickly as he arrived, Gohan seeming as if he just felt a ghost. Though Piccolo has seen better days, he's no worse for the wear, believing their aim was on target, and that monster should not be coming back. Indeed, in universes 4, 16, and 18, Broly would be encumbered by Earth's star, never to be seen again. But in universe 20, the beast had a stroke of luck, propelling him past the sun's pole. In many universes, as a baby, Broly saved not only himself, but his father from the destruction of planet Vegeta. Years later, the two of them had settled on a few worlds to begin their small empire. Paragus was happy with the situation and didn't intend to take it much further. But one day, he discovered that Prince Vegeta was still alive on a planet called Earth. The hatred in his heart persisting from what happened so many years ago, he decided to take out his revenge on King Vegeta through him, developing a plan involving a doomed planet and an oncoming meteor, leading us to the events of Chapter 8. In Universes 1 and 10, the pair were killed early on by the Kaioshins, who were all too aware of the destruction they would one day bring. Universes 2 and 5, the big change happened well before Broly would ever be born. Universes 3, 7, 11, and 13 have their own various ways the legendary Super Saiyan would be dealt with. For 16 and 18, all we have to do is remember the events of chapters 8 and 12 of our story. 6 and 17 are similar to the aforementioned, though Broly would go into space to seek revenge, but never found the Earth as our heroes were already dead. He dies alone to endlessly float through the void. Universes 8, 9, 12, 14, 15, 19 yet again follow a similar lore to the events prior to Chapter 8. Except Paragus' attention never comes to the Earth. Vegeta is already dead, so the pair live quietly while building their small empire. Universe 20 carries the same story we already know. Broly is defeated twice by our heroes, but the second time, he wouldn't be driven into the sun, but instead is hurled through space, where he lies dormant until today. Year 786. On Earth, about two years after Goku left to train Oob at the end of Dragon Ball Z. Showing his improvement, Goku compliments him on both his offense and defense, happily shouting it looks like he can see all his opponent's movements. Turning Super Saiyan, our hero reminds they agreed on not using any transformations today. Rushing over, he calls for everyone to take a break causing his youngest son to argue he didn't expect him to be so strong. He just got worried, that's all. Back at Goku's place, while the gang gets dinner, Chi Chi bellows is the middle of the night, clearly frustrated by their sudden appearance. But Trunks meekly retorts they were in a different time zone when they were training. Resuming their meal, Goten thanks Soup for getting him off the hook. Before he came along, his dad always wanted to train him. As something intensely catches the entire focus of the Saiyan, he senses an overwhelming power, yelling he's attacking the planet, leaving everyone else to wonder who. Gohan awakes from his sleep in the same panic, his movement waking up Videl, groggily asking what's going on. But before she can even finish her question, he grabs her by the arm, breaking through the walls and the floors to reach their daughter's room. Holding the three of them, he blasts out the window at full speed. 
confused by what's going on. Videl urges him not to fly so fast. Pan objecting as well, telling her father this hurts. When the former looks behind to spot an enormous wave of energy. The devastation quickly making its way around the entire planet. Goku teleports everyone to Kame House. As in this iteration, the events of Super never take place. Therefore, King Kai's planet has never been restored after being vaporized by Cell. And finding somewhere like New Namek at a time like this would be even more of a pot shot than what our hero has planned. Turning back with a tear in his eye, Krillin whimpers the shockwave will reach here too. And the whole world will. Cutting him off, Goku barks for Goten to protect his mother, before screaming to Krillin to get to the ground. But he knows no matter what he does, it's pointless. West City, Vegeta transforms, calling for the coward to come and face him, where he too is about to lose everything, whether he's able to realize it or not. On the lookout, Dende asks Piccolo if this is the end of the Earth, but the warrior apprehensively says it's not. It's not the end of the planet, it's the end of the universe. The attack finally disperses. The Earth now resembles more of Namek after suffering the wrath of Frieza than the blue marble it once was. Pulling himself from the water, Goku turns his head looking for Krillin, calling for his family and Noob as well. He spots his son nearby. Goten cries he didn't manage to save her, and this is the second instance his mother has died right in front of him. Knowing there's no time to lose, he's aware Broly's strength will continue to increase, and since the others are too weak to stand a chance, he simply tells them to stay here. Elsewhere. Goten isn't the only one who failed to protect his loved ones, as Gohan mourns the loss of his wife and daughter. Broly laughs out in triumph at the devastation he's caused. He's surprised by the sudden appearance of Kakarot, who promises he will pay for what he's done. Saving Gohan and retreating for the moment, Goku locks onto Vegeta's energy, telling him they need a plan. But the prince scoffs at this, asking, a plan? Like all the others Broly survived? He's not in the mood. When Gotenks arrives to help, but Vegeta is especially in no mood for him as well, shouting they don't need a stupid jokes right now. Though he doesn't want to laugh, not this time. So, they need to drag Broly towards the sun. He will handle it. In the ruins of Satan City, who bends over an attempt to heal B. When someone taps down behind him, Piccolo. He tells Boo to listen to him, as this is important. But the childlike creature is only focused on his canine friend, hollering the light killed him, and he can't heal him. The Namekian grunts there is a way to save B, but he needs him to do something. Instructing him on a task that isn't explained to the reader, the Majin objects that it's wrong to do what he's requesting. Mr. Satan said so. Though the Namekian warrior retorts it's not the same, as he is the one asking. They do everything they can to keep pushing him towards the sun, but Broly is able to detonate the blast, foiling their attempt. Vegeta curses the pair in frustration, but Gohan tells him to calm down and instead join him. The three of them together can try at the same time. Goku recommends they find Gotenks, as his power will help. When something drains the blood from his face, it seems Broly may have increased his power yet again. Crashing back down to the earth, Broly isn't even phased by that previous attack. And looking on in horror, unfortunately for our heroes, they haven't even had a moment to catch their breath yet. Even Goku wonders what they can do now, and if he of all warriors is stumped, our heroes may be in more trouble than it appears. Just then, a cloaked figure appears behind Gohan. Sensing the presence of his lifelong friend and mentor, the Saiyan turns to greet him. But instead of Piccolo, it's Boo-Colo, Piccaboo, who explains this is Piccolo's plan, asking if he understands it. It won't be permanent and he'll release all of them after the battle. 
And without hesitation, Gohan shoots him a look of understanding and tells him to go for it. <laughs> After absorbing the father and son, Boo fires out to consume the prince, who flusteredly objects he never said he was okay with this. However, there's no time to waste. He then dashes over to Gotenks, pleading with the great hero not to die yet. They also need him. And he himself seems to be the most taken aback by this. And with this fusion having a time limit, we can't help but wonder if this will come into play sometime during this battle. He bellows to Broly it's over! For justice! For Earth! And for his friends. Taking a stance, Boo's new form is revealed. With the newly acquired power of Goku, Vegeta, Piccolo, Gohan, and Gotenks, surely there's no way anyone could stand a chance against him now, right? Though the demonic Saiyan doesn't appear at all concerned by this. While Boo can sense how much stronger he is than his foe, something's off. No matter how hard or how many times he hits him, he can't deal any damage. Screaming out, Broly grabs him by the sides in an attempt to crush him. It's only too bad for him. He's fighting the only being of the universe who is more broken than himself. The Majin effortlessly transmutes into his liquid state to scurry away from the hulking monster before him. It may have absorbed more Gotenks than he should have. Our hero tries to think of a way to end this quick. Last time Broly is able to survive the Earth's sun. There are much hotter burning suns like the Wolf Rayets, but who's to say he won't just survive that too? Besides, the closest one is about a thousand light years away and would likely be problematic to get to, even with instant transmission. Apparently, there's even more Gohan here than Gotenks. At any rate, they need something more definitive than a star. Extending his arm, he taunts Broly the two of them are going on a little trip. But before he can teleport, Broly is able to quickly fire off a powerful blast. As the planet itself begins to fall to pieces, Boo is caught off guard in a miss how he could possibly be hurt this bad. Broly goes to fire off yet another attack. If Boo doesn't do something now, he's going to die. When Ood comes out of nowhere, charged up to his maximum Kaioken. The Goku within knows deep inside. His student isn't anywhere near ready for this level of opponent yet. But what other choice is there? The Earth is all but gone. It's people, dead. Boob himself now believes he knows why his master is the way he is. This is why they need to be strong. He knows he isn't strong yet, but Goku can count on him, even if it's only this once. Still firing off the blast, Boob seems to have at least altered its intended trajectory. The legendary Super Saiyan himself still appears undamaged for the most part. The same can't be said about Oob. Rejoining his foe, now fully intact, Boob quips, almost tongue in cheek, that even breathing is optional for Broly now, isn't it? Not hesitating, the Saiyan reaches out to attack again, but landing on his right shoulder, as Boob promised, a trip. Reforming, it's the brutalized variant from before. He finally decides to put those Majin abilities to clever use. At the center of each galaxy, there is a massive black hole. Billions of times more massive than our sun. This one in particular is surrounded by thousands of others, and by billions of stars. So many, they create a completely luminous sky. The gravity in such a place isn't 100 times that of Earth. It's not 10,000 times either. It's more like infinite. It's so strong that the bottom of an object is pulled faster than its top. Less of a fraction of a millisecond later, no time to feel pain. After a tenth of a second, the both of them are gone, completely erased from the universe. In many universes, the sacrifice of our heroes saved us all. Time and time again, they were the sole reason the planet would see another day. But the Vargas didn't travel to these universes. They instead found Universe 20, which is a deviation where... Broly was now concentrating too much energy. Nothing could overcome him anymore. Feeling the energy of other galaxies, he takes a trip, moving at impossible speeds. 
going on to destroy the entire universe. Year 762, Universe 14. At this place in time, the events we're already aware of include Nappa and Vegeta appearing on Earth with the intention of obtaining the Dragon Balls. Normally, they would be defeated, leading our heroes to venture into space in an attempt to save their friends who had fallen in battle. In an alternate reality, the same year Lord Slug would arrive with his minions seeking the same thing. After a hard-fought battle, Goku would manage to defeat the evil Namekian and save the planet. But in this universe, things happened a bit differently. For this story, Lord Slug would instead venture to Namek. This leaves us with the question, where are the Z Fighters? Are they also on their way to Namek? Or, in this reality, are they absent completely? On Namek, the elderly fiend would present himself as nothing more than a feeble old man, too weak and downtrodden to even stand on his own. However, we can tell even from afar that he radiates malice and ill intent. Local does his best to get him on his feet while making sure he's okay. Slug would detail how he's the last survivor of his planet, a planet ravaged by ancient demons. Although he desired only to be the guardian of his world, he failed. He could do nothing to prevent such misfortune. Though he was once a powerful warrior, the ravishes of time have left him unable to protect his people. With no other options, he could only run, flee to his home planet to request the help of Purunga, the eternal dragon. With his help, he can undo the evils that have been done, as he doesn't have the ability to create Dragon Balls himself. He is the only one who can free his people from this evil and restore the order of things. Holding his visitor so he doesn't fall again, the unsuspecting native attempts to quell his concerns by telling him not to worry. The Grand Elder will know what to do in all of his infinite wisdom. Far atop of Butte, Slug is presented to Guru as a distant, wayward ancestor by a village elder. He explains that he's come here to ask for help after a great devastation befell him. Being the soothsayer he is, the Grand Elder implores his child to worry not. He doesn't need to tell him the whole story. He can already feel that their guest's soul is indeed disturbed. Turning to Slug, he states he's aware there is something which afflicts him, instructing him to come closer. By merely placing his hand on Slug's head, he'll be able to see the truth. This is when the invader almost blows his cover, nearly smirking as he thinks to himself what a foolish old man the Grand Elder is. He thinks he'll be able to read his mind, but Slug is already well aware of such a trick. Gazing through their visitor's mind, Guru sees only partial truths, but unfortunately for him, believes them to be the full story. He announces their brother Slug is telling the truth. Horrible demons forced him to flee his planet. Monstrous beings bent on pain and destruction. Several misguided souls. He asks the village elder to gather the Dragon Balls. This threat must be eradicated immediately and for good. So far, every part of Slug's evil plan is falling into place. Placing all seven together, Mori smiles as he motions for their distant brethren to use them wisely. Who only turns back to respond? Naturally. With Paranga springing forth in a blinding flash of light, Slug's henchmen take that as a signal that it's go time. The Namekian dragon shakes the planet below, bellowing he will grant three wishes which reside within his power. Fiend shouts that he needs only one, commanding the great dragon to grant him eternal youth, return him to the prime of his life, and restore his godly power. And such a simple request is easily fulfilled. Nail dashes towards him, shouting Slug will pay for fooling him. He won't get away with this. As Slug's ancient demons move in, Dorodabo gives chase, vowing to take care of him and protect his leader. seconds, the wish has taken full effect. Lord Slug returns to his youth. He can feel his energy returning, power once again flowing within his veins. What the hell? Die, you worm! The cavalry arriving just in time. They tell Nail not to worry and they're here to help. These guys are going to pay dearly for taking advantage of him like this. 
in all of his Mad Max glory. Ziyun gives off a sinister smile while chortling. Well, well, looks like they're not such a peaceful race after all. He tells Minamacha that this means they're going to make him suffer a little. Still submerged in the dirt while holding Nail by the ankles, Angela snarls that now since his foe's at a disadvantage, he'll give him the coup de gras. But with a sparkle in his eye, Nail smirks that he wouldn't be so sure of his position if the tables were turned. With that attack, the Namek spats out a bit of blood as he mutters. One down, four to go. <laughs> While everyone stays busy fighting each other, Dorodabo turns his focus directly onto Nail alone. Who motions for him to bring it on? With another one of his henchmen hitting the dirt, Slug cackles at the situation and how pathetic of a battle this is, and if his strength here is like anything we already know he's capable of. One! Sneaking up on him amidst the chaos, one of the warriors is able to grapple Ziyun, the final standing henchman. Getting a sadistic kick out of this, Slug actually cheers him on. He laughs, that's the spirit. Show him what an Amekian is capable of. As Ziyun can only struggle and demand his aggressor let him go, Neil realizes what he's planning. His ally yells for Neil to protect the elders and the children. It's up to him alone now. With that explosion, Nail tells his brother to rest in peace. He will take care of these demons. They came here with nothing but lies and dared to attack them. I will finish them! <laughs> Come on. Yeah! Not bad, but not enough! Easily sending Namek's greatest warrior flying, Slug crosses his arms to mock that this is the difference between a common Namekian and a super Namekian. He then turns to his henchmen, all of which still alive, though they've definitely seen better days. He barks that if they've stopped sleeping, they should go prepare the ship. Terrified of their leader, all at once they respond, At once, Lord Slug! Slug. Then accompanied with the sound of falling rocks, Nail pulls himself up screaming, it's not over yet! He swears, as long as he continues to breathe, Slug will not leave here alive. Causing the most dark and sadistic smile to creep across the villain's face yet. He snarls in that case. He has no choice but to pierce his lungs then. Nail fearlessly charges at him, shouting not to underestimate him. And zipping away, Slug smirks that he doesn't. Unfortunately, this universe is one where Nail's final stand for Namek doesn't go much different than the one we know, aside from his ultimate fusion with Piccolo. Slug confidently begins to walk back to his ship thinking to himself that was a good warm up. Now it's time to conquer the entire universe. Lord Slug has returned. Blasting back into space, he takes his throne. Reaching out to one of his underlings, he inquires on what news they've received from nearby planets. And in a bit of a surprise, the scientist reveals they continue to obtain information about the Saiyan. Apparently, every planet visited by him ends up destroyed. He's next headed towards a blue planet called Earth. On the screen, we're left to assume that the Saiyan in question is Turles. Unless, of course, in this reality, Goku somehow managed to retain his Saiyan identity, as he did in many other universes. Slug then demands they set a course for this Earth. They can't allow that Saiyan to destroy the few habitable planets in that quadrant. And with that simple order, it's decided. Slug's demon clan is set to face off against, presumably, Turles' Crusher Core. With Namek left in ruins and all of his warriors eliminated, will the Grand Elder be able to do anything once again to save his people from the brink of extinction? Or does Slug plan to merely destroy his homeworld from space to tie up loose ends? Also, 
assuming the Z Fighters are experiencing the same story we know up until the androids. How will they react to Lord Slug venturing across the universe to save their planet? in an artificial satellite or ship somewhere in space. We zoom in. We see a familiar emblem in the far corner. A planet shines brighter than any other object in the cosmos, a world that may come into play a little later. Inside, Sun Bra weeps at events prior. Given her change of clothes, it's unknown how long she's been here. when she's taken back to the moment she lost control. Back at the tournament. In the distance, she hears her Majin self shout, I am number one! I control my power! I am complete! After taking out the Grand Supreme Kai, he again remarks that he thought she aimed higher than this. While the regular brawl tries to rush in and shout for herself not to do this. The story only repeats itself yet again. The daughter of Vegito lunges at her demon, calling her a monster, who only glares back as she mocks. That's how one makes a retort to such a statement. Grabbing her, the Majin snatches her by the neck. She taunts to know where all this benevolent bravado was when a shriveled little mage commanded her to kill everyone in sight. Although the real Brawl tries to argue that she didn't have a choice, her evil self condemns, and yet she committed herself to the order with such pride. Gohan, Piccolo, so many more. Just how much blood is still on her hands after all this time? How many people saw her true colors that day? How many still think of her as nothing more than an uncontrollable monster? Getting lost in her own misery. Another voice calls out that she is the one who submissively surrendered herself to her own evil. But she wonders who this is. It continues. She let herself submit to the worst form of herself she could possibly ever be. She's no better than a submissive Majin servant. Though she cries out she's not a Majin, she's a member of the Sun Bree family. Her father and mother appearing, the former states she was a member of their family. Every year she spends in exile draws her closer to the fate she feared, and this is what she deserves. visions of her most horrific actions, a new entity appears and scowls that she, a vassal to such evil, deserves a much more terrible fate. Even the Majin tries to choke out for Brawl to just run. But what is this? The masked figure questions if she didn't just hear her own dark soul. In fact, they're sure she did. It told her to run. Trying to do so as the Majin screams out in pain as she's dematerialized. The instant transmission doesn't work as the bloody floor grabs her by the ankles. Brawl curses this water every time. But what does she mean by that? How many times has she been here? The voice breathes. Did the Majin forget how to break something like this? Or maybe she buried it. The figure reminds that Brahma may think this place is atonement for what she's done, but she will never be accepted by her family and friends again. This is forever. Prompting her to power up and scream for the vision to shut up. Blowing the liquid away. She hangs her head in defeat. The voice remains persistent and fumes that these are just defiant words betrayed by a frail mind. Pathetic. They will have their answers. Upon seeing something bubble up again. The figure appearing in front of her. Brawl barks that they invade her thoughts and twist her grief against her. Who only replies with the word sin. But how dare they dictate the Saiyan's past like some kind of pretentious god. For Brawl, all it took was a simple word, para papa, and she obeyed without objection. With those few syllables, she made Pan count to two upon seeing her father, giving our focal character all the motivation to scream to this thing that they're dead. When a possessed Fipsil springs between the pair, she hisses that they had expected a transformation. However, she still fights against it. 
she'll just have to send her further back into her own hell. Returning to the bright light from the beginning of the story. On a strange robotic world. The masked figure, who we'll call... Lamachu. Or to keep the tradition of anagramming references and puns, maybe Shula, or Talus, or Utah. Talus. Talus. Utah holds an orb and is accompanied by a figure dressed very similar to the Supreme Kai of time, and bears a very similar appearance to that of Toa. The purple aura the orb admits seems to be having an effect on Brawl back at the spaceship. Now we know this isn't merely occurring in Brawl's mind, but is actually being enacted by an outside force. But how did this pair come to know our conflicted hero? Now at the moment some Brawl came to her senses. She repeats the word no over and over to herself, pleading for this demon to just let her go. Who would be happy to oblige? All she has to do is transform. Unless... Deep down, she truly believes she's deserving of this torture. She argues that she never wanted this. They torment her with her past, but she never asked for any of this. She didn't want to kill everyone and lose everything. She didn't want to fail, but she did. Now, she knows she has to live with that. Unfortunately, Talus calls all these words nothing but lies. Four years before this, an entire world became victim to her petty rage. Can she recall in the five years since her exile, when she regretted it even once? Those lesser wish orbs can restore a planet, but even the Namekian ones cannot return those wiped from existence. Again contending with her adversary, she utters that she didn't. But talking over her, they state Brawl truly has a dark soul to deny what history says she did. Who knows what she said, but she... She stopped herself. She... And yet here she is, readying herself. Almost as if she felt... Compelled to. We arrive at the point the others reappear at the tournament. Han asks Boo about her parents. Where are they? Sensing Mr. Satan's bloodline within her, he realizes this is the granddaughter of his dearest friend. He'd be glad to help. In fact... He believes Gohan is close by, so they should find him first. Sunbrawl then realizes Boo knew. He knew this whole time what went on in the arena, and he played everyone. But no, the figure remarks he only played Brawl. Upon seeing her potential and lack of control, he knew it would only take a little push to get her past the point of no return, and not for any deep reason or further agenda. No. It was just for a moment of entertainment to him. Transforming for a short while, she returns to normal, grabbing her chest by her heart. Again pleading to be let out of here. The masked warrior walks away as the voice of Pan can be heard searching for her father. He's not answering, but he's definitely close. Scene playing out as we remember. In this reality doing what it does. The villain wants Bra to explain what just happened back there, but she doesn't know. She just wants out of this place. But that's not happening until she transforms and stays that way. But she better hurry, unless she wants to relive the moment that pan. Why does it matter to them? The girl beckons if they can see that she doesn't know anything. We have to ask ourselves just what kind of information this entity seeks. Continuing to hear the worried cries of her friend nearby. She just wants all of this to stop. Why won't this fiend listen to her? But they claim they are listening. That slow, foreboding beat of her heart. She can feel the struggle before a pause. And then eventually, it beats again. Or will it? How long has she had that dread while living a life unredeemed? The one she's maintained since her exile. Brawl utters that this thing is a monster, a sick and twisted creature. As Pan mutters, Dad? Off screen, the monster whispers, Para Papa Majin. She made that poor child count again. This recurrence is enough for our protagonist to want to be done with all of this. All the pain she's caused is her fault. She accepts that. She has this entire time. In the real world, Talus motions for the blue woman, named Time, to do it. Only responds as you wish. 
Now summoning Brawl's own image to try to get whatever information they seek. Time comments that binding together what compels her, as the masked one put it, wasn't easy. She hides her trauma well, though her partner would like to know her point. She adds that they had to resort to misdirection to get her to transform. Just because she buried her pain doesn't mean she can face it. But her opposite reply is that's been the plan all along. They've seen and heard all the evidence they need upon observing her. It's clear that the Majin suffers not just from the burden of regret, but a defeat she cannot reconcile herself with. At the same time, we can see the shadow of Sea cast behind her. What does he have to do with this? At her limit! The illusion of gas stops her. She slumps downward beaten. She mumbles, what has she done? Gohan, Piccolo, Videl. Viewing the wizard's giant glowing eyes to appear behind her. The three she mentioned materialize in front of her. But also Bulma. The voice instructs the Majin to tell her mother everything. Who mentions to Brawl that she said the Kai looked at her. Even though the Saiyan knows this isn't really her mother, it's still her words. This conversation never took place in the original Dragon Ball multiverse. Come to think about it, I'm not sure Bulma is even at the tournament, so this must be some time after Brawl returned to her universe, since the story takes place years in the future. Her mom continues, Brawl said it was telepathy, that he sent them to his universe to be safe from Brawl. Is that true? Who again claims it to be so, though not able to make eye contact even with a fake version of her mom. Shouting at her to tell her, but she can't. Inside, she knows it's not. It's as if the others are looking down upon her with disgust. This isn't the truth. And in the background, C raises his hand calmly and claims, Mine. as Brawl finally breaks and transforms. We're taken back to the ship. Judging by a photo in her room, it appears she's joined the Galactic Patrol in an attempt to atone for her past. But what did C do to Gohan and the others? And what is Brawl seemingly lying about to everyone involving him? And what could be amiss that only Brawl and the Kaioshin looked at her funny no? As some of her comrades try to enter the room, the lock on the door engages the shield, breaking their way in. One states it's incredible. The other shouting for the shield to lower itself. Brawl grabs at her chest in pain again. She hacks out that she can't breathe. While trying to get her to the medical station, one of the patrolmen asks Ambassador Thorn to stay to the side. Naming herself as Desi, she alerts urgent care that they have an emergent transport. The world they're on disintegrating. Time mentions to Talus that she's been asking a lot of her lately. She only wants to know why. Why all of this? The people of this planet were a prosperous, good-intended species. They had no cares beyond their own well-being. They had no relevance to the interrogation of this girl. Responding, the evildoer claims that the people here abided by false virtue. That's all she needs to know. No reason to press further. Time now wants to know what the deal is with this girl. Surely what's been learned of her only confirms what was previously known. Now she appears to be dying from their actions. Something the wicked sorcerer doesn't believe. But why not? The evidence correlates with her frail history. For the sake of making her point, time will agree that the power of the stones can remove a sense of accountability to those who the wish is made for. Regardless, they did remove her burden in the original timeline. This traces back to Chapter 77, when a young Sun Brawl caused one of her first catastrophes. This also leads us to reason that this story takes place in an alternate timeline altogether than the original story. And isn't simply a what if. In that timeline, however, a wish undid her actions as a young child. Then after the multiversal tournament, while everyone thinks her loved ones are at peace, Talus now knows that Brawl lied about the fate of them all as well as being mentally fragmented. Five years of Brawl knowing the truth and not admitting it to the others, living a life unredeemed, as Talus said. 
If they recall a reckless prior fight, Brawl grabs her chest with the same pain she's currently experiencing. Time comments that the stress of wanting to make things right, met with near death, is enough to traumatize anyone's heart. Dropping something. Her counterpart claims that would be true. If not for the timing, the object begins to transform into a miniature stadium. Ten days from now, everything stops. The masked figure's role was always to help those achieve their true wish. Once that's achieved, their association ends and they move on to whoever their great creator decrees. Which in lies the problem? A vision like their own can only be set during a monumental event. And the dawn of the Eighth Age does not happen in ten days. The villain then brings a vision of an entire galaxy, what they call a utopia of the deserving. Time can all but resent that even when given a second chance, the mysterious warrior still persists with his plan. They should at least recall the outcome from the last time this was tried. It resulted in the deletion of six universes. But this time, the fiend argues, it'll be done right. Now that they have met the means to remove the disease that taints the mortal soul. The Majin. And yet everything stops when they've come so close. Time contends maybe. Maybe it only stops for Talus. The question is then raised. If Talus were to leave the Majin, would it perish in ten days also? Looking into her staff, it's speculated that in three days, the Saiyan girl will arrive at the Topopolis. And while this is well into the Eighth Age, time doesn't see Talus. But killing her or not, Talus' ambition seems to cease. Perhaps they should take this as a sign to consider. Cutting her off, Time said the Majin will be at that structure in three days. Closing her eyes and relenting, that will be the case. So Talus demands that she take her there. The Blue Woman then states if her other believes that fighting the girl at a later date will change things, so be it. However, she herself has to know. How does Talus stand by her actions so far? And the legacy of their consequence. With these words, we're treated what appears to be a multitude of universes, or maybe timelines, only one of which is lit up in the circle pattern, and many more as we move up. Showcasing a few more scenes we've seen before, why is she so prominently featured here? Time scales that she's not merely one of those attendants, and that taking Talus to a new timeline outside the seal would lead to duplications. She was warned of the consequences. Then there's a flash of Boo fighting the contestants. What is this creature he's so afraid of? And why does it seem to originate from Bra? The demon-like character again questions if the masked fighter stands by her actions. Who does without question? Before stating that the presence of their legacy will inspire more deserving heroes to gather when the time comes. But for now, the Topopolis, this instant. Doing as requested. Toa and few appear on the servant's shoulder. He's sporting a number. The woman lets out a sigh and utters that, in a way, she feels sorry for Brawl given what she's set to lose. But does individuality have significance within the infinite? Shaped by reality, there's always another. Whatever the outcome may be, there will be consequences. Someone will benefit from this. But time must ask, what's the meaning behind the girl's vision of the bloody pond? have your cooperation on this matter! Back at the satellite. A patrolman, either a reimagined legic or someone of the same race, drones that the only reason there's been no retaliation on their funding is because of Thorn. But that doesn't make him grateful for the ambassador's actions. He's just mystified more than anything. Especially if the report on his desk is correct with Brawl triggering a containment shield. Those are used to contain threats that can depressurize the entire station. Had that outburst lasted another minute, just one minute, the shielding would have collapsed, and unlike the mess they had at the refinery, there would have been casualties. Brawl may have worked with the gods on the Galactic Patrol's behalf once, even if they themselves didn't have a say in it, but working with the patrol directly is very different. They are not a refuge for fame seekers. Being scolded, Brawl can feel the darkness of her soul trying to claw its way back in. He continues that it's no secret he's been looking for even a poor excuse to dismiss Brawl permanently. But rules still apply. He'll listen to her account when she gets to him. But they'll hand over her medical records regardless. 
protesting to Jocko. He interrupts her to hiss. Not now. But she thought she had a chance. As another patrolman interrupts her, Jocko is telling her as captain, and she will say as a second in command. Not now. After the transmission, Jocko, Desi, and a warrior of Goldo's race named Hold speak amongst each other. The demon continues to taunt Brawl. Because of her, they can see their careers just dimming away into the abyss. But where is Taseeb? Oh, that's right. Good going, fame seeker. As Brawl comments, it wasn't about fame. We can assume her actions likely led to the demise of one of her comrades. These words caused Desi to break into a fury, demanding Brawl explain herself, only being quelled by her leader. With this, her inner Majin warns that she better be careful. They may just get Mad Woman on their medical records. That's the last thing they need, right? The brawl makes it clear that the two of them are not the same person. But projecting her guilt still makes them the same. <laughs> Running out of the room, her Majin tells her to think. How can Thorne possibly know of something that doesn't exist? Something we're still not yet clued in on. Brawl argues that those stones had to come from somewhere. Her evil side rolling her eyes. Now from here, she needs to stop thinking about the past and be glad that everyone here except Jocko thinks they're all in a better place. Accept it and move on. But if she were to do that, the Majin herself wouldn't be here. It'd just be Brawl. In fact, she says they hunt down the pretentious god who threatened them. Or herself at least. She just cried and begged like she did with Bobbity. Again causing the real Brawl to cry back to Gohan, Piccolo, and Videl. What has she done? as her negative self again tells her to stop thinking about the past. Being left with more questions and answers, what else will we uncover in this mystery surrounding Sumbra? What exactly is she hiding from everyone that regards Gohan, Videl, Piccolo, and Z?